Well, good morning and uh, welcome to the uh, 14th hearing of Portfolio Committee Number 2's inquiry into health outcomes and access to health and hospital services in rural, uh, regional and remote New South Wales. Uh, my name is Greg Donnelly and I'm the chair of this committee and this inquiry. The inquiry is examining health outcomes, access to services, uh, patient experience, planning and capital expenditure in rural, regional and remote New South Wales. Before I commence, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which the Parliament of New South Wales sits. I would also like to pay respects to Elders past, present and emerging of the Eora Nation and extend that respect to other Aboriginals uh, viewing the broadcast today. Today's hearing is being uh, conducted uh, uh, virtually. Um, I would uh, ask for everyone's patience uh, through what may be, but we hope not, may be any technical difficulties we have over the course of the day. If participants uh, lose their internet connection for any reason uh, and are disconnected uh, from the virtual hearing, uh, they're asked to rejoin the hearing uh, by using the same link as provided by the committee secretariat. Today we are hearing from a number of local health districts whose jurisdictions include regional, rural and remote New South Wales. I thank everyone uh, uh, on behalf of the committee uh, for making their time to give evidence to this inquiry and we know that you have very busy uh, programs of work. Uh, before we commence, uh, I would like to make some brief comments uh, about the procedures for today's hearing. Today's hearing is being broadcast uh, live via the Parliament's website. A transcript of today's hearing uh, will be placed on the committee's web page when it becomes available. In accordance with the broadcasting guidelines, media representatives are reminded that they must take responsibility for what they publish about the committee's proceedings. While parliamentary privilege applies to witnesses giving evidence today, it does not apply to what witnesses say outside of their evidence at the virtual hearing. I therefore urge witnesses to be careful about comments you may make to the media or to others uh, uh, after you've completed your evidence before the inquiry. Committee hearings are not intended to provide a forum for people to make adverse reflections about others under the protection of parliamentary privilege. Uh, in that regard, it is important that witnesses focus on the issues raised by the inquiry's terms of reference and avoid naming individuals unnecessarily. All witnesses have a right to procedural fairness according to the procedural fairness resolution uh, adopted uh, by the House in 2018. And finally, there may be some questions that a witness could only answer if they had more time or with certain documents before them. Um, in these circumstances, witnesses are advised that they can take a question on notice and provide answers to the inquiry secretariat within 21 days. And finally, a few notes on virtual hearing etiquette to minimise disruption and assist uh, our Hansard reporters. Uh, can I ask committee members uh, to clearly identify who questions uh, are directed to? And could I ask everyone to please state uh, their name uh, when they begin speaking? Could everyone please uh, mute their microphones uh, when they're uh, not speaking? Uh, and please remember to turn your microphones back on uh, when you're getting ready to speak. If you start speaking whilst muted, uh, please start your question, uh, sorry, please start your question or answer again uh, so it can be recorded into the transcript. Members and witnesses uh, should avoid speaking over each other uh, so we can all be heard clearly. Uh, uh, also, and finally to assist, uh, Hansard, may I remind uh, members and witnesses to speak directly into the microphones and avoid making comments when their head may be turned away from it. So with those uh, opening words, uh, can I uh, welcome uh, our uh, first uh, witnesses for today? Um, uh, they being uh, Mr uh, Derek and uh, Dr uh, Tranter. Now, I need to pass through the formalities uh, of having you both uh, uh, sworn or affirmed before uh, evidence is given to the inquiry. So um, I'll start with uh, Mr Dowick. Um, uh, could you please um, state your uh, uh, full name, uh, your position title, uh, or swear either an oath or affirmation, whichever you prefer, uh, the words of which should be before you. Uh, if for some reason you haven't got them, just raise your hand. Uh, Mr Derrick. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Stuart David Dowrick, Chief Executive, Mid North Coast Local Health District. Um, I swear to the evidence now that I may shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to, to Dr Tranter, uh, a welcome, um, and uh, for yourself as well, uh, your name, your position title, uh, either no further information, whichever you prefer, the words of which you should have. If not, raise your hand. Uh, Dr Tranter. Um, Richard Tranter, Medical Director for uh, Mental Health and Alcohol and Other Drugs, Mid-North Coast LHD. Um, I solemnly and sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now, gentlemen, uh, you would be aware uh, that um, the uh, submission by the New South Wales government uh, to this inquiry uh, on behalf of New South Wales Health um, is, a, is an omnibus submission, and I'm sure you actually are aware of that, and I suspect uh, probably would have read it. It stands as submission number uh, 630th inquiry. So uh, your specific local health district doesn't have a submission per se, but it comes under the umbrella of the omnibus submission. Um, so we'll get underway uh, with our questioning. Um, we have a time allocation uh, through to 10.15am. Uh, 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 as you would be aware, there's representatives uh, on uh, a number of, uh, from a number of parties uh, on this inquiry. Uh, opposition, uh, uh, government and crossbench. Uh, what we'll be doing is sharing uh, the questioning uh, between the, 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 the three groups and rotating those. Um, you're OK with that proceedings, if we, if we proceed that way? Great. Uh, OK, so um, we'll... Mr Chair, are they doing... Um, I don't right, understand. Today. Yes, so I, I apologise. Uh, I should have mentioned... Um, <laughs> sorry, uh, just a... a um, First hearing for me back in the new year, so please forgive me. Um, provision for an opening statement, of course. So I invite, uh, I invite uh, the Chief Executive, uh, uh, Mr Dowrick, to make an opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, Deputy Chair and Members. Um, I thank the members of this parliamentary inquiry for allowing me to appear on behalf of the Mid-North Coast Local Health District. I would like to acknowledge the many lands upon which we are meeting today and that I'm appearing upon Bureau of Pilot. I acknowledge the Elders past, present and emerging and pay my respects to those with us today who are Aboriginal. The Mid-North Coast Local Health District extends from Port Macquarie, Hastings Local Government Area in the south to Coffs Harbour Local Government Area in the north and provides healthcare services across a geographical area of approximately 11,000 square kilometres. It is estimated we have 220,000 residents within the district. The people of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island heritage make up 5.7% of the population compared to 2.9 per cent for all of New South Wales. Over the next decade, the district's population is expected to increase by 13 per cent, with the largest increases in the Coffs Harbour and Port Macquarie local government area. In the district, we provide, we provide health care service from seven public hospitals and 12 community health centres. The district has an expense budget of $740 million and we employ 3,800 full-time equivalent staff the five and a half thousand actual headcount. Over the last decade, we have seen a significant expansion of higher education presence, offering university and other tertiary opportunities to locals and attracting students from Australia and overseas. This has been helping us to build a stronger regional workforce in health. As we know, if they study with us, they are more likely to return. Since July 2019, our region has experienced a series of disasters. After many years of drought, we had a peat fire that burned for many months, blanketing our region with smoke and causing some of the worst air quality in the world. It led to the catastrophic fires across the whole district and was followed by one of the worst floods the region has ever experienced. Over this period, I've witnessed the incredible work of our healthcare teams and the communities of the North Coast. I admire their resilience, congratulate their ability to work as a team, and I truly appreciate the support by our healthcare teams and the community with each other in really building the lives after such devastation. Noting the above, the disasters I just mentioned, the region has also had to deal with the impact of COVID on healthcare in regional areas. Looking to the future COVID, looking to the future, COVID has reinforced the importance of partnerships, and these will be needed to be strengthened in the future. 
many of us are in awe of our frontline healthcare workers who keep turning up day in, day out to keep our community safe. And again, I thank them. One of the most important lessons of COVID is finding solutions now into the future. To support this, I'm pleased to have recently been working with our governing board to draft a new 10-year strategic plan for our district. This plan will focus on delivering the key requirements for future health care, supporting our workforce and being an important part to building a thriving, healthy regional community. Attending with me today is Dr Richard Trenner, Mental Director, uh, Medical Director of Mental Health, Alcohol and Other Drugs, and I sincerely thank the members for this opportunity and welcome the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. 20 minutes. So, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr Derek, for the uh, opening statement. <coughs> so we'll have the first tranche of 10 minutes. 15 minutes. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, that means you won't come back for a second time. Okay. Okay. Yep. okay. Thank you. So we'll get underway. About 15 minutes each or thereabouts, depending on the uh, uh, the flow. So we'll move to our first uh, uh, questions from the opposition, Honourable uh, Walt Sickle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Tranter, and thank you, um, Mr. Dirk. Um, I'm Walt Secord. I'm the Shadow Minister for Police, and I'm Labor's representative on health in the Legislative Council. Um, Mr. Durek, in your opening statement, you mentioned that there were seven public hospitals and 12 community health centres in the um, in the mid-North Coast local health district. Um, you'd be aware of evidence that we received from around the state that there were hospitals and MPSs, in particularly in western New South Wales and in southern New South Wales, that did not have doctors during certain periods of time. What's the status of having a doctor 24-7 at those 19 hospitals and community health centres in your local health district? Yeah, thank you very much for the, thank you very much for the question. We have one NPS in the local health district of Dorigo, a 27-bed facility, 21 residential uh, aged care packages and uh, six um, in, inpatient ED beds combined. Uh, we have we rely on a, a, a workforce, a local GP support for that hospital for that service. Um, we have 24/7 coverage um, there through the local support there. Uh, the medical practitioners will come in during the day and support the patients. And if we require someone after hours, the local will be um, as required during that time. So we have approximately. 1,500 to 1,700 people attend uh, the emergency department there. Uh, we have a, that's really supported by registered nurses during that time. Um, uh, reflect train, emergency care guidelines, and if they require up to GP support. Um, the other hospital we have in the district, uh, the smaller facilities such as like Warhope, uh, for example, which is just west of um, Port Macquarie, we have uh, medical staff there during the day. We had an urgent care centre which has been there for a number of years. We converted the emergency department there to, uh, I guess, an 8 to 6 pm uh, service, which operates uh, seven days a week uh, and provides uh, seven days a week and provides uh, like a GP type of model service there. We have palliative care subacute in its medical staff there during the day, but after hours of the on call, in case of emergency. Uh, they will activate a surge response to have the ambulance service transfer patients to Port Macquarie and walk around the middle of the place. That doesn't happen a lot, but it's there, and they have palliative care and rehab services. Sorry, um, sorry, um, Mr. Mr. Durek, could I get you to speak into the microphone a bit? Um, now, I didn't actually hear the answer because the sound cut it at one point. Were you talking about Warhope District Hospital, Memorial Hospital, is that what you were referring to? Yeah, so well, I guess my question is very specific involving the 19 health facilities. How many have a doctor in the hospital 24-7 of the 19 facilities? Well, we operate 12 community health centres, we don't have medical staff there in 24, it's about community health care centres. Okay. Um, I've had seven facilities, uh, two won't have 24-7 uh, cover for the MPS in the hospital itself, but they have on call available uh, GPs or specialists available to support them at the Dorigo. Okay. 
Uh, so can I ask a specific question then? All of the hospitals and MPSs in the local health district that you represent have doctors 24 seven. I have doctors available 24 seven. How, how does that, what do you mean doctors available? You have to go to another hospital or a doctor comes in? Well, again, with, with Dorigo, there is a doctor available in Dorigo who can right. after our care coming to the facility if called upon by the nursing staff there at the hospital if they need to. And same with Warhol, there is someone on call to provide support to that facility if they need to in regards to uh, palliative care or rehab services that are offered there. Okay. Now, Mr. Durek, you would be familiar with um, recent concerns about safety of staff at hospitals in your local health district, particularly Port Macquarie where um, health and hospital staff were, had pieces of skin ripped from them and they were attacked. Um, is it correct that you operate one of the most dangerous local health districts in the state for staff and patients? Uh, we operate very good facilities that are, are safe, very safe, and we operate within the state security guidelines. That was a, uh, a very difficult event last year, January. Five health service assistants were injured in a, in a, in a very uh, tragic event, uh, and, uh, the delivery of a patient at the early hour of the morning. Um, I don't believe we, uh, we operate one of the, the unsafe and secure facilities. We have very good security measures across the district. Uh, this was a one-off event. Uh, I've met personally with uh, all the staff, the nursing staff, the medical staff involved with that, that incident and uh, were very careful people and other staff through how to, I guess, implement change to, uh, to learn from that, that, act, that activity that occurred. So it was a, a very difficult event. Okay, uh, I thank all the people for supporting us through that process and I do uh, sincerely apologise for those who have been time, but I believe our staff did their best in a very difficult situation in the early hours that morning. So, Mr. Durick, you said that, that there were learnings from the incident. So the incident in, um, in January, what steps did the local health district take to protect patients and staff? Did you hire additional security staff? You said there were learnings. Can you detail what improvements were made after the Port Macquarie January incident? Yeah, look, we've uh, a number of things have taken place through the violence prevention management training program. We look at the onboarding of our health service security assistance, look at the training. Um, over a number of years, in the health security assistance at Port Macquarie Base had increased from uh, over a number of years, from 19 uh, to 26 to 27 security staff in the hospital, HSAs we call them. There was an additional 1.5 uh, HSAs put on after discussing that with the HSAs at the time to support that evening period from 4 to 11 o'clock at night, and that's what they requested. But a lot was to do with just culture as well, that was integrated with the, the whole clinical team, looking at how they action their uh, takedown procedures, how they work as a team, clinically, with nurses, medical themselves. There's a lot of things we put on place. We also implemented it, um, appointed a, a district security manager to help oversee across the whole LHD those activities as well. So there's a lot of things we took in, but also health training and um, as well with our staff. Now, Mr. Durek, you, you in your answer to my previous question used the word culture. So what about the whistleblowers and whistleblowers that came forward that um, made allegations that there was retribution about them speaking out about the violence in the local health district. What protections and what uh, what have you done about done to support the whistleblowers? We have a, a very good system to support whistleblowers. We have a very robust public interest disclosure. Really, uh, we support our staff to come forward if they believe there is something to disclose. Uh, we have very robust systems in place in accordance with uh, the policies around them. In, in the moment, we, 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 we welcome our employees to come forward um, and speak with us, and, 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 but also raise issues that they see fit through the appropriate channels. So uh, we, we continue that culture and that training across the whole LHT um, ongoing and we really do that work. You know, you mentioned, you, you gave sort of an in-principle statement about whistleblowers in general, but what about these particular whistleblowers? And they publicly identified themselves. What measures and steps were taken to support them, and what has been the outcome? Um, those employees are, are, not, are, are no, no longer with us. They went through a workers' compensation 
process uh, we, in, in regard to that. Um, there was apologies given to those who um, felt, uh, and we've, in reflection, there was things we could have done a bit differently in that regard. We did give apologies to uh, some of those individuals. Again, we, we wanted to uh, uh, support them as best we can through their workers' compensation program. But Okay. Now, you mentioned earlier about uh, the about COVID in the regions. Um, do you have enough rapid um, rat tests to cover all of the health, um, all the institutions that are within your purview? Uh, we, 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 uh, yes, we do. Uh, we are supporting also the aged care sector and others about rapid antigen tests and, and working through that carefully. So we, we do monitor that carefully, but we believe we, we have enough to support what we need at this point in time. And we are also supporting the aged care sector if they request um, rapid antigen tests from us as well. Now, this morning it was reported on ABC Radio that um, elective surgery was going to resume in some rural and regional areas. What is the current state of the um, elective surgery waiting list in your local health district? Uh, uh, at the end of December, uh, and again, thank you for the question, at the end of December, uh, we had approximately 7,300 people on our waiting list. That came down from 10,600, which was the figure at June 2000, uh, because of the public health issues that we experienced in 2019 and 20 with the bushfires and other catastrophic events, we had to delay an elective surgery program then. So we were able to make a massive impact in that. And I thank all the healthcare teams in the local district and others who supported us in getting that down. Uh, in regards to category B and C patients, uh, we, we have about, at the end of December, I don't have January's figure, sorry, around about 230, 240 people were, uh, for B and C were over the benchmark. That had come down from about 1,400, 1,500 from June there. 2020. So we've made good inroad, really positive progress. Still more to do, uh, and um, at the moment we are operating the, rest, the restrict or the change that we put in place across New South Wales, and we will look in the court of that frame. Now, now you yeah. yeah. Sorry, sorry, sir. Um, now you'd be familiar with the the Bureau of Health Information data, and they always and there, there there's a percentile. The ten, the ten percent, the longest waits. How many people are waiting more than a year for elective surgery in your local health district? Uh, I, I have to take that on that. Sorry, I have to take it in front of me. Okay, if you don't have that, that that's no. that's fine. So I'd like to know how many people are waiting. Say about two hundred and twenty to two hundred and thirty people who were category C um, over. B and C, sorry, about 200 category C, so I admit it would be 200, but I can get those figures passed on, uh, uh, take it on notice. Now, what are the longest waiting lists in your local health district? Can you give me an order? So I'll give you the categories. Cataract, knee and hip, um, yeah, cataract, knee and hip, um, back, gallbladder, go, go things like that. What are the longest waiting lists in your, in your local health district? Uh, in, in our local health district, uh, again, I'll, I'll provide further information, but we know that um, orthopaedics is one of our areas of long waits, um, and so cataracts as well, probably seven, eight months. Ago. But again, the last 15 to 20 months, we've made big inroads into waiting and made a significant improvement in reducing those where they were in June 220 because of the situation we had before. So we've seen those times come down, but we actually uh, they look at our longest wait. In time, sorry, in time. Now, I want to turn you to mid midwifery. Are there currently vacancies for midwives at Coffs Harbour, Kempsey, and Port Macquarie base hospitals? Uh, I, I'm not aware that there are vacancies, but we're not surprised with the fact that on notice we have, and uh, you know, because of COVID, we know there's been issues, issues to do with. Recruitment of midwives across the LHD. We deliver 2,200 babies across the region. Uh, we have wonderful maternity service across the region, but I'll have to take that question on notice and then provide that information before. But I'm not aware that it's causing a uh, concern, except we uh, I'll take that on notice. Okay, can I take you back to attacks on health and hospital staff in Port Macquarie? Um, were, were there similar incidents at other hospitals in your local health district? Um, we had uh, a range of 
bit of, a, of physical events like but nothing like that. That was a, that was an, that was a one off event which uh, we looked into under the incident management policy of the LHD. We treat as a harm score too. Uh, we undertook a very thorough investigation and share that share the info, share the results of that with the, the employees and the health service union and safe work as well. So in that that was an exceptional event. Okay, thank you. Now, um, I want to go back to the um, to, uh, to the waiting lists. So, during the COVID period, what were the what were the areas of elective surgery that were most impacted upon? What what lists grew by the most proportionately during COVID in your local health district? Again, I, I have to take that on notice because it affected all. Categories, and I can't assume equally. I mean, during that period, we did category A, and again, if we believe we had to do category B during that period, when the Prime Minister made that announcement last March to make that change, I think it was March of 26 or thereabouts um, in 2020, it would have been equally shared. But I have to encounter that information to the committee, but I believe it was equally shared across all categories. Um, um, regards to the partner specialty. Um, um, okay, sorry. Okay, no, let's see. Okay, my time is uh, thanks expired. Thank you. Um, thank you, Honourable Secord. Uh, moving now to the crossbench. First of all, the Deputy Chair, Honourable Emma Hurst. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, I just want to go back and I want to talk a little bit about COVID, but obviously there's a lot, been a lot of media reports about the burnout and staffing shortages in the hospital, specifically in the Mid North Coast, dealing with the current COVID outbreak. Um, can you give us an update on the current situation and how the hospitals are currently coping? Yeah, um, at the moment we have uh, around about 50 patients who are COVID related in our facilities. Um, and and uh, obviously we've got around about 200 employees furloughed at the moment across the LHD. Uh, we, we know that, uh, that we are doing our best to support our employees. We, we know we've had a change in elective surgery. Uh, recently just had to free up additional workforce there. We know in the recent times, which is which has assisted, uh, we went through that very difficult period from December through to mid-January with that rapid, that increase in um, COVID testing going on, which had a significant impact on our health service across the North Coast and the state. Those numbers have dramatically come down. We've, got, we've been going from 2,000 tests a day down to two to 300 a day, I'm just on the weekend, just gone. Um, so those numbers were up to 11,000 tests a week, we're now down to two or 3,000. So that frees up employees to help um, other parts of the workforce. Um, we know in, we've had some units, like uh, some of our emergency department units and some of our wards, we had a large group of staff off, so we had a restricted amount of beds there. But again, our healthcare team will do a wonderful job trying to support uh, as best they can in those holes that are there. We don't use a lot of agency nurses in the Mid North Coast. Our, our level of agency nurses um, is generally less than 1%, it grew to 1%. We're trying to best we need to, to get those staff. We are in buddy with Sydney and South West LHD to help us where we have some shortfalls. That hasn't been used that often. We've had just a handful of people come and help us during that time as well. But I have to say, our people uh, have done a great job. It's very difficult. Shirk away from that. It has been a very difficult time for our healthcare teams over this period. Uh, we do have uh, dedicated COVID clinics now. A, a challenge for us uh, is into the future what will this mean to our business as usual? Uh, how do we support uh, this um, new cohort of inpatients? And most of the people that um, we look after uh, look after the community as of today. There's around three and a half thousand people in the community with COVID. We're, we're caring directly for providing high care support about 350 of those people through our program. The other, the other 3,000, they're about to health direct or consider low acuity, which is a state wide decision as well. So uh, we do it that way. And our big program is to uh, support people in the community so that's expanded through to those resources there. But uh, you know, it's, a, it's a massive challenge. Uh, but the test and vaccination program. Uh, as well, uh, we're continuing that because we're still supporting the children who are coming through now, the young people. That's the numbers coming through at the levels. It was not as great as it was last year between, say, August through to November when it was a uh, dry in the vaccination rate. 
provides for sick leave. I'm just, I might just go back to, you know, you, you said that you sort of limit the agency nurses. I'm just, I know that, you know, a nurse at the Coffs Harbour Base Hospital told the media that staff were doing as much as 40 hours um, over time in just one week. Um, she told the media that staff were burning out and the standards of care were dropping. Um, how is the NHD specifically responding to these concerns with nurses doing such enormous amounts of overtime for months? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, we have just gone through our largest graduate recruitment program in the LHD for our new nurse graduates. Uh, this year, we normally take about 110 nurses, 140, 150 nurses across the facilities to increase that pool, bring people on a little bit earlier than we normally would to support uh, those nurse graduates. So that's been a really important program for us to do to support our workforce. We know there's been additional overtime. Uh, to support the, the present uh, COVID environment. But we have one, one very clear strategy is the need to increase the number, number of nurse graduates and bring them on a little bit sooner than we would. And it's been really positive. I know with mental health, we're, we're taking on eight nurse graduates, for example, to support mental health. Um, just want to sort of move on to something else. I, I know members of the Australian Salaried Medical Officers Federation reported um, to this inquiry that access to specialty care was, was a specific issue. Um, and, you know, an example that was given is that there is no neurologist, um, no endocrinologist or infectious disease specialist at Coffs Harbour Hospital, um, meaning that patients have to be referred elsewhere. Are there plans to offer these services at, in Coffs Harbour in the future or is something being done in that space? Um, thank you again for that, that question. Uh, we, we have proved the recruitment for example, an infectious disease physician at Coffs and we've been just unable to over a number of years to recruit the wrong position. So we need to either look at uh, liaise and their plan is to really look at that plan whether we can get a metropolitan facility to do support us there or whatever that might look like. With neurology services, uh, we, we, under, we do not provide inpatient or neurological services um, in Coffs Harbour. There are uh, outreach services provided that people do visit from Wollongong, Newcastle, the Sydney provider. Um, our patient uh, primary care services in that region, but and there are plans, and we'd like to consider the plans in the future for expansion of costs to look at neurological services there. I know the division, uh, primary health network and the GPs across the region would like us to explore that that space and, and do more work there. Thank you. Um, I, I'm just going to go back. I know um, my colleague, Yonder Watts, has already asked quite a few questions about the incident that happened. Um, with five workers at Port Macquarie Base Hospital. Um, but I just wanted to um, uh, expand on, on the information you've already given him. I'm just wondering if there's going to be further reviews in the future or if you have planned further reviews in the future in regards to being able to keep staff and, and other patients safe. Uh, we, we've got plenty of time to look at how we keep our staff safe, especially through COVID, how we have an employment, employee wellness program, employee support program across the district to look at people's emotional, social um, security, uh, their physical, their personal wellbeing. Uh, we do wish to, that'll be rolled out very soon uh, in regards to our wellness program, uh, looking at, uh, again, mental wellbeing, cultural, physical, personal, organisational wellbeing. So that would be an important piece to look at going into the future, look at our extensive program that we have there. So yes, the answer is yes. Okay, so that's, sorry, I'm just having trouble hearing you. Um, if you, uh, the microphone seems to come in and out. But, um, so, you, so that's in a issue. So you've got the existing program and you're adding to that. Is that, is that what you were saying? Okay, great. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, another common theme throughout this inquiry has been around the difficulty in recruiting and retaining staff um, in regional and rural LHDSs. Um, what problems have you experienced in this space? I know you've talked about um, getting extra student nurses, but um, do you also experience recruitment issues? And, and if so, how you know what plans do you have in place to address that? Uh, we always have challenges in recruiting um, employees. This local district has put on an additional 1,000 full-time equivalent um, staff over the last 10 years. Um, our medical our medical workforce that we employ has grown from around 210 to 360 full-time. Medical employees that we employ plus our VMA workforce has increased, but we know we have challenges in mental health, uh, mental health psychiatry, uh, 
which it is, uh, uh, has a plan approved to change that medical model. We also know that in the workforce of today, which is so different to a decade ago, with so many things changing that people are looking away, I'll use medical, for example, looking away from a visiting medical officer arrangement to uh, maybe a salary position arrangement. So we've been seeing a gradual shift from um, VMO arrangements to those employed by the LHD, especially around obstetrics and paediatrics, for example. Uh, we're looking at a different medical model in Bellingham and we work with the clinical staff there and the nursing staff there about a different medical support model to make that more sustainable facility going into the future as opposed to one on labourers there. So that we're looking, hopefully, we'll have some medium, short, long term strategies. Training, a, a training hub would be great. Um, and with nursing, we're, we're looking at everything how to uh, nurse graduates, but also, can I say, uh, we've been working really hard with the universities in the region to offer locally. Um, allied health and nursing opportunities. We are the only local health district that has um, a G8 university, University of New South Wales, will have the complete medical degree in our backyard. So you can actually do the complete degree first year to sixth year, all the way through. Um, you know, yeah, Charles Sturt University only offered one course several, 10 years ago, and now they for 24 face-to-face -face courses, particularly nursing, allied health, physiotherapy, occupational therapy. Southern Cross University is also doing the same. And we have one of the largest paramedical training schools on the mid North Coast. So we've been growing up locally, our arm, and, and regions like Kempsey are, are expanding their opportunities there through the country university presence of giving their people more opportunities in that space. We go to the workforce, and I make a special uh, uh, note of our Indigenous workforce. It's really important to grow our Aboriginal health workforce. Again, over the last 10 years, our Aboriginal workforce has grown from about 1.5% to 5.2% of our workforce. Um, our aim is to get to our population share, which is 5.7 to 6 per cent. So we've still got a little way to go uh, and make sure that's across all core groups, clinical groups and everything. So that's a long-term program and we're pleased with our approach today, but we're still working hard with the universities to in engage and employ all that through the various opportunities we make available through allied health university and medical. Thank you. Uh, can I move to uh, uh, Kay Fairman? And can I just note that I think uh, Dr Tranter there is uh, looking out for uh, some incisive questions to come his way, so uh, <laughs> I'll just pass well, that on. I, I don't think he is. I think, I think he's quite happy thank sitting you, there. Uh, thank you, Chair, for that prompt. And indeed, my first question is to uh, Dr Tranter, because I'm particularly interested in the impact of uh, COVID, obviously the Omicron outbreak in the region, <coughs> the mental health and and other drug workforce. So the question is, um, have you have nurses and healthcare workers in the area that you look after? So all of that, have they been pulled into, <coughs> excuse me, other duties um, with COVID? Have you seen um, staff furloughed? What kind of an impact generally has it had, firstly? <coughs> uh, thank you, Kate. Um, yes. Um, yeah, uh, uh, similar to the, to the whole of the LHD workforce, we've had to be really flexible, helping to support a lot of the initiatives that uh, Stuart's had to set up very short notice, uh, be that around testing, helping with immunisation, etc. Uh, so that's, that's had a um, had a, a pull on our workforce. Um, we also actually specifically stepped up to help lead on the um, special health accommodation very early on. Um, and, uh, took a lead role running those uh, facilities. Um, because we had um, very good, very helpful information from um, other colleagues and other LHDs around um, that a lot of the issues that we would face in the Shards would be mental health, drugs and alcohol issues. So by being very closely involved in those from the outset, uh, we were able to, to manage a lot of those, those issues at source and uh, that minimised the impact in terms of needs for admissions through to the specialist facilities. Um, so that, that worked out very well, but but also had a you know, say had another impact on staff. Um, yes, we've been furloughed. We've had staff furloughed, uh, the same as other areas of the LHD, um, and that combined with uh, um, sort of outbreaks within um, the inpatient services um, uh, has needed we've, to respond to that. We've had to very rapidly shift plans, almost on a certainly on a week-to-week -week basis, sometimes on a day-to-day -day basis. So where we, where we set up plans for sort of red and green COVID areas within the um, inpatient pathways, 
uh, we would then get a case you know, cropping up in a green zone, have to swap around uh, those provisions very quickly. Uh, we've had to temporarily suspend admissions to units and shift um, beds uh, and resources to other parts of the service. Uh, most recently, we've, we've been able to take up an offer from one of the private providers that had staff available in beds um, to help us out. Uh, but again, having to very quickly put in place um, operational plans and procedures uh, at very short notice. So it's been incredibly impressive um, how all our staff, right from the senior managers down to frontline clinical staff, have had to move very quickly in terms of adapting to these situations. Um, but it has to it. Can I check with the, can I check with just with the, um, say, mental health wards, what, how many, how many beds, what wards are you um, dealing with in the LHD, firstly? Yes, so in, in terms of our normal sort of complement of inpatient beds, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, our two main sites are sort of Cross Harbour and Port Macquarie, um, where we have our declared beds. Um, so we have 30 declared beds in our acute unit in Coffs Harbour, and then there's 20 beds in the rehabilitation unit then. Okay. Uh, Port in which we have 12 declared beds. Um, uh, we have the capacity for another, open up another further 12 beds there that's not operational at the moment. But okay. has been, we have utilised as COVID red areas, um, as we've yeah. over the last uh, few weeks. Okay, can I, just, sorry, I just wanted to jump in there because of, of so, uh, limited time. So with those declared areas, uh, in terms of a having a COVID plan in place, were they treated, did they have the same um, uh, measures put in place, for example, the uh, nurses and healthcare workers uh, having fully, you know, uh, PPE in terms of fitted at P2 and N95 masks and all of that, and if so, <coughs> that Yes, you know, we, we, we uh, got in very early in terms of the uh, fit testing and have continued to, to provide fit testing to staff and as, as new staff come on board as well. Um, I mean, to give you an example, the we were actually the first clinical team on site when we first opened the shark um, and we were able to get our fit testing done on the day as we got into the shark. Um, um, so, yes, we know we try to keep pace with the fit testing uh, and ensuring that the staff that we are put hand to provide care uh, to uh, identified COVID positive clients um, are fully protected. Um, but what so can I check, like, in terms of, sorry, when that happened? Because there have been reports of, um, you know, ter well, not reports, but terrible outbreaks in um, some mental health wards as a result of, well, the, 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 fit, the P2 and N95 masks were kind of ward worn by nurses in, in the COVID clinics, if you like, and, and not somewhere like mental health wards. So you're saying that the fit testing of masks was put in place before the Omicron outbreak, well, you know? Yes, well, we, yeah. it was, it was, it's been a rolling process in terms of the fit testing, but certainly we, we were having our frontline staff fit tested uh, certainly before the, uh, this um, current Omicron outbreak and, um, and pretty early on um, uh, in terms of the Delta variants outbreak. Um, so, yeah, that's been an ongoing process for us. Uh, but one of the lessons we've learned, though, is, um, um, is you know, we can be you know, putting in measures in terms of treating the identified clients, but it's also recognising we've got to keep our guard up in terms of all our frontline clinical work uh, and, and in, throughout the inpatient units. Yeah. Now, then, because we've had outbreaks occurring there in, in people that we hadn't, hadn't been previously identified. Thank so, you. That's thank you. That's that's uh, my um my question is being answered. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just turn to um you, Mr. Dowry, because there are many more questions I could ask you as well, Dr. Tranter. Again, but just in terms of limited time, we're talking about the wait list. Uh, earlier, you said I think seven thousand three hundred now on the waiting list, or that was in December. I think that came down from ten thousand in June. I'm interested, are you aware in terms of that fall off um, of waiting list, the attrition, if you like, the attrition rate, is that attrition. all because they have been dealt with within the public health system? Do you have an indication of, you know, how many scrounged the fees to get to private hospitals, whether some people just fell off because they couldn't wait, whether some people died? Do you, do you know the, the reasons why that waiting list uh, is shortened and how much has been dealt with by people actually getting the surgery they need in the hospitals that they've been on the wait list for? 
Uh, thanks, great question. Thank you very much. Um, look, uh, it's been a very comprehensive program. We've used private hospitals, public hospitals, uh, which the LH do is doing. Um, uh, we have a, a, a very <coughs> local surgical uh, program where many of our facilities um, have been provided the opportunity to do much more surgery. Uh, for example, Bellingham Hospital used to do uh, 200 operations 10 years ago, now it's doing 1,400 this year. Uh, Max will be doing 2,000. So all of this is locally, we have been using our local facilities and we have not been able to do that, we've been using the private sector to assist us either locally, um, in the Port Macquarie uh, private or Warringah and in Coffs Harbour, or facilities elsewhere, um, uh, in Castle or Tara and Occasion in Sydney as well. So it's been a quite an extensive program. I, I don't have any proper fingertips, the, the, the split between the two, but I think it was about 50% was done at the private sector, so I can get that, take that on notice and provide it as a, a response to that today. But about 50-50, I think, a lot was provided in the private yeah, and the public good. group. And we really thank the private sector for working. Just to follow up to that, thank you. That's very interesting. So, is, is oh, there additional cost to the patient yeah. when you say that that I then goes to the private, like yeah. fine <laughs> group, some of the private sector? Is that at no cost to the patient? Uh, yeah, that's why I say it's uh, these state contracts. Uh, that's also, doesn't hear the buzzer. Uh, as part of the pandemic response, when, uh, when that change was made, uh, they're, they're commercial and confident they're private contracts. I, I don't know the costs associated that, but it's no cost. And, we, and we've been doing our best to support. People um, who may have to go somewhere else. So I just think, uh, and it's made a massive difference. It really has. Okay, that's uh, Kate. That's pr brought your uh, time to a conclusion. The bell. You may not have heard the bell, but it has gone. Um, so I move to government members. Now we've got uh, the honourable Wes Fang, but we've also got online the honourable Shane Mallard, the honourable Lou Amato. So uh, we'll start with Wes, and we'll move around as needs be. Honourable Wes Fang. Thank you very much uh, to both the witnesses, and um, thank you very. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, appearing today um, and making yourselves available. Uh, Mr Derek, I was listening to your opening statement and uh, you were talking about uh, the the plan, the 10 year plan um, and the work that's been going into that. Um, obviously, the uh, future of um, the health provisions in, in the mid north uh, coast is um, of interest. Uh, are you able to elucidate a little bit more on um, the work that's going into that 10 year plan and perhaps some of the uh, consultations and um, how the, the plan is actually coming together? No, no thank you very much. Um, it's, we've been so far through a, a 12 month program with extensive consultation. Um, over three, four hundred people have been involved with that consultation. A number of working groups online, doing most of their online team, which has provided a great platform for getting real rich information. But there's also been face to face consultation as well that has formed that. I guess the, the background to the plan, the plan will have a, a number of key aspects. I guess uh, um, having world class health, regional health system would be a key priority of ours. Looking at integrated care, I think we can't do everything by ourselves, so working apart, more partnership with our primary health care providers. Um, we've had a great, great example of that the last two years, it's been really strong. Research, uh, building on our research platform, I think there's a great opportunity for Mid North Coast. We have a number of great universities here who uh, have been developing in the last year. It's difference to us, we'd love to do more on research, being a part of that. Obviously, working with the, the, the funding we have. The value and accountability and use our resources wisely is an important part. But also, I guess, um, working more with our consumers and partners and, and trying to be more patient-centred that, that we have been. We've made some good inroads there, but we have more to do. And that whole area of integration, how do we work across primary care, average medical service, aged care, the local and different medical more cases, one of the most self-sufficient for acute care services, LHDs in New South Wales. Uh, 93, 94% of people are treated within our footprint here. Uh, we have some wonderful services. There's things we, we don't have yet and we want to build on. Um, so again, it's working with partnership and also in lots of things. So um, I guess uh, investing more in the primary prevention and also in the community-based services is going to be for us as well. Okay, so you said that we've been working on the plan for about 12 months now. Um, how, what, what stage do you see that the plan actually um, uh, has reached at the moment and how do you see uh, the future part of the plan um, being developed? 
Well, we're getting through into the end of the plan. Uh, we, we had a change in our board composition, so we were sort of halfway through um, the plan as when the new board came with a new chair, and obviously new board members would want to contribute and, and see what's in that plan, and they're adding, we had a further meeting in January about that. A lot of consultation. It led on from the, the future health strategy work the ministry did at the back end of 2019, around the future health strategy, or 20, sorry, Years a bit mixed up, but around with Linda, a lot of good work there. Noting that the ministry still has their future health strategy to come out, we want to make sure we're aligned to that as well. So, uh, over the next few months, we expect that plan to be released and start working on that 10 year plan. But in that plan, too, it's time for change. It will be reiterated, it will, re will not be just fixed or static. We need to look at that over 10 years and keep coming back to it and changing it as we need to. So there's some mechanisms within the, the plan itself that um, should there be uh, uh, a change to the situation, i.e. Um, like a, another um, pandemic, um, there's the ability uh, within the local health district to uh, amend it to uh, suit uh, the requirements at the time? Uh, that would be a decision for the board, but again, all plans should be, have an iterative process to allow change. Has gone. We set the general direction, and then obviously over 10 years, changes in respect those plans. And what, un what underpins that is the strategy and the operation, like operate, how you operation against those plans. They will change over 10 years as well. So, you know, the higher the themes, off we go, they will change as we approach Thank you for that. Um, part of the other uh, part of your um, opening statement that I found uh, compelling was that uh, you said that uh, the local health district has um, been providing support to the aged care sector. And um, I was just uh, looking to, to touch on that because obviously uh, we all know that the aged care sector itself has um, been um, experiencing some difficulties um, around uh, the pandemic outbreak um, and that uh, your local health district has uh, been providing support um, is, uh, I guess, admirable. And I'm just curious as to um, what support that might be, um, if, uh, if you could sort of provide some uh, insights as to what support has been provided, but also what you anticipate might be some future um, uh, assistance or collaboration that the local health district can do with the aged care um, uh, sector in order to support them through the rest of the pandemic. Yeah, in April 2020, we commenced a range of regional forums with a group of different stakeholders, Aboriginal Medical Services, private hospital groups, aged care providers, um, aged care was important. The main, major assistance was education, making um, our resources available to them if they need to be, um, providing where we needed to uh, people to assist with uh, immunisation if that was requested of us. Uh, PPE, infection control procedures, was really important. Uh, Later, recently, we were doing rat testing, providing not providing support there as well. Uh, during the middle of the case, uh, we had our first, I use the word, aged care outbreak. Our local um, aged care manager went into assisted facility in supporting them because it was the first time our region actually had an outbreak and, and they needed advice and expertise there. So our regional manager provided support for the first couple of days. What the future looks like, we would look at the aged care sector and ask them what they would like to see. The, the ongoing education communication has been really important, a source of truth. Um, a lot of people there, uh, there's lots of information in there. They have appreciated the ongoing communication, what's been uh, provided by the LHD about the status of things at the moment, uh, and we've received um, uh, nice support from them about providing that information to them, as I guess the source of truth there as well. So we'll walk with them, ask them to do, um, and also during that period, you know, what would happen is someone would transfer back and forth and how we do what as well. So really, it's really strong that relationships would be great. I'm just, I know we've only got a few minutes left. I'm just sort of struggling to hear, um, hear you, uh, Mr. Derek. Maybe, um, yeah, if you could yeah, just uh, perhaps lean in a little bit closer because I think that there's some um, voice pickup issues that are, that are occurring there. Um, I just uh, was listening to your answer then and uh, I think you said it was your um, aged, uh, aged healthcare manager went in to provide uh, assistance and support to the, to the sector. Um, 
Is there a lot of um, engagement between, uh, I guess, that, that aged care sector and the local health districts through that, that aged care manager? Um, is there a, a feedback loop that allows you to actually um, have that understanding of what's happening in the aged care sector within the local health district and then provide, um, I guess, direct support to, um, to accommodate any, um, any outbreaks or any COVID cases that, that do come up in, in your health district? Yeah, there is. Uh, where that, that forum uh, is co-jointly chaired or supported by the local health district and the private health network, they uh, do it collaboratively and it is a feedback mechanism. So there, there, there is information exchange and support requests, but also for our public health teams. The public health teams are providing support um, as required to the public, to the aged care sector regularly, um, uh, which is ongoing. So it hasn't stopped um, for a long time as well. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to Mr. Uh, Tranter now, and I know we've only got a few minutes left, and we're very keen to stay on time today. So, uh, Mr. Tranter, I just um, wanted to ask you: the state government has um, been looking at a lot of, I guess, new programs uh, in the mental health um, space. Um, are, are you able to uh, provide some insights as to some of the um, uh, new programs that are being rolled out by uh, the government, and and how? the Mid-North Coast is able to participate in those trials? Yes, thank you, yes. Um, I think probably one of the really big initiatives that's had a profound impact for us has been the Zero Suicides in Care initiative. I think not least that's been a real driver for expanding our peer workforce. Uh, I think we've had 11 new routes into that space in the last 14 months, I think. Um, and. Uh, we're really seeing some of the benefits from those new models of care, but uh, particularly um, we have a safe haven operating in Port Macquarie, which is a peer-led uh, service uh, that specifically looks to, to try to um, uh, avoid people going through ED and provide a, a far more uh, receptive and, ex I guess, accepting environment for uh, clients uh, presenting uh, with a range of, sort of mental health and, and sort of crisis needs. Um, and that's been yeah, incredibly effective and um, uh, I'm really keen to see that expand across the district. Um, uh, we're working towards uh, building our, um, our community suicide prevention outreach service. Um, and that's also, um, alongside that, that's really helping to support, I guess, some of our own initiatives, uh, particularly uh, looking to reach out into our Aboriginal communities. Um, we've been very aware from the suicide statistics that you know, there is, you know, while there's an over-representation of um, um, people from the Aboriginal communities in terms of suicides, um, we're not seeing those figures coming through in terms of our RCA investigations. And then that's telling us that actually some of the most vulnerable people in those communities aren't actually accessing our services and we have to do something profoundly different in terms of engaging with those communities. And uh, Beck Santana, our, our lead for our Aboriginal mental health services, is um, doing some excellent work in building a Aboriginal wellbeing service uh, and really looking towards what are, the, what are the models of care that's actually going to connect with those communities. So a lot of that's been spurred uh, from the Zero Suicides in Care initiative. Um, and that's had a particularly big impact. We, we were um, uh, closely engaged um, with the uh, Mental Health uh, Patient Safety Programme um, that uh, CEC operated, and that's had a, a big impact for us going forward around how we've approached a lot of our quality initiatives and service development, um, particularly um, around how we engage stakeholders, and particularly in terms of consumer collaboration. Um, um, Ali Wilson, uh, one of our CNCs, it's, uh, so senior nurses has uh, really taken the lead for us in terms of um, that consumer engagement, um, collaborative um, um, development of services and, and trauma-informed development of services as well. Uh, and a lot of these are, are really um, driving from um, these statewide initiatives and, and we're really um, drawing a lot on support at the statewide level. Um, yeah, I think those are probably the, the, the key examples I would, I would point to, I think. 
Thank you very much for that, uh, uh, Dr. Tranter. I, I would have loved to have um, had more time to ask you more about the safe havens because I think they're actually a fantastic uh, initiative, but unfortunately um, we've just reached the end of this session, so I'll have to um, cede back over to the Chair to, um, to close out. Uh, thank you, Warren, we're saying. Appreciate that. Uh, well, gentlemen, uh, thank you very much. We, we have come to, to 10.15, um, so our time has run out. Uh, unfortunately, it's been a very uh, useful and, uh, and valuable uh, session this morning. I expect there'll be some questions on notice that committee members uh, have all supplementary questions arising from uh, what we covered this morning. So um, they'll be provided through to you by the Secretariat and we'll liaise with you over the return of those. Uh, so, so thank you very much. And, and on behalf of, of the committee, thank you for the important work you do. Uh, very important work uh, for and on behalf of the, uh, the citizens of New South Wales or in your LHD. We appreciate it very much, particularly during this difficult time. Thank you. OK, uh, we'll now move uh, uh, to our next set of witnesses shortly. Um, so just be aware microphones are still on. Yes. Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good morning. It's Andrew here from the Secretariat. Uh, I'll just do a quick sound check first. <coughs> uh, Professor Chan, can you hear me? Mr. Chan. Good morning, Andrew. I can hear you. Can Thank you hear you. me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McLaughlin, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, sure can. Thank you. Uh, do we have... Ms. Hyman there, can you hear me, please? Ms. Hyman, uh, your video appears to be off. Um, if you can hear me, please respond. If I understand. Uh, we can see you now. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Sandra. Here, just wanted to check that uh, we have is that Ms. Hyman and Ms. Millthorpe with us? Correct. E Excellent. Thank you. We can hear you. We'll be proceeding in a moment. Thank you very much. Just wait for a minute or so. Okay, well, we'll get uh, get underway with respect to the uh, the formal part of having you uh, uh, sworn or affirmed uh, to give evidence. So can I welcome um, all four of you um, joining us this morning, uh, uh, two representatives from each of the LHDs, the, uh, the Nepean and Blue Mountains uh, LHD. Welcome, ladies, and two gentlemen uh, from the Central Coast uh, LHD. So we've got you all for about an hour and a half, so it's great to have you, and uh, that's a, a fair bit of time you've uh, given us uh, this morning, and we do appreciate because we know that you're exceedingly busy in your respective roles, and we're grateful for you carving out the time to, to make yourselves available. It's much appreciated. My name's Greg Donnelly, and I'm the, the chair of the uh, committee in this, this inquiry. Uh, we'll, we'll deal with the, uh, the formalities first, and uh, what uh, we'll do is uh, I'll identify each one to go in order to identify yourself, uh, your name, your position, uh, title, and swear either an oath uh, or an affirmation, uh, whichever you prefer, uh, the words of which should have been provided to you. Um, if for some reason they haven't turned up, just raise your hand and we'll have them provided to you. So. We'll work through uh, our, our four witnesses and then we'll proceed uh, to our questioning. So perhaps if we start with the, uh, the beautiful Blue Mountains, 
um, uh, a lovely part of New South Wales uh, that your LHD covers. Um, and we'll start with uh, Ms Hyman. Thank you. Uh, so Kay Hyman, Chief Executive of Nepean Blue Mountains Local Health District. And you'd like me to affirm now? Please. Yes. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Uh, moving out to Ms uh, uh, Milthorpe. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm um, Eloise Milthorpe. I'm the Acting Deputy Director of Planning for the LHD. Um, and I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Now we'll move over to the uh, Central Coast uh, LHD. Um, and now, Mr. McLaughlin, uh, you're a, a past performer at the inquiry, if we could describe it that way. So you have been sworn uh, or affirmed on a previous occasion, so there's no need to do it again. That uh, original uh, swearing or affirmation stands. So once again, welcome, uh, but you don't need to participate in that part of the, uh, the uh, commencement here. So we'll move straight over uh, then to uh, Professor uh, Stevie Chan. Welcome. Um, we've not had you at the inquiry here before, so you're, you're most welcome. Uh, can I get you to move through the formality? Morning, I'm Stevie Chan. I'm the District Director of Medical Services, Central Coast Local Health District. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chan. So uh, we'll proceed shortly. Uh, I'll just cover a couple of, of points. Um, the uh, 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 submission for the New South Wales government, which is obviously for and on behalf of uh, New South Wales uh, Health, uh, stands as an omnibus submission to the inquiry. It's uh, submission number 630, and I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Uh, uh, respectfully, your local health districts uh, haven't been required to make a, a, a submission specifically, but you, I just want to confirm that there is the overarching omnibus submission and we're working within the parameters um, of that. Now, I'll ask a, a representative from each of the uh, uh, LHDs uh, to make an, an opening statement shortly. Um, obviously, there's no need to cover in that uh, uh, material that's covered in the in the omnibus uh, uh, submission from the New South Wales government. Um, having completed the two opening statements, uh, we'll then move to uh, questioning from uh, committee members. Uh, we have representatives from the opposition, the crossbench and government uh, on the committee. Uh, in fact, we have uh, someone from the Blue Mountains, the Honourable Shane Mallard uh, uh, hails from the Blue Mountains and he's joining us uh, by video link. Uh, so we have members across the parties and across the state here uh, participating uh, in, in this inquiry. And we'll ro roll through the questioning uh, in 15 minute blocks. So we'll have 15 minutes from the opposition, 15 from the crossbench, 15 from the government, and we'll roll on until we get to the last half hour, which will probably be a, a shorter than 15 minute block for each of the, the, the three groups around the table. And that'll take us through to 11.50 uh, uh, a.m. Um, I think that's all I, I wanted to cover in the um, in my introductory comments. Um, people's mobile phones are, are off. Uh, one final thing, just and this is a challenge for us doing the inquiries uh, with some witnesses remotely and some in the room. It's most important, please, uh, when you're answering a question, to identify, I know this might sound a bit laborious and may feel this way, but to identify yourself so our Hansard can be very clear about who's answering the question that was directed to them. So if you could just please identify yourself, uh, whoever you may be, when answering the question directed to you from the committee member who should also identify themselves, uh, that will particularly help Hansard. So uh, I just wanted to, uh, to, to remind people. Um, so, with those uh, comments uh, by myself, uh, setting it up, we'll, we'll move on now to, to opening statements and we'll, uh, we'll invite uh, um, the, the PM Blue Mountains LHD and um, I, I presume it'll be uh, yourself, Ms Hyman, who'll make that statement. Correct. Thank you. Please proceed. <coughs> Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this hearing. 
and I'd like to acknowledge that we are joining you today from Derek Country. And the Pian Blue Mountains Local Health District includes the lands of the Derek, Benagara and Wiradjuri people. I pay my deep respect to elders who have passed, those of today and those emerging in the future. Nepean Blue Mountains Local Health District starts at the western edge of the Sydney metropolitan area and extends into regional and rural areas through the Hawkesbury and up and across the Blue Mountains to Lithgow. We span 9,179 square kilometres. Our population at over 375,000 is spread across four local government areas. Penrith with a population of 205,000, Blue Mountains 80,000, Hawkesbury 69,000 and Lithgow 20,000. Our population is increasing most rapidly in the Penrith local government area, followed by Hawkesbury and Blue Mountains, with Lithgow projected to have a stable but ageing population. Population growth in the beautiful Blue Mountains area is limited by geography, with a majority of people living close to the Great Western Highway, which runs over the Blue Mountains to Lithgow and beyond. Every natural disaster which has occurred in the last 10 years has impacted our area. Drought, floods, bushfires, extreme heat, snowstorms all affect us. Snow. We are well versed in disaster response. Nepean Blue Mountains strives to be at the forefront of delivering innovative and sustainable models of care, but we cannot do that alone. We need to work with our partners. We work hard to develop services that reflect our community's needs with our partners. Our partners include the Nepean Blue Mountains Primary Health Network, our local general practitioners and allied health professionals, a range of non-government organisations and our Aboriginal medical service, but most importantly, our communities. We have strong community engagement, evidenced by our consumer forum, which supports the local health district and the primary health network. We also have an online forum, Get Involved, which facilitates engagement with groups of the community that are often not well represented in traditional consumer engagement, for example, younger people and families. I'm proud that the Pian Blue Mountains Local Health District was the first local health district in New South Wales to develop a consumer and carer charter for our mental health service. Community engagement is vital, so we understand the issues that matter to our communities, not just the issues that we think matter to them. The Pian Blue Mountains Local Health District is a microcosm of the health system. We have a tertiary facility at Nepean Hospital, which is currently undergoing a $1 billion redevelopment. We provide secondary level services at Springwood, Blue Mountains District, Anzac Memorial, and Lipho Hospitals, and through a public partner private public, sorry, public private partnership um, at Hawkesbury District Health Service. We also have a residential aged care facility at Portland. Our mental health and drug and alcohol teams provide services to our population through inpatient, outpatient and outreach services. Our community health services provide in-home and in-centre support to our population. Virtual care is playing an increasing role in service provision across all locations and all specialties. Whilst we strive to deliver care close to home, this is not possible for all conditions. The Pian Blue Mountains has and continues to develop clinical networks across the district. These networks are aimed at providing care as close to home as feasible, and when higher levels of care are required, ensuring that there is an escalation process to allow patients to receive the right care in the right place at the right time. 
The Pan Blue Mountains Local Health District vision is to give up achieving better health. We see this regularly demonstrated in our Lithgo and Blue Mountains services. Support from community groups, hospital auxiliary and others is greatly appreciated. Engagement with councils is also important to address population and public health issues, as well as providing an additional channel for resident feedback. Our Lithgo and Portland facilities are relatively new. Feedback from the community and the Bureau of Health Information survey results indicates that service provision is highly regarded. Lithgow Hospital was very well designed, it has, and will continue to allow changing models of care to be developed. We have a clinical school of Notre Dame University on the campus. This allows rural students to study closer to home. The clinical school includes on-site accommodation. Fantastic feedback is received from students, both on the quality of learning and the ability to live rurally. Blue Mountains District Anzac Memorial Hospital is approaching its 100th birthday, being built after World War I to provide care to returned veterans. The hospital has provided excellent care ever since and continues to allow Blue Mountains residents to receive care close to home. Over time, the building has been updated and adapted to meet changing needs but the site makes it difficult to adapt further. We have identified the development of a new hospital in the Blue Mountains as a priority in our capital investment priorities. Regardless of the age of the building, the services, provide, the services provided receive consistently positive feedback from users. Great group support is received from community groups who have supported upgrades and enhancements of facilities. Aboriginal engagement is strong in both the Blue Mountains and Lithgow, with elders providing valued input. Our workforce for our regional services has increased by 125 full-time equivalents since 2012. Provision of palliative care is a priority. We have dedicated beds in Blue Mountains and Springwood Hospitals, and Lithgow palliative care patients are cared for in single rooms in the one ward at that hospital. For those who choose to die at home, services are provided through our palliative care team in conjunction with our community services team. Whilst we aim for every consumer experience to be what you would want for a loved family member, unfortunately we don't always achieve this. We constantly aim to improve and responding to consumer feedback is an important part of this. I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge the staff who work in our organisation, our clinicians, our non-clinical staff, our support staff, everybody. Everyone comes to work to do the best they can. Without their compassion and their dedication, we would not be held in the standing that we are with our communities. Our staff are very much part of our communities and are the backbone of the Pian Blue Mountains Local Health District. The past two years with our response to the COVID-19 pandemic have been challenging for our staff but they have risen to every challenge and will continue to do so. I again want to acknowledge the great work that is done 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that uh, opening statement. It's uh, very detailed and comprehensive. Uh, we'll move now to the Central Coast. Uh, Mr McLaughlin, uh, I gather you'll be making the opening statement? Central Coast, uh, I think you mean far west. Right. Central. <laughs> I'm sorry? Uh, so, so welcome to the executive of uh, Central Coast Local Health District. Uh, yes. So, um, I'd like to start by acknowledging... Oh, uh, oh. When you make... oh. Can you hear me? Is yes, I can. Thank you. Please proceed. Excellent. Sorry. Had some background noise. Uh, can I start by acknowledging uh, I'm coming from the Darkenia country and acknowledge elders both past, present, and those emerging in the future who are the Aboriginal people across the Central Coast, um, a community of over 15,000 people and growing rapidly. 
It's a beautiful central coast that uh, covers um, a population of over 350,000 people expected to grow to 390,000 over the next 10 years. Um, a beautiful country that's attracting a lot of um, elderly and retirees, but also a lot of young people. Um, the health of our growing community is supported by a network of hospitals, health centres um, and community-based services to ensure that people do receive health care where and when they need it. And in addition to the public health services we provide, there's a strong network of private hospitals across the coast, as well as a very important network of primary care services that we give full commitment and, and partnership with. And then we've got two acute hospitals, uh, two subacute hospitals, eight community health centres and other community-based services across the whole of the region. Now, over 7,000 skilled clinicians across the local health district provide care to patients every day of the week and support to all of our services. That's been incredibly important over the last 12 and 18 months with the COVID outbreak and pandemic impacts that we've seen. Now, we strive to improve our services year on year and every day to ensure our services reflects the community's needs, the patients that are coming to our services, but also the needs and the opportunities to improve. Now, there's absolutely no doubt that our most valuable asset is our 7,000 staff providing care to support thousands of patients that come to our services every day of the week and we enter their homes and, and other services every day. Uh, through their dedication and passion, we strive to deliver exceptional quality healthcare um, across the whole lifespan of the, and the whole of the community in the Central Coast. Now, can I please acknowledge the significant impact that the pandemic has had by our staff and thank them for their continued dedication, their compassion and caring for our community and support for the whole of the community to keep everyone safe. Now, the environment in which we provide care to patients is rapidly changing and we know that we've seen that over the last two years. Our population is growing, the people within it are ageing and the health needs are becoming more complex, as well as the cost of living is rising. Now, the constant transformation can be a real challenge, but one that we're very equipped and well equipped to, to rise to. New technology, the new developments in techniques can mean that um, innovation and opportunity is upon us every day. Um, the changing ways that we provide care to patients, the changing ways that we use new technology, new drugs, and new opportunities in the virtual care solutions that are available to us have been a big transformation in the last five years and will continue to be in healthcare. Now, the wide range of patients that we encounter ensures that our expertise is evolving every day with every patient. Now, there are many things that have changed, but the one constant is we need to work in partnership with our partners in primary care, the GPs, the NGOs, other service providers, the private hospitals, but more importantly, with our patients, our consumers, the families and um, the community of the whole of the Central Coast. Our commitment is to provide good health care to everyone. We still have some way to go in making sure that's the case for absolutely every person, but it's the absolute dedication and determination of our organisation, our 7,000 staff, uh, myself, our board and um, for the whole of the community. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Crawford, and um, we certainly hope that your, your move from the west to the central coast has, has gone well for you and the transition is uh, occurring as smoothly as it can, so it's, uh, it's good to see you in your role there on the, the great central coast. Now, we'll get the uh, questioning underway and we'll work through 15-minute blocks on a rolling basis uh, until we get through to 11.50 uh, a.m. So we'll commence with the opposition, the Honourable Walt Secord. Thank you, Mr Chair. I'm Walt Secord and I'm representing the Labor Party. Um, I'd like to begin my questioning to Ms Kay Hyman. Um, Ms Hyman, would you, um, would you agree with the observation that the resources in your local health district, the Blue Mountain, uh, the Nepean Blue Mountains local health district, that they are concentrated on the eastern end of your local health district. Uh, so, so Kay Hyman answering um, our tertiary facility, as I indicated, is in Penrith, where. Uh, a large portion of the population in the district uh, is, and that provides support uh, to our other facilities mm -hmm. across the district. The services that are provided um, in the Blue Mountains and in Lithgow 
allow most uh, people to receive most of their care close to home. Thank you. Um, Ms. Hyman, in your opening statement, you mentioned that the Blue Mountains population is 80,000. Um, how many ambulances are available in the Blue Mountains on a regular basis? And I'm aware of the answer. Um, I'm asking you how many ambulances are there currently available serving the Blue Mountains community? Okay, so again, Kay Hyman answering, and that is a question that I will to take on notice. Um, whilst we have a uh, very strong working partnership with Ambulance and they provide great support to us, I don't have those numbers immediately available to me. Well, I do. And um, would you challenge my statement that there are only two ambulances in the Blue Mountains? So that works out to one ambulance for every 40,000 residents in the Blue Mountains local government area. Does that surprise you? Two ambulances. Um, okay, I'm answering again. Um, I don't have those numbers, so I can't comment um, on that. Ms. Miltor, maybe you could add to that since you're uh, director of planning and you'd be aware of the allocation of resources. Do you have any information on ambulances in the Blue Mountains and would you dispute would you dispute that two ambulances for 80,000 people equals one ambulance for 40,000 residents? Uh, at least I'm not answering, uh, like this time, and I don't have that information at hand. I'm um, happy to provide that information to the committee at a later date. Okay, well then how about a question that's not um, numbers-based? What would happen if you had a heart attack on the streets of Katoomba? Where would you be taken? Uh, or Lura, or Springwood, where would you be taken if you had a heart attack? Uh, so Kay Hyman answering, uh, residents of the Blue Mountains area, um, in those areas it described, would be taken to Blue Mountains Hospital, unless it was clear that there was a need for, urgent need for um, care not available locally. Are you aware of the typical weight for an ambulance in Katoomba, Springwood, Lura? Uh, okay, I'm answering again. Um, mm. I'm aware of um, the time that uh, ambulances, um, our response time to offload ambulances when they arrive at the hospital. Mm -hmm. I'm not aware to take on notice anything to do with pre-hospital. Okay. Uh, that is the ambulance service that has that information on. I don't okay. have that available to me. Okay, thank you. I'm just mindful of my time. I have many questions I want to get through. Um, you mentioned that if you had a heart attack on the streets of Katoomba, you'd be taken to the Blue Mountains District Hospital. Is that correct? You said that earlier in evidence. Yeah. Yeah. That's correct. Okay, is the emergency department open 24 hours a day at that hospital? Yes, it is. It is. Is it staffed with a doctor in that emergency department, physically in that emergency department 24 hours a day? Yes, it is. Oh, it is, okay. Um, now, you'd be aware that the Blue Mountains District Hospital, the foundation stone was laid in 1925 and the first procedure took place in 1928. So it would make the hospital, as you said in your opening statement, nearing its 100th birthday. It'd make it 94, 95 years old. You'd be aware of that, wouldn't you? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. So as part of um, a number of years ago, I think it was two elections ago, the Conservative government promised that there'd be a new hospital for the Blue Mountains. Now, the most recent reference that I can find to it is August 21, 2018. What's the status of building a new hospital for the Blue Mountains community? Uh, so Kay, I'm answering again. So as I indicated in my opening statement, um, the development of a new hospital in the Blue Mountains has been identified and uh, submitted as a, as a priority in our capital investment <coughs> program. 
Okay, so that was four years ago that, that you and I, I think, are referring to the same information, uh, a New South Wales health proposal, August 2018, with a local health district spokesperson saying that, yes, this was, quote, a top priority. So has any funding been allocated to this? Has a site been located? Has land been purchased? Has a site been selected? Uh, so Kay Hyman answering. Um, as I've indicated, it is um, a priority for us and has been submitted as such as part of, part of our capital investment uh, prioritisation. Um, but I can confirm that a hospital in the Blue Mountains is a priority, but in terms of site identification or the other items that you have mentioned, uh, that is not uh, not confirmed, um, but it is a priority for us. Has any funding allocation been made to the Blue Mountains Hospital that has been promised now, I think, two elections ago? Has a single dollar been allocated in your budget? Uh, so, given that this is identified as a capital investment priority, um, that, that remains um, our case, and we continue to see this as a priority for us. Ms. 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 Hyman, can I re-ask that question as a yes or no? Has any, have any funds been allocated in the budget for the Blue Mountains new hospital? Yes, yes or no, have funds been allocated? There has not yet been an allocation of capital funds to Blue Mountains Hospital. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So that would be two elections ago. Thank you. Now I want to ask you a couple of other questions about, um, you mentioned in your opening statement, virtual care. Now, is that what we know in rural and regional areas as telehealth? Uh, so Kay, I'm answering. Telehealth is included in virtual care, yep. uh, but it is more than just telehealth. Okay, so what happens in the Blue Mountains involving telehealth virtual care? Uh, so there are a variety of activities, um, not only in the Blue Mountains, but all throughout the Pian Blue Mountains, which are, are supported by virtual care. Um, and that has been particularly so in the last uh, two years with the pandemic. So a range of outpatient consultations uh, mental health assessments, right. um, support for people at home, uh, vital sign monitoring, um, a large a range of services provided virtually. Now, if you need an MRI, a medical um, imaging or nuclear medicine and MRI, um, and you lived in the Blue Mountains, where would you go? Um, at the moment, uh, you would uh, come either to Nepean, mm -hmm. uh, or depending on how you were referred, uh, potentially there is a, uh, an MRI at Bathurst. Um, in the next uh, several months, there will be an operational MRI at Lithgow. Okay. Now, so the answer from, I take it from your answer that there's nothing in Katoomba, Springwood, Lura, that you will have to go to Bathurst or Penrith if you wanted an MRI. That's correct. Correct at this time. At this time, right. Now, have you been able to overcome the staffing problems at Nepean Hospital? And you mentioned that there's an upgrade occurring. Um, now, there have been concerns expressed that there are only two medical officers on duty in the emergency department. Now, I know that Nepean Hospital has one of the busiest emergency departments in New South Wales. Is it correct that um, there are only two medical offers in offices, officers in the emergency department overnight? Uh, that, um, that is not uh, correct, okay. generally. Oh, gen okay, that is not correct, generally. What does that qualification indicate? Right. So what I can't uh, swear to is that there hasn't been a single event uh, through illness or something else um, unexpected that there may have been a short period of time uh, that that may have been the case. 
Uh, but I can confirm that there are more than two staff rostered and 99.9% .9 of the time uh, that is the case. But I cannot guarantee that for a single hour on a single day, uh, what you note may not have been possible. Because previously Nepean Hospital had been um, labelled as the most under-stressed hospital in the state, under-pressured hospital in the state. Has that situation changed? Uh, so, Kay Hyman I'm answering again. Um, that is partly the reason that we have the $1 billion redevelopment um, and we have stage one of that $1 billion uh, redevelopment opening in the next few months. Okay. Now, is it still the situation where women who are in labour, ready to give birth, are sitting in chairs in the maternity ward because of a lack of beds? Is that still the case? I do not believe that has ever been the case, um, and it is certainly not the case currently. How long have you been um, uh, CEO of the LHD? I have been, this is my 11th year. Okay, well, I'm going to take you to task on that. In fact, five or six years ago, there were cases of women sitting in labour because of a lack of maternity beds. Has the situation changed in the last five years? The situation with regard to birthing? Yeah, a lack of birthing beds, facilities. Ms. Um, uh, Ms. Miltorp, is there something that you could add to that about the um, planning for maternity beds? Uh, Elizabeth Miltorp, I'm answering, <coughs> excuse me, I'm unaware of any instance uh, of women sitting in chairs waiting to give birth. Um, I've only been with the district for, I think, three or four years now. Um, and so the instances that you refer to were before my time with the LHD. Um, certainly, I am unaware of any instances in recent times. Um, Ms. Hyman, I'd like to take you to palliative care in the Blue Mountains. What's the current situation for palliative care support in the Blue Mountains, people who want to die in their own homes? Uh, so, Kay Hyman answering. So, as I indicated in my opening statement, uh, there are dedicated beds in both Springwood and Blue Mountains Hospital for those who wish hospital care, for those who wish to die at home, uh, support is provided through our palliative care and community health teams. How many uh, you can take this on notice, how many beds, uh, palliative care beds in those two hospitals that you referred to? Um, we can give you that answer in, in just a moment. Thank you. In the meantime, I'll go to Mr. May, um, Mr. Scott McLaughlin. Um, are you still experiencing staff shortages at Gosford Hospital? Have they been remedied? Mr. Sakura, we've had some success in recruiting in across the whole of the local health district. Um, clearly, COVID in the last 18 months has um, caused some difficulties in recruiting in, uh, both bringing staff in from interstate and, and other locations. Uh, we have had some success in recruiting into the whole of the district, though. Okay. Um, do you still have a shortage of kitchen staff? Is that one of the areas of recruitment? Not that I'm aware of. I know we have, um, on a daily basis, some challenges with staff being furloughed and other, other issues, uh, filling all shifts, uh, but that, that's a challenge across health systems across the whole country and the world. Um, I'm not aware of any um, challenges in specifically the catering department. We can, are, you, uh, are, you, are you aware that nurses have expressed concern that they're supporting and working and helping supporting kitchen staff? Are you aware of those concerns? Nurses play a crucial role in all of our services in support of patients. Including? Sometimes they're supporting with, uh, with food and, and other things in, in the awards and departments that they work in. I'll see you in the next round, Mr. Uh, Mr. McCulpin. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Chair, I'm in Hurst. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I might um, begin by going back uh, to Ms. Maven and Ms. Milthorpe. Um, a number of submissions that we've received in this inquiry, uh, including one from the Blue Mountain City Council uh, and also the Medical Staff Council, um, have raised serious concerns about the need to actually upgrade 
uh, the Blue Mountains Anzac Memorial Hospital. One submission actually described it um, as an aging facility with no room for expansion um, that is beset with asbestos and water leakage challenges. Um, are there plans at the moment to upgrade the hospital? I know you said that there's a plan for, for a new hospital, but is there a plan to upgrade the current hospital at all? Uh, so, Claire Hyman speaking. Um, the current site and the design of the hospital, which has been adapted and enhanced um, over its nearly 100 year life, does mean that it's very difficult to do anything um, significant further. Um, the, the land on which the hospital sits um, is quite uh, densely occupied. Um, and like much of the Blue Mountains, is not easy geography to expand and change um, buildings on that piece of land. Um, a serious concern by quite a few of the Blue Mountains residents is that that current hospital may actually get closed down and then relocated because of, because of some of the difficulties that you've just highlighted. Um, and their concerns are though that if it's relocated, it could be further away from Katoomba. Um, in particular, residents were concerned that if the hospital was moved, they may be cut off from vital medical services uh, during natural disasters such as bushfires. Um, what's your response to this? Um, are there any current plans to actually shut down the current hospital? Um, so I can confirm there are definitely no plans to close uh, Blue Mountains Hospital. It provides a vital service to the residents of the Blue Mountains. Uh, so I can absolutely confirm no plans to reduce or to close. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, according to one of the submissions, 90% of Blue Mountains local government area residents that require surgery currently have to travel areas for their care, mainly to Nepean Hospital. Um, for some people, it's a one-hour drive or two hours by public transport. Um, are there plans to try and offer more of these services to residents locally, either in the short or long term? Uh, so, Kay Hyman answering. Um, we have uh, increased the range of surgery which is available at Blue Mountains over recent years, uh, but there is um, a limit to what the uh, current uh, facility can actually accommodate. So, what are there any plans? I mean, is there any way of addressing that? Because obviously, that's one of the big issues that's been brought up in this inquiry. That you know, if somebody can't drive there, you know, to have to get two hours by public transport, and then you've got a hospital that can't be upgraded. I mean, how do we get around this? Or what are the current thoughts um, within the LHC on how to actually address that problem? Uh, so, as I came home and answering, as I've indicated. Uh, the redevelopment of a hospital in the Blue Mountains has been identified as a priority for us in our capital investment uh, prioritisation. Um, a concern um, that was also raised in a number of submissions is the fact that Blue Mountains Hospital um, is within the Sydney Metropolitan Zone and is not classified as a rural hospital. Mm. Um, and therefore, it, it doesn't attract junior clinical staff for rural service. Um, is this something that is, is, is anything being done about this, or is this something that's continuing to be a challenge? Uh, so, Kay Hyman answering. Um, our clinical streaming uh, process, um, I think, is important in this context uh, because it's through that that we can um, allocate junior staff and specialties where we know that they've got appropriate supervision. Um, and it allows uh, staff to get experience in places other than tertiary facilities, which is uh, really important. Uh, we also have trainees uh, that are interested in being general practitioners uh, that uh, go to Blue Mountains Hospital as well. Uh, so we do have staff in training and junior staff um, getting the experience at Blue Mountains Hospital. Um, and, and just to sort of expand on that a little bit, um, uh, is, am I right in thinking that Blue Mountains Hospital is one of the few hospitals that doesn't have um, on-site associated medical school? Is that right? Uh, it, it, that's correct. It doesn't have a clinical school currently associated. 
And does that present challenges for training as, and staff retention? Um, I came home and I'm strength. Um, I, I don't believe uh, so. So we do have uh, staff that have rotated uh, to Blue Mountains, to Hawkesbury, uh, who are from Nepean Clinical School. Um, and, um, you know, part of their employment uh, at Nepean Blue Mountains includes rotation uh, to Blue Mountains Hospital. Not, not everyone, um, but certainly uh, an increasing number do have that experience. Um, it's also been raised that only 1% of medical staff actually live in the Blue Mountains that, that actually work at the hospital, when there's the other 99% of commuting from other areas. Um, why do you think that's the case, um, that so many staff do not live locally? Uh, so I would, um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I, I doubt very much that it is 99%, um, knowing how many of our staff do live locally. Um, and uh, there are, I can immediately bring to mind uh, some Blue Mountains medical staff that do live in the Blue Mountains area. Um, and those, uh, there are also medical staff that may live in the Penrith or Hawkesbury areas as well that may work at Blue Mountains. Um, so the percentage is very different if you look at people that live within the local health district in total um, versus those that may live in the Blue Mountains. But I'm, um, I, I have to take on notice that Wonderful. Yeah, if you could take that on notice just because of the information we got, we're 99% commuting from other areas, but if you've got different data, that would be um, fantastic if you could give that to us. Um, and so, you know, I'll give my you know, final question on um, in terms of staffing on call rosters um, or staff having to travel in from other areas. Um, do you find that even if those numbers are wrong, that you do still have a significant number of staff actually still travelling in, and does that cause issues? Uh, so I, I um, can't comment on the specifics of the number uh, that do come in because I'd need to actually validate that and we've taken on notice the number that live uh, locally. Uh, we do provide on-site accommodation for staff at Blue Mountains. Um, and so if somebody um, is not wanting to travel at the end of the shift or maybe on shift for several days and they don't live locally, they can stay on-site. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. That's the uh, time, Emma, so we'll just pass over to Kate now. Uh, Kate Fairman. Thank you, Chair. Um, I want to go to the Central Coast LHD to begin with, just with a general question about nursing and midwifery vacancies and just wondering if, if you know how many vacant uh, nursing and midwifery positions there are currently within the LHD? Maybe Mr. Thank you, Mr. Burton. Scott McLaughlin responding here. But we've got a total staffing of over 7,000 staff, um, approximately 3,300 um, nurses in head camp, 2,700 uh, uh, full-time equivalent staff. But of all those, uh, we currently have around 200 um, nursing vacancies. Uh, some of that's obviously uh, new positions that we're establishing uh, with a while of redevelopment and recruiting into. Uh, some of its normal turnover and change that we expect to see and, and other vacancies that we're currently recruiting to. Is that, so when you said nursing, is that is that midwives as well? Uh, yes, that includes midwives as well. Okay, so you're aware that recently, in fact, December, so before the current outbreak, which I understand is, is putting huge pressure on the hospitals in the Central Coast region, as they are in hospitals across New South Wales, that before this outbreak, there were strikes by nurses at um, Gosford and Wyong hospitals. You're aware of those strikes, Mr McLaughlin? Uh, I'm certainly aware there's been some concerns expressed. Um, I wouldn't call them strikes. There was some concerns expressed by nursing staff that we need to recruit into all of our vacant positions. 
and fill those on an ongoing basis. That's certainly the desire and intent from the local health district. So when the nurses are um, discussing, they're talking about unreasonable workloads, they're talking about um, dangerous staffing, shortfalls, um, you know, critical uh, patient care being compromised. So what, since you've been in the position, and I recognise that you're new to it, but, but what is being done on the Central Coast now to ensure that kind of nurses are heard, to ensure that those nurses who are considering resigning particularly um, don't resign? Because we're hearing this right across the state, what's happening in Central Coast to make sure that nurses who are in the job now stay in the job? Uh, thank you, Sir. And let's go back on here again. There's a lot of support that we've put in place, particularly over the last three or four months, uh, with the changes uh, that have come about from the COVID outbreaks to support all their staff, but in particular nursing staff, um, in the way of additional new graduate nurses. We've brought on significant numbers of additional new graduate nurses and brought those forward to bolster our numbers of nursing staff, recruited in additional nursing staff for the last two months in particular to provide casual support and um, as needs support on different shifts. A number of additional nursing staff in the private hospitals have come in to provide uh, support in those environments. And so there has been a real string of numbers of nursing staff. In terms of uh, workload management, every day of the week we um, look at the numbers of patients in our beds, the complexity or um, certain support that those patients need and the numbers of types of nursing staff that are needed for those. Now, if we do have vacancies on a daily basis, that's our absolute top priority every morning to, to make sure we can fill those. We've got a, uh, a casual nursing pool across the whole of the region that is agile and flexible to move into those, uh, those gaps and support um, care where we need to. Is the LHD doing anything to address the fact that, I mean, nurses are uh, incredibly exhausted. What, what, what's being done to, specifically for those nurses in, in the job now, to retain them, to look after their kind of, I suppose, mental health and wellbeing as well, if you like? Uh, thanks, Ms. Furman. Uh, Scott McLaughlin here again. Um, it has been a stressful time for the last uh, three, four, five months, no doubt, with the current outbreaks and the pressure that's been on. Um, we've done a lot to try and support staff with um, both having um, reasonable um, shifts and, and regular breaks around those. You know, it's sometimes been challenging. Uh, we've had uh, the numbers of staff furloughed on a daily basis that have needed uh, staff to be flexible and take the power to all of our staff that have been amazing, particularly since, uh, since Christmas time in helping to fill a lot of those gaps. Um, a lot of our wellbeing supports are still in place and um, being offered to all of our staff. Whether it is uh, counselling, whether it's time away from the workplace, um, additional leave if they've needed it, and also family considerations of uh, having family members that might be in isolation from COVID or, or will and, and otherwise. But there's a lot of the workload um, balancing things that we do and also care and understanding for, for our staff that. I've got to say it's just been exceptional in the last couple of months in particular in a pretty stressful environment. So when you say when you say um, additional leave if they need it, we um, I'm hearing um, stories of cancelled leave. I think that's been reported that nurses have had their leave cancelled actually and they've had to to um, to stay and work. So that has has nurses in the Central Coast LHD had their leave cancelled? Are you aware of that? Thanks, Mr. Furman. Uh, Scott, welcome here again. Um, but there's been a lot of flexibility from our staff in, in changing shifts, in changing some of their leave uh, to make sure that we can provide support to patients, both COVID and, and um, our patients that come to our services every day of the week. So, uh, yes, there's been some flexibility in, in staff taking leave, but certainly been the case for a lot of our senior leaders, our corporate and support staff, and our whole of our team to make sure we can respond when we need to. So just to be clear, your word, the language there, flexibility, the, my question was had, had, had staff had their leave cancelled, which is not kind of flexibility, if you like. That's, that's more having their leave cancelled, yes? The flexibility is more, if, um, is more on the staff maintaining the flexibility, but cancelling is more a mandatory thing. Oh, sorry. Well, there's been times where we have needed to talk to staff about changing some of their leave 
and uh, coming back to provide support and input functions. So that, that's what I call flexibility, but it's certainly a discussion that we have. I'm sure some, I'm uh, sure some, some of your of those... staff don't call it flexibility, yeah, Mr McLaughlin. It depends on what position you're in, I assume. I just wanted to go to just the, the situation in the hospitals within the Central Coast LHD in terms of separating COVID patients from, from non-COVID patients and whether that is still, whether that's being done. So it is, Scott McLaughlin here. We, we have uh, two dedicated wards at Gosford and one dedicated ward at Wyong for the care of COVID patients. But um, people with COVID are admitted because of their COVID or uh, for other health conditions. Uh, we've got a range of what we call negative pressure rooms or isolation rooms that we can keep uh, people with infectious diseases in, and some of those have COVID patients in them. And likewise, in air intensive care units, we've got dedicated separate rooms uh, for the care of COVID patients. So, yes, we have maintained um, all COVID patients within those um, three environments that I've just talked about. Um, but we're seeing decreasing numbers of um, people needing to be admitted with COVID at the moment that's helping the management of that. Thank you very much, uh, Kate. We'll return again to you later. Uh, the Honourable West Fane. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you to all the witnesses who are appearing today, um, making yourselves available to us and, and providing the insights uh, that uh, are so valuable for this uh, hearing. Uh, Mr McLaughlin, it's great to uh, see you again. Um, you've been a, uh, a fixture, I'll say, uh, of these uh, hearings, and um, uh, you're able to provide some valuable insights now, obviously, uh, in the old role plus the new role, and that's probably where I'm going to start my questioning. Um, I, I note that um, obviously uh, you've had experience, you know, in, in the far west of the state, um, and now uh, you're looking after the central coast. Um, we've got uh, the Blue Mountains here. We've got uh, Illawarra and southwest Sydney um, appearing later today. Um, could you perhaps provide some insights to the committee as to how um, perhaps the uh, clinicians, the staff and the um, patients themselves of um, the far west would um, consider having uh, southwest Sydney, Illawarra, Central Coast and the Blue Mountains grouped in with rural, regional and remote health inquiries. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fang. I've got a comment here again. This is no doubt that we all share some common challenges across regional, rural, and remote health services. And that's been well heard, I know, by the, uh, the committee around some of the workforce recruitment challenges in trying to maintain and um, recruit in new workforce. Um, some of our challenges in uh, maintaining services in those, um, in those times to all of our communities. Uh, the one thing that joins all of us together is um, some vulnerable communities that, that need um, tailored health services to their communities. And that's certainly the intent, I know, from all rural, regional and uh, remote parts of the state. Um, the, the things that we see is very dear in that, is um, making sure that we can provide services close to home, as close to home as possible. Um, Utilising uh, new technologies, new ways of providing that care and making sure that we can um, make those um, connections with patients and their families in a very compassionate and caring way. So across all of our rural, remote, regional and remote services, I know that's the intention. Uh, but there's a lot of um, positive developments across health at the moment in um, stretching the opportunities to, to make sure we can take um, those care, to take care to <laughs> patients and communities locally. Uh, but that's certainly there's some positive developments with uh, the advent of virtual care and the new ways of helping um, save precious time and, and travel for the patients. And whether it's on the central coast, it's been blue mountain, we're out to the broken by uh, west of the state. Um, I know that's something that patients do value and are seeing a lot of opportunities in. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, 
I, I think um, what we've seen throughout these inquiries has been, uh, and I use the word demonisation of um, whether it be telehealth services or virtual services, but uh, I think there's um, been much uh, documented but not publicised evidence that um, those uh, virtual or um, telehealth services can actually provide a real benefit to um, to the communities with which they're rolled out in, whether it be um, the far west or whether it be in more um, uh, densely populated areas such as the central coast. Um, are you seeing that they're able to provide that um, uh, benefit to to the communities uh, throughout the state, um, given the, the the differences between um, the areas that, that you know the New South Wales Health itself um, has a provision of service across. No, thanks, Mr. Fang. Let's go to welcome here again. There's no doubt if you talk to patients um, who have received a service uh, virtually, um, whether it's a specialist clinic that they didn't have to travel two, three, four hundred kilometres, or even. 20 kilometres to attend um, and um, have had a consult consultation with a specialist that was valuable and happened over technology that saved them precious time from having to leave home and their families, then there's a benefit to that. Um, but there's certain benefits across the health system in delivering in specialist expertise um, when and where we need it to a lot of our um, small rural health services, but also within Central Coast that that happens on on a regular basis to make sure we can get the specialists to the bedside of patients when we need them. So there's a lot of opportunity, I'd say, out of virtual health services, but on the central coast, I know there's still a lot of opportunities to improve you know, the care we provide locally through that as well. Thank you. Um, I'll turn now to uh, the Bloom Mountains um, uh, district. And um, again, I'm surprised that the opposition and crossbench have, have grouped in places like the Blue Mountains and southwest Sydney in a rural regional health inquiry. But um, regardless, um, I just wanted to, um, I guess, seek some elucidations about how um, COVID has um, uh, impacted uh, with the services um, in uh, the Blue Mountains area and um, perhaps some uh, innovative ways with which um, you might have been able to um, overcome some of the challenges with, say, staffing or, or providing um, services to, to patients um, using um, perhaps virtual means or, um, or any other uh, insights around um, how the challenges of COVID have been met by your local health district. Uh, so thank you, Katie Hyman, for answering. Uh, so like uh, the rest of New South Wales, the rest of Australia, the, the rest of the world, um, COVID has had a significant impact. In terms of um, innovative responses, the one that immediately springs to mind um, comes from our allied health teams and uh, people who've uh, had joint replacement surgery uh, require physio and, and some occupational therapy. And there was a concern that some of these people might be um, not able to receive that in the way that they would normally do when uh, we reduced outpatient uh, attendances. So fantastic innovative team. Um, and looking at basically what you would describe as a, a virtual physio class uh, from individual people's homes. So the physio able to observe people doing their exercises in their home in the same way that they would be able to do in a gym. Um, and one of the benefits for that was that uh, physios and the OTs could actually see the person's home, understand the environment in which they were living, uh, which in normal circumstances, when the person attends the hospital gym, they don't get that opportunity. Um, so they certainly saw benefits and the patients were and continue to be greatly appreciated. So what in effect you're saying is, is that um, there's been um, a uh, advantage almost in, in the uh, rolling out of some more innovative methods around the provision of, say, uh, physiotherapy um, 
that wouldn't necessarily have happened uh, without the, the, the pandemic. Um, are you looking to actually keep those uh, initiatives uh, rolling, um, I guess, after we return to some normality? Are there other, any other learnings that you may have found throughout um, the, the pandemic which have actually provided a, an unexpected benefit um, to the provision of healthcare in your area that you think might um, be able to be utilised into the future um, in more regular and normal times? Uh, so certainly, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. So for hence I came home and answering again. Um, and it is in that virtual care space. Uh, so the allied health example I gave is but one. And certainly as um, we look to whatever um, endemic uh, COVID looks like, we are um, considering which of the innovations that we have implemented uh, will continue, uh, which may have you know, some slight modifications, and uh, which of them were appropriate for the situation we were in, but you know, there are better alternatives going forward. So we have all those uh, considerations, but there is no doubt that virtual care in its broader sense uh, will be a bigger feature of healthcare for us in the Pier Blue Mountains and I'm sure across the whole of the health service as we go forward. Thank you for that. Um, in any, um, uh, I guess, uh, looking uh, at a um, uh, quality assurance perspective, um, the feedback loop is obviously very important, uh, not only for you as a provider, but also for patients. Um, have you had an opportunity to seek feedback from patients who have perhaps had experience around uh, the regular, um, say, pre-COVID provision of healthcare, and then had the opportunity to uh, experience um, the provision of, say, uh, physiotherapy or, or any other medical services um, during the COVID pandemic and actually uh, get that feedback and gauge uh, the positives and negatives from the patients and find out which parts of that provision of service that they've um, preferred and have actually um, perhaps uh, found more beneficial to their recovery so that you may look to roll that out um, after we return to more normal times once the pandemic has, has passed. So, Kay, I'm answering and I can say that that is for us very much a work in progress. Uh, for, for some people and the example that I gave of, you know, joint replacement, uh, that's not often uh, something that people experience understandably multiple times. Uh, so a sort of, you know, pre and post is not possible for everything. Uh, but certainly anecdotally along the way, um, very significant um, positive feedback uh, from patients and their families that we've been gathering along the way. And um, I think we just need to um, uh, complete our work in progress around that. Uh, we've got some particular uh, clinicians with interest in this area, and uh, we'll certainly uh, be looking at that and, uh, as I've indicated, modifying uh, what we do as we go forward, but definitely including um, increased virtual care as we go forward. Excellent. Thank you very much. And I haven't got much time left, but um, we, we touched on uh, the, the training uh, that is being, um, I guess, provided around the, the Blue Mountains area for um, clinicians. Uh, and one of the, the uh, points that was raised, I think, by uh, the Honourable Emma Hurst, the Deputy Chair, was that... Um, because the, the training positions are not classed um, as rural, um, that you were having difficulty, um, I guess, attracting trainees. Um, can I just confirm and clarify, 
the trainees um, or, or say um, uh, intern positions that, or, or training positions that you have at the hospital, that training time does count towards their um, uh, whatever uh, specialty or, um, like you said, a GP uh, uh, training requirements that they um, they need to achieve um, their accreditation. It just doesn't account for the time that's required for the rural component of that training. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. So, Kay Honeyman Armstrong, um, that is correct. And there are there's a complex um, series of uh, college requirements. So, depending on what the training is actually training for. Um, the college has a number of requirements that they need to, both in terms of hours and experience. Um, so we need to match that against um, the level of experience and um, the trainees' requirements. So it's not a, a simple um, allocation, uh, but certainly uh, we aim to provide trainees with experience in the location that's appropriate to what they need and is meeting their college requirements. I guess I'm just, um, uh, I guess, seeking the clarification that the training time isn't lost, for example. Um, it just doesn't count for rural exposure, which um, I guess as somebody who um, comes from, you know, a very regional area, um, I would think that, you know, Blue Mountains area um, is not somewhere that I would consider to be rural um, exposure. So I, I don't necessarily uh, think that that's, that's an issue, but I just wanted to clarify that point because I think it was perhaps um, a point that uh, could have been misinterpreted had it not um, had that um, clarification by you. But thank you. I just note my time has expired and I'll pass back to the chair for the next round of questions. Thanks, Senator Westbank. Uh, we now uh, move to our final round of questions uh, by, uh, by committee members and to just let the groups know we've got about approximately seven minutes each to take us through to our conclusion <coughs> time, the time we have to conclude or thereabouts. So we'll move now to the Honourable Secretary. Thank you, and um, my questions will probably actually centre to um, Mr. Scott McLaughlin. Um, Mr. McLaughlin, I want to touch on what, what the Honourable Wes Fang referred to, the transition from a remote Western New South Wales health system to um, the Central Coast. So are you experiencing the same staffing challenges that you experienced in Western New South Wales on the Central Coast? Uh, thank you, Mr. Secord. That's got a lot on here. There's no doubt there's workforce challenges across health everywhere across the, the state, mm -hmm. the country, and the world. Uh, Central Coast isn't immune to, the, to that by any means. Yeah. So we do share some of those um, difficulties in recruiting into some of our roles. Uh, we'd love to see more staff available in a lot of our services. So we do have some um, difficulties recruiting in. Uh, Dr Chen will be able to talk about the um, extents that we go to in recruiting into a lot of our medical roles um, with an extensive international medical recruitment strategy. But that has seen our know, workforce grow significantly in the last a couple of years. Now, are you, um, in Western New South Wales, there were situations where you used telehealth, virtual medicine. Are you introducing those um, those plans, those programs to the Central Coast or expanding them on the Central Coast? Uh, Mr. Scott, uh, Scott Long here again. Uh, telehealth and virtual care exists across most urban environments as well as rural and remote services, so there's nothing new in that uh, certainly for the central coast that has been um, telehealth or virtual care support provided across our um, paediatric services and a range of other specialties just within the local health district we know a lot of our um, specialists provide their outpatient clinics um, right through COVID but uh, into normal times through um, through technology means and so there's certainly nothing new in that um, what we do see opportunity mm -hmm. for the growth in telehealth and it's to be honest, what, what a lot of patients are wanting is um, as easier access to, to those specialist care services. Well, can, um, can I take you to a specific hospital on the Central Coast, Long Jetty Hospital? Um, what's happening currently at Long Jetty Hospital? Uh, so we've got an extensive health campus at Long Jetty that's got a whole range of 
services provided on that health campus from a renal dialysis centre, a palliative care support service, from their mental health, drug and alcohol service, and their community um, based teams are sort of both located there. No. Uh, Sometimes we've had um, some inpatient uh, services provided there up until around uh, six months ago, where those were paused with the onset of um, the Delta, Delta strain and yep. the impact uh, that we could see come that needed. Um, some additional public health and other services provided from that campus. Uh, we now provide vaccination and other services in addition to those communities from Long Duty Health Campus. Now, can you give a commitment? There's concern in the community that um, it rightly has been used for COVID-related activity, that some of the services there have ceased, been paused during during COVID, that you will be reopening Long Jetty Hospital with normal services resuming. Well, clearly at the moment, uh, the, the um, current outbreak is needing us to focus a lot of our public health um, services onto that campus. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't got a crystal ball to see when that will change. Uh, there's certainly some planning going into at what stage where we could um, return services to, to Long G, but that's not clear at the moment. I see you don't have a target date of, you don't have the crystal ball, I guess. No, we don't. No. Can I ask you about Edelong Ambulance Station? Um, what's the current status of the station? Uh, Mr. Scott, as you know, uh, we don't um, run ambulance services from the local health districts, and it's run by the statewide um, ambulance services. But, but I am aware that there's a new ambulance station uh, that's proposed to be developed at uh, Woyboy, uh, that is expected to service um, the, the southern part of the, uh, the local health district. Okay, but um, how is the lack of ambulance services interfacing with the services that you provide? First of all, we've got a great relationship with uh, ambulance services right across the coast on a daily basis. We know there's around 18 ambulances available through the day across the coast. It's something that uh, we work very closely with the service to make sure that where possible we can provide good care to patients in home that don't need to come to a hospital. Um, we talk regularly with ambulance that about some of the pressures in our hospitals mm -hmm. and um, the needs and opportunities for making sure that patients get to the right place at the right time. Now you have to excuse my ignorance here of the question. What is the current status of the Edelong Ambulance Station? Is it open or closed at this moment? Uh, this is good. Cool. Um, um, running the ambulance services for the coast, uh, I couldn't tell you the definite answer to that. I'd need to take that on, on notice. You don't know if it's open or shut? You don't know if, if the ambulance service at Edelong, if the ambulance station is open or closed? You're taking that on notice. That's fine. Okay, can I go to elective surgery? Now, there was an announcement this morning that elective surgery was resuming in some parts of New South Wales. Is it resuming on the Central Coast? Does it, in fact, fall under the announcement made today? Oh. That was Scott here. Uh, like all parts of New South Wales, we have caused some elective surgery um, in the... Um, groups of patients that that can, um, can be delayed for some time. It's not something that we want to do. And so we, we do want to resume uh, the elective surgery as quickly as possible. Um, we have, however, had arrangements in place with the private hospitals on the Central Coast to provide some of that elective surgery that we just couldn't provide through the public hospitals. Um, they're still continuing at the moment, we're planning with those private hospitals around how they also return to the, around 75% of the um, elective surgery that they normally provide, um, and also to support the public hospital while we manage the current COVID outbreak. But that planning will continue in, in the coming weeks, and we certainly don't have the capacity at the moment to return to our full uh, volume of, of elective surgery for all of those patients. But we do want to do that as quickly as we can. Thank you. One final question to Ms. Heyman, please. In your, in your answer earlier, you talked about, when I asked a series of questions about Blue Mountains Hospital, and there are no plans to close Blue Mountains Hospital. Now, under the plans that, um, that were put forward in 2018 and two elections ago, the promise, what's the impact on Springwood Hospital? Uh, so, Penny, I'm an answering. So, um, 
at the moment we have no particular plans to change uh, Springwood Hospital in any form. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could I? Uh, yep. uh, we took on notice earlier a question about the number of palliative care beds. I'm yes. able to provide that if you would like that. Yes, enough. yes, please, um, but just be mindful of other uh, other people's time. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so the, the, the answer is simply two at Blue Mountains and four in Springwood. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, moving to the deputy chair, Honourable Emma Hurst. Thank you. Thanks, chair. Um, I'm going to move uh, to Mr McLaughlin and Professor Chan. Um, a, a key concern that's really been raised uh, in this inquiry from local residents is the lack of access to, to general practitioners um, in the area. Um, one of the submissions actually noted that, um, that she and her son drive 50 kilometres to Mount Coringa in Sydney because uh, they really struggle to get an appointment locally. Um, have you heard concerns similar to this, or did you read that particular submission? Ms. Hurst, uh, Scott McLaughlin here, I might um, take this question first and then hand over to Dr. Chen. Oh. Uh, there's no question that um, GPs and the primary care sector is crucial in, in the health service provision of the case. There are some shortages of GPs around 100. Um, GPs um, are being recruited um, at the moment, physicians being recruited into private practices and, and other services. So it's something that we um, support extensively with the primary health network and to try and help um, general practice um, grow and, and thrive um, to be able to look after patients outside of, of hospitals. Now, we do provide some support to the primary health network. Um, I might let uh, Dr. Chen also outline a bit of our medical recruitment strategy that can help with that. Thank you. Chen. Stevie Chen. Uh, Thanks, Professor. Stevie Chen responding to Ms. Hurst's question. Thank you for that. Um, just to supplement what Mr. McLaughlin had uh, indicated, uh, the Central Coast Local Health District works very closely with our local GPs and uh, the Hunter, New England and Central Coast Primary Healthcare Network. Uh, insofar as we have a, a regular meeting forum called the GP Collaboration Panel, and uh, I meet with uh, the GP leaders on a regular basis to look at how we can uh, provide incentive strategies uh, together, uh, working with the GP network in attracting GPs to the area. So I do acknowledge the concerns you had raised, and uh, I do want to indicate uh, a program called the Central Coast GP Sea Change Program. It is an incentive program provided by the primary healthcare network uh, that had um, been um, successful in providing some uh, financial incentives and supporting in incentives for attracting GPs to the Central Coast. Um, and Professor Chan, what, what are the incentives other than the, other than the financial incentives? So what does that mean? <laughs> It provides uh, support also in training and supervision, as well as some uh, social support for the families of the GP uh, in the form of financial incentives. It's about $40,000 grant for the successful applicant, and that provide uh, some uh, ability to uh, relocate and support their uh, change of environment. Uh, I'm wondering as well, um, and this might go back to Mr McLaughlin, uh, about with the, I mean, I know we all recognise that there's, there's an issue with the number of GPs. I'm wondering what kind of strain that puts on the hospitals. Um, we've had submissions saying that people are going to the hospital for non-urgent matters because they can't get to a GP. Um, what sort of feedback have you had and, and what are we doing sort of practically on the ground to address that problem? Uh, thanks, Mr. Uh, Scott, welcome here again. Uh, there's no doubt that when um, people can't get access to good primary care and they've got an illness that needs some level of care, and sometimes the hospital is the um, best or maybe only course of um, receiving and um, getting treatment. And the north and northwestern part of our region around Lyle and a very rapidly growing population, that that is the case for some of the community that don't have access uh, to a GP, that uh, we do see uh, higher volume or more patients there who come to our emergency departments for care, for non urgent care in, in the main. And so um, it's something that, as Dr. Chan was talking about, we work very closely with the GPs to try and help them recruit in, uh, to try and help grow general practice numbers and the number of practices in the region to keep up with the, the 
the growing population in the region. Uh, but have you heard of like some of the strain that that's potentially causing on the hospitals and the staff that are working in the hospitals? Is that adding further strain to those staff members? And what's being done to support those staff members with that additional burden? Uh, we certainly do see uh, more numbers of patients needing to come to the emergency department in and around Lyon uh, than we would normally expect. Um, that is, I think, directly related to some of the gaps in primary care and general practice services. So um, we do provide um, a lot of support, both obviously to our staff and our services to help them provide care to those, um, to those patients. Uh, there's an um, after hours general practice service that's on site at, um, at Wild Hospital that does provide some supplemental care for those patients that really don't need to be in the emergency department, particularly after hours when, when other practices aren't open. The bell's gone. So, sorry, sorry, Deputy Chair. The bell's the bell's gone. So, apologise. We'll move across now to Kate Fairman. Thank you, Chair. I just quickly go back to to you, Mr. McLaughlin, and what we were talking about um, before my time ran out last time, which was you mentioned that there was dedicated separate wards or rooms for COVID patients in all of the facilities and that they kind of have dedicated safe environments. So I wanted to go to um, a particular situation that was reported in the media, which I understand there's a review into, which was, um, are you aware of the situation for Alex Wilkes' wife, Kitty, who went to Gosford Hospital's emergency department and was situated with um, what she understood was two other, two, two COVID positive patients. She went to that hospital with a broken ankle, a badly swollen ankle. You're aware of that situation? No, Chairman, not in detail, but um, we do have occasions where patients come into our emergency departments and subsequently we find out that a patient is positive for COVID. Uh, well, we take every step we can, uh, obviously, to support the care of patients, but also the safety of our staff when um, people have COVID in our our services, um, if that case was in an emergency department, we do have dedicated parts of our emergency departments that do um, have specialist staff all um, kicked out with the PPE and all the support to care for patients with COVID. Um, if there was an instance in a ward, in an inpatient ward, where we subsequently found out that a patient had COVID, then we would move those patients to our dedicated COVID wards. And so there, there are those circumstances um, where um, we find out after a person has been admitted uh, that they do have code. I won't go into the specifics of this um, case, but... Sure. Um, does, it, does it suggest, though, that this, this specific case was actually a um, one woman who had a badly swollen ankle in the emergency department in Gosford Hospital for three to four hours in a room with two other patients who were all sitting on chairs, they were coughing and clearly had COVID symptoms and they were there because of COVID. Does that suggest to you that the emergency department set up in Gosford Hospital just isn't adequate to ensure that non-COVID patients are separated from COVID patients? So hospitals across the world have had to deal with the um, you know, dedicated separate areas for, for COVID patients. I know in both Gosford and Wild, in two brand new emergency departments, there's some good areas and support services for, for patients with COVID. If there has been instances where we've subsequently found out that uh, patients have had COVID, then we move those patients as quickly as, as possible into those, um, what we call them, the red zones or the areas of those emergency departments. Um, if there's been a busy day in that emergency department, sometimes there might be um, some constraints in, in doing that. Um, what we do in those instances, however, is make sure that there's the um, best PPE and separation around um, patients as much as possible. Our staff take extreme measures to make sure that those, those patients are cared for and separated wherever possible. OK, I understand that there is a report uh, going to happen on that particular issue. I just wanted to go quickly with the limited time I have left to Nepean Hospital, um, the mental health centre, the outbreak that they had uh, there in August. Ms uh, Hyman, why was Nepean Hospital's mental health centre so unprepared for a COVID outbreak back in August? Uh, so, Kay Hyman answering. Um, I think there was um, 
a belief in the system generally, not just at the PN Hospital, that um, COVID patients would be presenting for for their COVID conditions. Um, and you know, in hindsight, maybe we should have uh, thought differently. But um, that you know, if a mental health patient uh, had COVID, that they would be you know really unwell and would need to be in the COVID ward. Um, as it turned out, um, I believe we had the first outbreak, and there have been many since in mental health facilities. Uh, so there was a recognition that people may have COVID, but be um, not so unwell that they actually need uh, COVID ward care. Uh, so when we had the outbreak, we rapidly responded and uh, put in place the uh, requirements to ensure safe care for COVID positive patients in a mental health environment uh, because their mental health needs were actually outweighing their, their COVID needs. Thank you. Uh, um, thank, thank you. Moving now to the Honourable West Bank. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. And um, I'll take this opportunity. Uh, Professor Chan, um, much like the question that I asked of uh, the uh, team from the Blue Mountains uh, Local Health District, um, I'm keen to know uh, what learnings you might have had from uh, the COVID situation uh, on the Central Coast and how perhaps you've been able to um, be agile uh, in that response and if there's any particular learnings or uh, ways of um, providing the medical service that um, you would normally have done in a face-to-face -face setting that is now perhaps um, being uh, provided for in a more virtual setting and uh, you have found that it's a more beneficial and more, um, uh, say, therapeutic or uh, more pre preferable way for the patient to uh, receive that treatment. Well, thank you, Mr. Pang. Uh, Scott McLaughlin here. Happy to uh, reflect on uh, some of the learnings out of uh, the last two, three, four months. Um, that they have been significant. Um, clearly, the uh, Omicron strain has surprised the world and changed a lot of things that um, we had prepared and um, we're ready to enact that we needed to adapt. And, and that's certainly been the case for Central Coast. It's been um, a fast-paced um, environment over the last particularly six weeks since the start of the, the outbreak. Um, a change, changes to a lot of our public health, our testing, our accommodation, our vaccination programs, our emergency departments and inpatient services have occurred over those times. Uh, to pick up part of your question around the support from the virtual services, uh, there's no doubt that um, technology has helped play a role in the patients and people in the community for generally in accessing, uh, whether it's your banking, whether it's the whole range of other uh, daily needs, and in um, the case of healthcare, that's certainly the case in patients and to access their gene equipment. These have been fantastic in adapting uh, the ways that they provide support and advice uh, for, for patients through technology. Now, through our health services, we've seen a lot of change, whether it's in some of our rehabilitation environments, in not being able to get groups of people together, but still needing to help people on their rehabilitation journey using technology and other supports uh, in the home to be able to do that. Uh, whether it's in our community-based clinics, um, a lot of our specialist community nursing teams, and in particular our COVID care support team have provided a lot of support to people with COVID um, through technology. I think we've seen great uh, advancements in the monitoring technology in the last, uh, last 12 and 18 months of being able to monitor a patient's or a person's condition in their home, not requiring them to come into hospital for a lot of their care, but triggering that if they need to. So that technology is just being able to help us both keep staff and other people safe um, and keep uh, people with COVID in their homes. Now, one of the real developments I think has been um, the, the support for the specialist clinicians being able to provide advice, whether it's a cardiologist, a paediatrician or a respiratory specialist uh, to patients that don't need to come into a busy clinic um, in their home 
you know, let's say all the news and documents and, and support to make sure that uh, patients can get the advice that they need when they need it. Um, clinicians are currently keeping up with you know, a lot of the new technologies to, to make sure that, that happens. So I do see a lot of opportunities out of that. Uh, so to return to your question, there will, there will be a lot of reflections out of that, okay, not just on the technology front of things that we need to adapt and, and do differently in the future. Thank you very much for that. Um, I just thought I'd um, briefly offer uh, Professor Chan um, the opportunity to just um, maybe um, just uh, give us a sh very short, um, uh, any experiences. We've only got less than a minute left now, so. Thank you, Mr. Fang. Stevie Chan responding uh, to your question and to add to Mr. McLaughlin's discussion. I do also resonate with uh, his comments about the benefits of virtual care and the COVID season had, uh, I guess, converted uh, both the health system staff and the consumers' uh, acceptance and understanding of the benefits of virtual care. And to your question about uh, what other learnings, I would like to add that uh, I also learned about the resilience of our staff, not just the medical staff, but nurses, allied health professionals. In fact, the whole health system staff has worked really hard in the last two years. And I do want to thank and acknowledge uh, all the hard work that, that every health service is putting in to deal with COVID. Thank you very much for providing those uh, valuable insights to us. And certainly we know that uh, technology has played a role, uh, not only in the medical field, but allowing this committee to continue its valuable work. So uh, I know that we are out of time. Uh, I thank you for providing your insights today. Chair, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, that brings us to the conclusion, um, right on the dot. So thank you for that, um, of this session. Um, I'm punctual. On behalf of the, uh, the committee, can we once again express our uh, sincere thank thanks to all timing. of you, um, not just for making yourself available today, uh, that's uh, been an impost on you in terms of other commitments. So carving out that time we know has been, been difficult, we, but we appreciate you've done that. Uh, but more broadly speaking, to thank you all for the, uh, the outstanding work you do um, in your respective local health districts uh, for and on behalf of the, the citizens who reside there. And uh, to pass on our thanks to all of the people who work uh, in your LHD uh, day in, day out, uh, looking after uh, our people in New South Wales. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Chair. OK. Well,
Well, good afternoon and uh, welcome back to our uh, afternoon <coughs> session for this inquiry uh, into health uh, and health, out health services and health outcomes in regional rural and remote New South Wales. Um, we have uh, uh, two groups of witnesses this afternoon, uh, one, one group between now and uh, a short break at two o'clock and then a group between uh, two o'clock and 3.35pm uh, today. But can I uh, welcome our first uh, set of witnesses this afternoon. Uh, my name is Greg Donnelly and I'm uh, the chair of the committee and uh, I welcome uh, Ms uh, Margaret uh, Bennett, who is the chief executive of Southern New South Wales Local Health District, and Dr Liz Mullins, who's the executive director uh, of medical services for the Southern New South Wales Local Health District. So thank you both for uh, making yourself available this afternoon. We know that uh, you're, you're very busy with a number of commitments. You've had to carve out some time for us and we much appreciate it. Um, the first thing uh, we'll need to do is just get the formality of uh, having you either sworn or affirmed in uh, to give your evidence. And then once that's done, we can move on to the questioning of yourselves. Um, we'll start, if we could please, with, uh, with uh, Ms Bennett. Um, if you could please, uh, for the record, uh, uh, state your full name, your position title, uh, and swear either the oath or the affirmation, uh, whichever you prefer, the words of which should be before you. Um, if they're not there, just let us know and we'll provide them. So thank you, Ms Bennett. Thanks, Mr Donnelly. Margaret Louise Bennett, Chief Executive of Southern New South Wales, LHD. Um, I swear that the evidence, evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you very much, uh, Ms Bennett. Uh, Dr Mullins. Uh, good afternoon. My name's Elizabeth Mary Mullins. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by thee shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you very much. Now, what we'll do is uh, we'll move over to the, uh, the offering, uh, which I'm sure you'll take up, of, a, of an opening statement um, to get things underway. And then once that's complete, we'll move into the questioning. So um, I gather, uh, Ms Bennett, you, you'll do the opening statement? Thanks, Mr Darling. Thank you. So, Dr Mullins, our Executive Director of Medical Services, and I are pleased to provide this opening statement, which will take just under five minutes. Thank you. I'd like to start... Thank you. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land encompassed by the Southern New South Wales LHD, the Gundagara, Ngunnawal, Nambri, <coughs> Narigo, and Indigenous people. The Southern LHD serves a population of approximately 220,000 people across the southern <coughs> 45,000 square kilometres. Southern has a high proportion of elderly people, particularly along the coastal area. Aboriginal people account for 4.2% of our population and are a younger and growing demographic, with 45% of this community living on the south coast. We also welcome and care for many of the 5 million tourists that visit our region each year. The district covers seven LGAs and operates across 20 main service sites. We have eight acute hospitals, three MPSs, five community health services, along with mental health, alcohol and other drug service sites and integrated care services. Southern does not have a tertiary referral hospital. However, a well-established, long-standing referral partnership is in place with the Canberra Hospital, which fulfills the dominant tertiary referral service for Southern. Southern's budget for this financial year is $489 million, a 4 to 6 per cent growth in funding has occurred over the last three years, and this has enabled much renewal to take place. This renewal is happening despite the significant trials of the last three years, with drought, devastating bushfires, floods, and ongoing The bushfires in particular saw a dedicated and invested focus on the provision of bushfire recovery, mental health and wellbeing support. The challenge of COVID has seen the acceleration and establishment of the virtual care service. We are now expanding this capacity to augment service delivery in a range of settings. We are focused on increasing clinical capacity and capability. This has been enabled in part by Southern's substantial capital works program. Late last year, we opened the new $165 million clinical services building and established a new level four ICU service at Goulburn Base. Current works also include new emergency departments at Cooma and Cookwell hospitals. 
and the new simulation centre um, will open mid this year at South East Regional Vega. The new $260 million Yoruba Della Regional Hospital is at schematic design stage. Importantly, the new hospital will be a pilot site for the culturally sensitive connecting with country design that will enable birthing of babies on country. We've just opened a new close observation unit at Maruya Hospital. This is a very key step in increasing care capability for intensive care unit type patients. Um, as we expand our services and workforce in readiness for our newest regional hospital, which will open as a level four service in three years time. Funding has also just been announced for a new purpose-built $20 million Health One facility at Batemans Bay. The development of our clinical leadership and services has been, has been supported by the appointment of 14 district medical leads over the last 18 months. The district-wide leadership provided by the specialist doctor leaders is enhancing clinical service delivery and supporting workforce development. The recruitment and retention of rural generalist GPs in the community and medical and nursing staff for our hospitals is a significant issue for Southern as it is across rural Australia. <coughs> we are actively seeking permanent appointments to areas of traditional medical local usage. We've made a number of new appointments, including a director of ED and a director of ICU at Goulburn, and we'll soon announce the appointment of two specialist obstetricians and gynaecologists to be based at Maruya. We are currently in the process of welcoming 80 new nursing graduates, an increase of 22 on the previous year. Southern employs 2,398 full-time equivalent staff equating to a headcount of 2,966 people at November 21 figures. Our people are dedicated and committed, and I take this opportunity to recognise with gratitude and with pride the work they do every day. And I particularly recognise the toll the last three years has taken on so many. As someone who has worked extensively, initially as a clinician and subsequently as an executive in remote, rural and regional communities in three states for four decades, it's been an extraordinary privilege to be the chief executive of this district for the last 23 months. I welcome this inquiry and the opportunity it presents. I'm hopeful the inquiry delivers recommendations that are meaningful and achievable and can support continued positive change in Southern and indeed throughout our rural and regional New South Wales. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Ms Bennett. We appreciate that. And that adds, of course, to the government's uh, omnibus submission, which is uh, submission um, 630 to the inquiry. Now, what, um, just for the remaining time that we have, um, what I was, pro I was proposing, we're going actually to, to, to the clock. So I was, I was proposing, um, if we do 15, 15, 15, that's half an hour, and then... 45 we, minutes. Uh, so, sorry, 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 yes. Um, well, let, let's do 15, 15, yeah. 15, and split the, the last bit. How does that? Is that people OK with that? Yeah, because it gives you a good run. So if that's OK, we'll do 15, 15, 15. Um, I know that's close to what you've got, and then we'll split the difference. So uh, thank you. We'll move now to the uh, Honourable Sir Cord. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Walt Secord and I represent the Labor Party. Um, you're a Bedella Hospital. Now, it's the biggest and most pressing issue in the community. It's been a long running matter, a matter of utmost importance. Can you tell me what is, what services are available at a level three hospital and what services are available at a level four hospital. There is much community concern about the uncertainty in this area. Thanks for your question, Mr. Cord. Look, the, I'll give just a quick starting point around what will be happening with the opening of <coughs> level four and three time and what we're doing now to get to that stage. So the new regional hospital um, at schematic design, as I said before at the moment, uh, 260 million. Notably, the enhancements in that new hospital that don't exist at the moment in the combined Maruya and Batemans Bay hospitals include there will be an eight-bed ICU, currently doesn't exist. There will be six-bed paediatric unit, 
currently there is no paediatric unit. There will be an MRI. Currently that is not the case. There will be four mental health beds. Currently not the case. Um, there will be a 17 place treatment space in the emergency department plus consult rooms. And currently in the two hospitals combined, there's eight treatment spaces and two resource rooms. The bed state list is supportable go um, to something between 137 and 147 beds. Um, and currently um, there are 80 beds um, available between the two hospitals. So um, that just gives, it gives, it gives a sense of the enormity of the change and what the $260 million will enable. Um, the other thing that, that's um, really important to note is what we're doing now. So I mentioned before in my address that we've just opened a new observation unit at Maruya and established increased staffing to support that. And that is a key first step along the way of um, being, being ready and able and having the processes and the staffing ready to go for a, a level four ICU at the new hospital. Importantly, what does that mean? Well, that means that there needs to be um, an intensive care. It's a level of, of, of care that means that you can safely care for ventilated patients, patients on life support, um, and that you've got an intensive care specialist and intensive care trained nurses available. Obviously, you've got the Mullins Hospital. Anything more today? Um, may, may I stop you there? Um... Ms. Bennett, so you were very careful. You said a level four ICU. So are we talking about a fully level four hospital or are we talking about just parts of it being level four? Now the minister and the government have been very clear. They say it's a level four hospital, but the community is wise to you. They see that you are using weasel words and saying things like level four ICU. Will the entire hospital be level four or just parts of it, level four? No, thank you for that, of giving me the chance to clarify that further. I focused on ICU because it's been a particular area of, of focus for the community. Um, the minister has been very clear in his announcement that the new regional hospital will open with level four services on day one. So that means ED, maternity, um, and, I, and ICU. But, but, uh, but Ms. Bennett, I have correspondence here from the Minister to the Department saying that some of the services, this is dated December 22, says Sorry, some December, of the, December, December 22, 2021, Thank says you. that some of the clinical services will remain at level three. That is in complete contradiction to what you've just told us here. So you understand why the community is concerned. There's also so how can you claim today that all services will be level four, but I have correspondence here from the minister, which I will table, which signed by the minister saying that it will only have some of the clinical services will remain at level three. Can, can What's just, the difference between those two statements? Can I just um, ask that you um, just perhaps read that paragraph to the, um, to the witness just so that yeah, she's I'll, able I'll to um, yeah, I'll read it slowly. context? Okay, this is December 22, 2021, signed by the Minister Brad Hazard to the New South Wales Parliament, to the Clerk of the Legislative Assembly. Quote, at the time of completion of the new Eurobedella Regional Hospital, some of the clinical services will remain at level three. How do you reconcile your claim that everything will be level four when the Minister has written to this very Parliament saying that it'll be level three? Are we able to send a copy to her just so she's... And to assist, if you need to send it. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And I have also questions about the land acquisition. If you could do this, please. If you could. Yes, certainly. So uh, what I can say is that it will give great comfort, I think, to the community and the staff, is that the minister in a recent visit has made it very clear uh, that uh, his direction is that the new regional hospital will open with level four services uh, when, it, when it opens in three years' time. The, um, the matter with regard to the land acquisition, um, I'm happy to say uh, the soft collection um, has been completed. An announcement of the preferred site was made, in fact, on the 7th of December 2020. Health infrastructure. So, so, sorry, sorry, Ms. Bennett. Ms. Bennett, can you start again? You're going too fast for me. And, this, and the sound is a bit patchy. Can you give me the timeline again, please? 
So site uh, selection has been completed and an announcement of the preferred site was made on the 7th of December 2020. Health infrastructure is currently finalising the SAR agreement with the landowner. Okay, can I take you to that? So the site has been selected. The site has been selected. Has the site been purchased? So I can only, only repeat that health infrastructure is currently finalising the sale agreement with the landowner. But the government is claiming that the site has been purchased. And last night, Another contradiction, the Liberal candidate for Bega last night at a town hall meeting at Tourist Head, sponsored by the Progress Association in their, in their candidates forum, quote, some of, so the negotiations on the land purchase are underway. The site has been developed, identified and agreed, and those are expected to be finalized by about April. So what is the, the status? What is happening with this project? What is the truth? Is it going to be level three? Is it going to be level four? Has the land been purchased? Has the land not been purchased? Will this in fact actually occur? Thanks, Mr. Sikord. Um, with regard to any further questions you'd like answered with regard to the acquisition, I would take that on notice and direct that to health infrastructure. But um, well, that I reiterate that the site has been selected and that health infrastructure is currently finalising the sale uh, the sale agreement, um, and and that the minister has been very clear um, in his direction with regard to the level four service. Have you provided advice to the minister? When did the government decide that it would become level three became level four? When did the government decide to do that? So the, the minister made the announcement with regard to the level four service on his recent visit, uh, which was focused on the announcement of a $20 million development of a health one facility for Batemans Bay. Um, and the broader conversation about the strengthening of health service delivery across the Yoruba Della as part of the coastal network. How much advice, did you provide any advice in the, involving the decision to go from level three to level four? You are the CEO of the local health district. Did you provide advice on changing it from level three to level four? Um, I have provided regular briefings through to the Ministry with regard to the what would be required with regard to the progressive evolution of service delivery in the Yoruba Della and the significant changes in moving from the two smaller district hospitals uh, to a more sophisticated hospital in three years. Of course, this is got guided by the clinical services plan that was developed some time ago with a lot of input from staff um, community and, of course, the ministry. Now, the clinical services plan, you raised that. I understand there's much consternation amongst the medical staff and medical people who work for the local health district about lack of access to the clinical services plan and input into that plan. Can you respond? Um, so, oh, thank you. Um, so um, the clinic, I, first of all, I think the input of the clinicians and medical staff more broadly into service development in Europe at Della, um, it, it's, it's very strong and very focused and that's greatly appreciated and will be very necessary, um, particularly in the next three years with the amount of work and service development and um, staff recruitment um, and capacity building that we need to do to be ready for this new regional hospital. Um, and so we appreciate um, the, uh, all of um, all of that input, and um, uh, the I think the amount of clinical engagement and the passion shown is something that we're actually uh, very very proud of. Obviously, um, you move from a clinical services plan now into more detailed planning in terms of the workforce steps uh, and the configuration of services that will be going into the new facility. So the clinical service plan in and of itself is, is one document and it's a, it's a core initial document, 
but there's so much more, as, as the committee would be aware, that needs to go into uh, the develop the detailed development of, of services, and particularly now the announcement of the Health One facility at, at uh, Batemans Bay. Okay, but I'm but Ms. Community. Bennett, I'm concentrating on the Euro the the confusion and the sleight of hand that's occurring from the government here. Right, now, I level think three- I'm to take a point of order on that. Level that three- Categorization, Chair, because I, I, uh, I think there's been a number of yep. times that uh, the Honourable Watts Court has used uh, descriptions which are probably not accurate and uh, unhelpful to the committee's work. Okay, okay uh, I think that- Okay, the question, I, I, let the question continue. I okay. think you understand your point. Yep. Okay, I'm mindful of my time in the point of order. Can you give a guarantee that we will not see a repeat of the Dice function that occurred at Bega Southeast Regional Hospital, where you had a brand new hospital where the weights in the emergency department and weights for elective surgery were longer in the new facility than the old facility. Will you give a commitment today that we will not see a repeat of the crippling fiasco that occurred at the very beginning of the opening of Bega Hospital? I can give an absolute commitment. I am very clear that the capacity and capability of the New York Gala Regional Hospital will provide service access and service throughput that is very significantly different to what is currently available on the York Gala. Are you confident that the community, that you will end the confusion in the community about level th that it'll be a level four, not just parts of it, level three, but entirely level four, and that you've secured the land and that you will purchase the land. There is confusion. Someone is saying the land has been secured. Others are saying the land has been purchased. And the candidate last night said that negotiations are underway. Can you understand why the community does not believe the government on Eurobadella Hospital? I think that the announcement that was made recently with regard to level four service uh, will give uh, great comfort to the community. Thank you. Now, when, why did, what were the steps that the government took to um, change it from level three to level four? What, were, what was the advice that you based that decision on? So at, at all stages in the conversation and planning with regard to the new Eurovidella Regional Hospital, there has been a focus on moving to level four service. Um, the Minister's more recent council <coughs> confirmed that that, that, um, that that development that was already underway uh, with regard to service development and workforce development will be expedited to ensure that it's not soon after the plan always was for that to be as soon as possible mm. after we open the new facility. But the Minister's direction makes it clear now that that work will have to be done and completed within the next three years and that the new Yuridala Regional Hospital will open at level four on day one. Ms. So Ms. 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 Bennett, one final, one final question. I'm mindful of my time. You keep using the phrase expanded to level four services. Why will you not give a simple ironclad commitment, no weasel words, no qualifications, level four hospital? Why are you refusing to give an assurance without qualification? No, Mr. Support, in my opening address, I referred to it as a level four, the level four regional hospital that will open in three years' time. So I'm very clear in that regard. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, the Deputy Chair, um, oh, Emma you. Hurst. Thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you both uh, for coming this afternoon. Um, Concerns have been raised during this inquiry that at the moment women in Yass Valley cannot deliver the babies at the local hospital. Um, they're having to travel to Queanbeyan, Goulburn or Canberra. Um, I'm, I'm sure you've probably heard some of those horror stories that have come forward during this inquiry about women having to deliver on the side of the road. What's been done to provide more maternity services uh, for the people in that specific area? Uh, thanks, uh, Ms. Hurst. So it is the case throughout of rural Australia and New South Wales, and certainly in this district, that birthing services are not available at every single hospital. 
Um, it is the case that Birkin, as you said, is not available um, at, um, at YAS. And, and as you've said, uh, those women have their birthing experience in Canberra or Queen Bean or, or Goulburn. The absolute focus then investment has been on the appointment of a full-time experienced midwife who provides um, antenatal support and postnatal support. Um, and this service has been very well received and we, we will continue to focus on, on that investment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, groups such as the New Yass Hospital and Maternity Working Group have been arguing uh, for the midwifery, midwifery continuality of care model to be implemented um, in the LHD, um, which is, you know, that continuity of care obviously is, um, leads to safer births and better experiences for women, um, and it's also actually more cost effective. Um, is that part of um, that focus that you have on more midwives, is that continuity of care model? So just clarifying, it says you're meaning in the district more broadly? Yes, correct. Yes, yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, so yes, look, I think at the moment I've mentioned the main focus in uh, service delivery in Southern is one of renewal. Most recently we've appointed a new nurse um, manager of maternity services across the district um, and also a new district medical lead of obstetrics and gynaecology. And the work that they will do now with the obstetricians, with the GP obstetricians and with the midwives will be to look more broadly at service delivery and how we're um, caring for mothers and babies across the district and what opportunities there might be um, to look at some additional or alternative models. So that's an exciting possibility and one that will be embraced by our midwives and our um, GP obstetricians and specialist obstetricians. So, um, so and, and that, that be, sorry. So part of that review will, will include consideration for continuity of the case with yes. the same midwives. Yes, that's a model I'm very familiar with myself as a former midwife, and certainly yes, that will be something that will be looked at. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in November 2021, uh, Dr. Holt, um, who is the only obstetrician in uh, your Badala Shire, um, gave evidence before this inquiry um, and said that he was resigning after 19 years. Um, he cited serious concerns with the state of maternity services in the LHD. Um, I understand he's finishing up in February 2022, so very, very soon. Um, has his position been filled? Uh, thanks very much. Um, first of all, I would I would note that Dr. Holland gave extraordinary service in 19 years, um, and we are all very grateful to him for that. So Dr. Holland fulfilled two roles. He was the district medical lead of obstetrics um, overall, um, and also, as you've said, an obstetrician specialist obstetrician in the Yerbadella. So the district medical lead for obstetrics has been appointed, and and that is now Dr. Andrew Wood. Um, and in terms then locally, we are in the process at the moment, um, we've finalised interviews uh, for two new obstetricians and gynaecologists to serve the Yerba So the answer to that question is yes. Um, and has Andrew Wood um, started that role? He's already in the role? Yes, so, sorry, I should have clarified that. Yes, Dr Wood is already in, in, in the role. Dr. Um, Bowen also spoke about the strain of how much he was required to be on call. He said it was 96 hours on call continuously for a routine work, um, and every one or two months being on call, so 264 hours continuously. Um, is it being done to and resolve this um, so that the new staff that are coming in aren't going to be put under the same level of pressure? Yeah, thank you, Mrs. I think that's such a relevant question. I think. Specialist doctors and GPs working in solo um, life in throughout New South, rural New South Wales, you know, the issue of wellbeing um, and workload is a key consideration. So I think one of the ways that we are trying to address the matter you raise is the appointment of not one but two obstetricians. Uh, that doesn't fix the problem in and of itself, but it does mean that you're not there as a solo specialist. Um, and um, I think that we need to look at um, other arrangements, including some rotation of some of our um, specialists in rural areas through to metropolitan um, environments so that they get, uh, that this is done in a more organised way and a, and a stronger partnership way. So there is the assurance of um, time <laughs> and collegial support.
Um, there was a report um, that actually led, well, Dr. Holland said, state, stated led to his resignation. Um, the resilience assessment um, of neuroprodialite maternity service. Is that document publicly available? Um, thanks, Ms. Hurst. There were 19 recommendations in that report. Um, it's a report that has been shared with the midwives and with the GP obstetricians um, uh, with, uh, in the in the Yerba Della. Um, is that is it a report that can be shared yeah, with the committee? Yeah. Um, yes, I'm sure we could we could make that happen. Thank you. Um, I understand the report found that maternity services in the region were not, not unsafe, I mean, quite not unsafe. Um, this directly conflicts with what Dr. Holland is saying. Um, as a long term um, sole obstetrician in the area, how, how do you reconcile these inconsistencies? It doesn't quite seem to make sense. Well, I think it's important to listen uh, very carefully to what the experience of staff on the ground um, is. I think it's, um, and, and I think some of the key points that Dr. Holland has raised, uh, particularly with regard to working as a solo obstetrician and, and with regard to the development of more specialist um, services on the coast and in the Yerba Della in particular, are very well made and certainly are a key focus for us as we develop uh, coastal service and move towards this new Level 4 regional hospital. Um, I, so so that, that, that's one point. And then equally so, the Resilience Review uh, looked overall and we were very pleased to have the external eyes of the CEC. We've engaged in the CEC and the ACI and other bodies regularly to come in and to have a fresh eyes, external expert look you. at a whole range of things we're doing as we try to take Southern forward. I think their recommendations are very helpful. It's obviously very reassuring that they see the service as being safe, but they were also very clear about a number of recommendations that we need to take on board, and indeed we are, to further strengthen uh, the provision of service delivery um, on the Yerba Della. And, and we will ask them to do similar reviews for us in other um, of our maternity places around the district. Thank, Thank you. you. That was the bell, uh, Deputy Chair. Uh, Kay Fairman. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to turn to some questions about Goulburn and the Face Hospital, if I can. And the staffing levels over the Christmas New Year break, was it true that the uh, maternity unit in particular was very understaffed over that period? Um, I'll take that, Ms. Family. Thank you. Um, it, it is the case that over Christmas, and in fact right through to today, uh, the absence of sufficient nurses and midwives across our district presents a challenge every day. It is the case that we are utilising um, a number, in fact, our average use of agency nurses at Fortnight is 34.8, um, and we are very challenged with regard to staffing a number of our locations, including Goulburn. Um, and obviously the holiday Christmas environment exhausted staff through to the, you know, given the ongoing additional pressure of COVID um, is, is a real issue for us every every day. So yes, yes, it is the case that um, that maternity service at, at Goulburn was um, uh, very stretched. We've also had periods recently where we've had to have the maternity service at Puma on bypass with those women coming through to Queanbeyan because of the we've had up to 108 staff and obviously some of the midwives who have been furloughed um, due to COVID. So um, yes, yes, not just Goulburn Challenge, but across the district more broadly. Okay, thank you for that comprehensive response. Did you have to, was it was the situation so bad that you had to call in paramedics to assist in the maternity unit? So one of our contingencies, obviously we have had to do as other LHDs have had to do a lot of uh, considered planning about workforce to get through the pandemic period. Um, ambulance um, are our um, you know, key partners in service delivery and and helpfully, they have a number of dual qualified staff who are nurses, um, so in some cases also midwives um, and paramedics. 
Um, so we have an arrangement um, with uh, ambulance that um, in times of, of absolute duress, and there's been a, a, a case recently also at YAS with the emergency department, where part of our broader contingency planning to maintain service delivery safely um, is to work with partner agencies, such as locum agencies, obviously, but also under the health umbrella with ambulance, if they have any available uh, dual qualified paramedic staff who are sufficiently experienced and willing to come and do some work with us, we see this as a very positive way of working in partnership to maintain service delivery. I'm aware it was yes. Is it yes hospital as well, where, where that was put in place on the break? Yes, it was critical that we maintain delivery um, at, at uh, yes, um, and we were able to do so with the fabulous cooperation of the ambulance service. So in other words, there, there weren't enough, and I, and I hear what you have said uh, throughout your um, evidence today, of the severe pressures facing your region in terms of nurses and midwives, so I, I am acknowledging that. But that, that sounds like there are a number of hospitals that simply weren't able to cope if the last resort, if you had to rely on um, paramedics over the Christmas New Year break, that was, that's almost an indication of your maternity units not being able to cope. Like, with that, you just did not have the qualified staff. You did not have the nurses and midwives at that point. I think under in periods of duress, like um, a, a, a COVID environment, where you've got, as I've said, we've had up to 108 staff furloughed. Um, so these are extraordinary times um, that uh, some special measures need to be considered. And working in partnership with the ambulance to have the occasional support, I think, yes, it was two shifts. Uh, to support the emergency department service with a highly skilled um, uh, critical care uh, paramedic who was available to come and work with us from Sydney was a, uh, a you know a really um, appropriate solution to to that um, escalated issue. But, but yes, I don't um, move away from the broader issue of um, of nursing recruitment and midwifery recruitment across the district. Um, although we've taken on these 80 new graduates, and that's that's fantastic, and we want to take on at least that many next year, um, it is the case that um, we are recruited to about 100 nursing positions in our district, and that includes um, midwifery staff. So yes, recruitment of nurses and midwives and critical care nurses is a major focus for our district. Thank you. I hope, yes, I've got time for another yeah. question. It's difficult to hear Proceed. the bell. Can I, can I, so in your planning for COVID, in your planning for a potential outbreak, did the LHD plan for this number of nursing staff and healthcare workers to be furloughed? <clears throat> and I'm asking that question because it seems as though because the outbreak we kind of let it rip, if you like, that the impact on healthcare workers was in some ways unforeseen, or did your LHD model the fact that you could have that many staff off at any given time? Um, thank you, Fairman. I think it'd be fair to say in the evolution of the pandemic over two years, um, and with the very tight coordination and planning at a state level and a SHEOC level, and, and how that has then um, encompass every LHD, that there has been an intense amount of planning and forecasting. It would be fair to say that at different stages of the pandemic, um, different areas of focus have been highlighted. So earlier in the pandemic, we were intensely focused on making sure that we are still significant numbers of nursing staff to be able to look after the expected high number of ventilators. Then at other stages of the pandemic, there's been an intense focus on do we have enough immunisers to be out running all these clinics and so forth. Um, and then, of course, um, Omicron has presented a different challenge again because the hospitalisation, as you'd be aware, um, has tracked, um, you know, at, 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 at you know, the best level that we, we could have imagined, really. Um, 
and, and at the optimistic level, um, but certainly the impact on staffing. Yes, this was planned for, um, but in an LHD, even with good planning, um, the, the very unpredictable nature of who is going to be a close contact and a positive next, and there's been a disproportionate impact at different times. And so, you know, the other day, if I could give the example of 108 staff off, um, 64 of those were over on the coast. So the, the planning has occurred, um, but it is fair to say that providing that level of redundancy when the whole state is pressured um, certainly presents an extraordinary challenge. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, where is the Honourable Westphane? Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Bennett and uh, Dr. Mullins, for making yourselves available today. Um, it's very, um, very pleasing, and um, it, it's wonderful to have your experience um, to be able to um, present the views of uh, your local health district. Um, and I think uh, I'm going to start. Uh, well, firstly, um, noting that obviously there is a um, uh, some events happening very shortly, which have probably overtaken some of the focus of this this inquiry, which is unfortunate. Um, but uh, Ms. Bennett, do you say that you've been, um, I guess, uh, involved in uh, the health administration uh, in that area for a while, and more broadly, your other experience around the state? So yes, as I said, um, I, I've, um, from a background as a nurse and a midwife and a critical care nurse, I've worked in three, in three states and, and for the last 28 years or so as a general manager or chief executive. And how long have you been in the, the, the region that you're in now, the southern region? 23 months, Mr. Fan. 23 months, thank you. Um, so in that time and, and before, um, I guess uh, turning back to say pre 2011, can you um, do you know perhaps how many level four services were available in the southern uh, New South Wales local health district? Pre 2011. Yes. Um, okay, so it, I would say probably none pre 2011 because. Uh, the ICU uh, service at the new Goulburn has, is only just a level four at this point. And um, of course, uh, South East Regional in its current uh, fabulous form would not have come online at that time. So there's been a significant amount of growth and development um, Bank in Southern over that time. Okay, so um, so we've got now, uh, say pre-2011, we had no level four services uh, in that um, local health district. Sorry, just to, I think the, the evidence was probably, I don't think you were sure, I just need to have that clarify whether or not it was a statement of fact. I thought you said probably didn't. So, I, 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 so it's my understanding is that there wasn't, and I just wanted to confirm that. So that's um, that's been, I guess, the evidence. But um, my understanding is that there were no level four services at all pre-2011. Uh, and then obviously since uh, 2011, uh, with the change of government to uh, the Nationals and Liberals, um, we've seen uh, level four services come to the southern region. Is that correct? So certainly level four services have been grown at Europe, at, at um, the South East Regional and at Goulburn um, in recent times, um, particularly uh, with the investment in, in both those new facilities. Okay. Um, now, just referencing uh, Mr. Saccord's um, questions earlier, he put to you uh, some written advice uh, that the minister had, uh, and I'm assuming, Mr. Saccord, it was a question, uh, answer to a question on notice or an, a written answer? Uh, no, it was to the massive community petition demanding an improvement into health services in Eurobadilla, and the minister so, was um, compelled thank to you respond. For the, thank you for the, the clarification, Mr. Saccord. Um, so, Mr. Saccord raised some. Um, uh, uh, evidence that um, it was uh, from, I believe, December 2021. Um, Ms Bennett, um, the minister has uh, since um, been able to uh, 
provide a, an update and I've got a, a, a press release from uh, the 21st of January 2022 which would uh, I guess supersede the um, uh, the previous advice um, and that is that uh, the new Eurobedale hospital will be a level four on the day of opening that is that correct that's correct okay so uh, any uh, attempt to create a fear campaign around um, what services may or may not be available is probably unhelpful and perhaps somewhat political. Would you, without, without, uh, no, no, I, I withdraw, I withdraw, Chair, so apologies. Um, uh, I, I think it's pretty, it's pretty clear, isn't it, that um, the only uh, people who have actually bought level four services to uh, the southern region is uh, the people that are in government now and uh, the only people that um, are, have committed to bringing level four services to the new Eurobedale hospital is the current government. Is that correct? Um, Mr Fang, I can only uh, repeat um, what the, the, the minister's announcement um, as you referenced. Mm. Thank you very much for that. Um, look, turning to other matters, because obviously, um, while the by-election is um, approaching, uh, we are talking about the provision of um, rural, regional and remote health care in New South Wales. Um, I guess for your area, um, have you had the um, uh, ability to, I guess, find some innovative ways of um, having dealt with the, the COVID pandemic? And um, given the challenges and, and perhaps some of the solutions that you've found, do you think there's been some learnings that you might be able to um, share with the committee so that we can um, better understand uh, what uh, the, the health districts are doing um, to counter the COVID pandemic and also some of the innovative ways with which they've um, found to uh, perhaps uh, resolve distance issues and um, resolve uh, some of the other challenges that it's proposed for the community. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr Fang. And this is certainly something that we're talking about in the district and indeed with the ministry and all the other rural chief executives because we all have, uh, despite the fact that we're all still battling to get through the pandemic at this stage, it's very clear that there are um, a number of silver linings. Um, there are a couple that I would point to in our district, most notably the establishment of virtual care. Um, this has enabled us uh, to manage the accelerated development of virtual care at the beginning of the pandemic um, and in partnership with Illawarra and, um, and with Coordinaire, the primary health provider. But this, this development has enabled us to look after very significant numbers of COVID patients in the community, um, even quite sick patients with 24-hour monitoring Without any doubt, this has enabled us to get through the pandemic as, as well as we have in terms of meeting the needs of our community. Um, and, and obviously, that now sets us up to be looking at how best could we use this capacity. Um, and the things we're looking at is, you know, how might we further develop virtual care now to, to better manage, monitor and support patients with chronic illness? How might we use virtual care to support the clinical governance and clinical support in isolated emergency departments where there might be a sole doctor or a sole nurse. Um, so, so yes, I think that's one key area. The other thing I would say that we're talking about, and we need to evaluate this carefully, but the, the necessity during um, of, of care um, during the significant challenge of the pandemic has brought us into closer and tighter care with a number of patients, a significant number of vulnerable patients in our community who often and previously have been disengaged from health service delivery. Um, and so the necessity of the pandemic um, has, has, has brought them into closer connection with us. Um, and we feel that there is an opportunity to build on this now, um, to actually um, go back to all of these vulnerable um, patients who haven't previously accessed traditional services and see what it is that they might want from us, building on the care that was provided during the pandemic. 
Uh, that, that's two things. I think the other thing that health services um, will find, um, and, and this it will take time to get through the exhaustion and everything that exists at the moment, but the extraordinary above and beyond commitment and the agility of our staff, I think, demonstrates, despite the current challenges, that there is extraordinary resilience amongst our people. Thank you. Thank you very much for those really valuable insights. And I think that um, you're right. The, um, the, the learnings that uh, we've had from the COVID pandemic uh, are such that we'll be able to use them not only uh, across your uh, local health district, but across the state. And I think that it's really important that this committee um, hears from uh, all those uh, local health districts uh, and we have that shared knowledge and experience about uh, the, the learnings and the uh, innovative ways with which we can tackle uh, problems like COVID uh, and actually use uh, technology and uh, other means to uh, overcome the, the, the problems that we have. Um, just right at the end there, you, you really touched on, I guess, the staff and, and how they've been um, resilient and uh, providing uh, exemplary service in, in what is obviously for everybody um, quite a, a difficult um, set of circumstances. Um, with regard to morale, um, how do you find um, the, the keeping of morale in, in your, um, in the local health district? And um, do you find that um, perhaps attacks that, that happen um, on the services, um, you know, perhaps politically motivated or the like, might actually affect the morale of staff who are actually just really doing their job? Um, so how do I find morale? I think that um, the last couple of years have demonstrated um, the over and above service and commitment to, to uh, of our staff to the community they serve and to their patients and, in fact, to one another. Um, and I would, however, say um, that in Southern, it is my experience, and I know other uh, rural chiefs share this with me and we discuss it regularly, that so many of our staff are incredibly exhausted. And so in Southern, that is compounded, not just the, the pandemic that we're talking about, but in our case here, the fires and the drought before that. So, so many of my staff have had pretty much three years of trauma. So that takes the toll, and that will take some time to recover from. But, but yes, um, my uh, my staff are no different to any any rural staff in the fact that uh, that it, they give so selflessly, and having the respect and support of the community is very central to their well-being. And so, it's really important that um, I guess the the community leaders um, are seen to be, um, not only seen to be, but certainly um, being uh, supportive and uh, uh, of the staff and not, not using them in order to perhaps um, send messages or um, campaign that, that would actually create more harm for them. Have you, uh, have you had any experience in, I just, in that, uh, that I occurring? And, um, do you have any uh, insights as to um, what effect that does have on the staff? I just just reiterate uh, that the, the importance of staff receiving certainly constructive feedback, if that is, is something that families and patients need to give, that's important and respected. Uh, but more broadly than that, it is, it is very central that the health staff who give the very best they can every day receive uh, the support and the respect of the community broadly, all aspects of that community. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I'm just checking how much time I've got left before. Um, I've got one minute. Thank one you. Minute. I've got so many more questions I could be asking, but um, I am limited by the time. Um, uh, I guess um, just in relation to um, the the staff themselves and the, the feedback, um, are you able to uh, receive from staff and also patients some of the uh, uh, in a feedback quality assurance loop 
understandings of what is working well during your COVID response, things that are perhaps uh, could be done better and and things that um that have i guess cropped up that, that were unexpected um because obviously that feedback loop is important for providing the service um moving forward yeah mr Spain, thank you so yes the answer um and that mechanism is um every day and it is both formal and informal so, for example, we have these pandemic operations meetings that involve the site manager directives of nursing and a very wide range of our staff. Um, and the purpose of those meetings, which at times have been every single day, seven days a week, and at other times when things are a little bit more settled, they're three times a week, but they are ongoing. Um, and that provides an opportunity, so a real structure to it, but everyone's got a voice and it can say what's going well, what are we worried about, what are our pressure points, looking ahead to the next few days, where are we going to need stuff, what's our immunisation rate, what additional clinics are we opening up, where are our bed pressures, <coughs> etc. Um, so the answer to your question is most definitely yes. And in point of actual fact, without such a strong structure, mm. both at an informal and a formal level throughout the district, we would not have been able to cope as well as we can in meeting the care of the community during this extraordinarily difficult time. Thank you. Uh, Thank Ms. you, Mrs. Uh, Bennett. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Bennett. We've got about four and a half, five minutes each, so it's going to be a quick round of one question each from okay. each of the groups at the uh, table. So, don't roll it, second. Um, Mrs. Bennett, I want to take you to the clinical services plan, March 20, by your local health district. Page nine says that 165 beds are needed at your Abadella Hospital, but. In your answer to my very first question, you said that there'll be 137 to 147. That's a cut. So how can you continue to make the claim that it's going to be a level four hospital when it's actually going to have fewer beds than the clinical services plan proposed by your very health district has fewer beds? So thank you for your question. Um, so the 137 to 147, bearing in mind that it's a schematic design, is inpatient beds, um, and, and I'd be happy to provide additional detail to the community of the planning that we're undertaking. Um, in, in addition to that, of course. Oh, no, no, no. Um, well, 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 Ms. Bennett, Ms. Bennett, oh, just, just Ms. Bennett, I, I, I want to con concentrate. Ms. Bennett needs the opportunity. I want to concentrate on the beds issue. You said in hospital beds. So are you counting beds? people in their homes as beds. You said very specifically in hospital beds. What do you mean by that? So I'll start my response by saying this is um, something you might like more detail from separately to this one minute conversation. But the work underway indicates somewhere between 137 and 147 ward beds, medical ward, surgical ward, etc. Additionally to that, spaces in the hospital for treating patients include, um, for example, the 17 beds um, in the emergency department and other treatment spaces in, in the hospital. Um, so I'd be happy to provide that additional detail. Okay, I would like that on notice then. Thank you very much. Yeah, one no, one no, no, I do have to, we, we've got literally three minutes. So um, uh, thank you, the Honourable Emma Hurst is um, forfeiting her time to Kate Fem and Kate. Do you have a question? Thank you, Chair. Uh, just one quick question, Ms Bennett. We have heard of many nurses in tears, many nurses threatening to resign, some on the, the, the brink of, of leaving a profession that they care so passionately about. What is the LHD doing right now to retain those nurses who are on the brink of walking away? I think that's an incredibly relevant question and certainly a key focus for us all on the executive so some of the things we need to do, we, we actually need to give these nurses hope that things are going to improve. So we need to be re very realistic about the current environment and recognise what they're saying to us and not gloss over that. So they are exhausted. Many of the uh, casual and part-time staff, and in fact the full-time staff, have been working incredibly hard, much harder uh, than, they would, than they should or that they, they would want to. I think that there will be some sense from the nursing staff that 
even the, the, the broader symbolism of 80 new grads joining us and settling in, the, the additional nursing education that's going into supporting them, I think that's helpful. Another thing that is helpful um, is the fact that we've now got fully appointed site manager directors of nursing in every one of our sites. So having a very experienced, stable, steady, visible team of nursing leaders is a key thing in giving the nursing staff a sense that there is appropriate leadership, people are listening to them, and we're going to do whatever we can um, to get out of the incredibly difficult environment we're in at the moment. But recruitment is the key. Um, something the staff are heartened by, particularly in some of our areas, is the recent announcement of $15 million to support um, staff accommodation. So in some of our towns, it is the addressing of practical things like that that will make a key difference to recruitment. Thank you. The Honourable Worth Thank you. Oh, thank you, Chair. And I've just um, noticed that it already has, it's already gone two o'clock. So um, I was going to ask uh, Ms Bennett if you could um, just address that misinformation about the clinical services plan, but noting that you've decided to take the question on notice and you'll address that misinformation that uh, was just presented, um, I'll, I'll cede my time and, uh, Chair, we can um, finish on time. Yes, uh, we will. So um, that brings us to... Um, the time to conclude. Uh, in fact, we've just gone over. I'm sure we could uh, easily um, spend another half an hour plus, but uh, uh, we've had our opportunity to um, uh, speak to you both and uh, it's been very helpful to have some specific information from your neck of the woods, which, which adds into the government's uh, submission to the inquiry. So that specific information is most helpful. So on behalf of the committee, can uh, I thank you both very much for carving some time out of your day. We know you're very busy. Uh, and also on behalf of the committee, thank you very much for the most important work you have done and continue to do for the, the citizens uh, of your part of New South Wales. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we move now immediately to the next uh, group of witnesses. Now, um, uh, good afternoon, Ms Means. It's Vanessa from the Secretariat. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Can you hear us? We can. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, Ms Larkin. Can you hear me? Can. Fantastic. We'll be proceeding soon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Hi, Rita. Hey. How are you, dear friend? Good. How are you? Okay, well, we'll uh, get our um, session underway, uh, the last one uh, for the day. And can I thank you all, first of all, uh, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we know that you're all very busy in your respective roles um, and you've had to carve out some time for us this afternoon, uh, about an hour and a half. So we're very appreciative of that. My name is Greg Donnelly and I'm the chair of the committee and the inquiry. Um, we'll need to get through the formality first of having individuals uh, uh, sworn or affirmed to provide their evidence before we then move on to an opening statement or statements perhaps uh, and the questioning from committee members. So um, I've just got a, a list here of uh, the four of you who are in front of me. So I'll just run down this list and use this as my order for the purposes of the swearing or affirmation. Um, and in each instance that we need for you please to indicates your, your name, your, your title, uh, um, and um, swear either an oath or affirmation, whichever you prefer, the words of which should have been provided, and if for some reason they haven't turned up, raise your hand and uh, we'll make sure you've got them. So we'll go through um, and uh, we'll start with uh, Ms Maines. Thank you. Um, I'm Margo Kathleen Maines, Chief Executive of the Warwick Shop Haven Local Health District. Solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank Thanks you. a lot, Ms Maines. Um, uh, Ms Martin. Uh, I'm Margo Kathleen Martin, Executive Director of Clinical Operations for the Warwick Shop Haven Local Health District. 
solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now to, about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. And uh, Ms uh, Langston. I, Caroline Lewis Langston, Executive Director, Integrated Care, Mental Health Planning, Information and Performance at the Illawarra Shoalhaven Mental Health District, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Uh, thank you very much. And we'll now move to uh, Ms Larkin. Thank you, Chair. My name is Amanda Larkin. I'm the Chief Executive of South Western Sydney Local Health District, and I'll give the oath. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you, Ms Larkin. So with that uh, done, we'll move on to opening statements, and um, uh, uh, there'll, be, there'll be two, uh, one for the uh, Illawarra and Shellhaven LHD. And I presume, um, Ms Maines, you'll present that? Let me say thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you for the opportunity for us to participate in this hearing today. I'm proud to live in amongst the oldest living culture in Australia, the culture of Aboriginal people who have survived this country for over 65 years, thousand years. It is always an honour to pay my respect and to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands of which we meet today. I'd also like to acknowledge all elders both past and present and all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait people joining us today. I feel incredibly privileged to work in the Illawarra Shoalhaven with over about 7,500 colleagues who are dedicated to the health and well-being of our communities. We live and we work here because we love the lifestyle, the people and the landscape that envelops us between the mountains and the sea. We care for a growing and ageing population of over 400,000 people spread across four local government areas of Wollongong, Kayama, Shell Harbour and Shellhaven. The district extends around 250 kilometres from Collinsburg in the north to the North Forest in the south. In that area, we operate a network of eight hospitals and we provide community health centres services in 58 locations across our district. The Illawarra Shoalhaven region is the traditional home of the Dharawal and the UN nations. The Aboriginal communities represent around 3.4% of our population. People who were born overseas are about 18.4% of our population with also a growing number of refugees in our region. In our district, people aged over 65 years are our fastest growing age group. We recognise that we cannot advance the health and wellbeing in our communities in isolation. We are truly grateful for the many partnerships we have, including the Primary Health Network, residential and aged care facilities, disability accommodation providers, and our Aboriginal health partners, to name a few. The importance and the effectiveness of these relationships has been demonstrated throughout our joint COVID management. Aboriginal people have an inherent right to access equitable health services that are culturally safe and are welcoming. And it is our duty and responsibility as LHDs to ensure that we make a positive impact. Our health services have progressed for and moving towards creating more safe and more welcoming environments for Aboriginal people to access care and support. But we know there is so, so much more to be done. The Shoalhaven Cancer Care Centre is a comprehensive care centre uh, with full-time medical oncology and radiation oncology services for our Shoalhaven residents. Our long-time partnership with Lamunda has meant that we were able to engage Aboriginal health workers in clinical placements at this centre, which has paved the way for further opportunities to provide targeted care for Aboriginal people. Currently, we are also working on cancer clinical trials towards partnerships with Canberra Health Services, Murrumbidgee LHD and Southern New South Wales LHD, on the regional, rural and remote program grant 
to enable us to grant access to clinical trials to these proteins and all special needs. We recognise that as a district that we cover an extensive range of coastlines and communities, but healthcare is not one size that fits all. We cannot provide every service in every location. We need to plan as we do and to network our services accordingly, ensuring that decisions about services are based on quality and safety assessments and standards. The last few years have also been an important reminder that we respond not only to our ongoing needs of our population, but that we must also be ready to act in the event of a disaster or pandemic. From adversity, some of the most amazing things grow, and one of the standouts for us, and there were many in the LHD, was the commencement of the C program, which was created to support our staff at Milton Aladama Hospital to help them deal with the devastating bushfires that tore through their community in 2020. It encompasses the staff lead initiatives that promote healing, wellness, belonging, and connection. And it is part of our overall LHD workforce wellbeing approach that continues and grows. Since 2020, we've also sustained a significant focus on mental health services following the bushfires. And we've been really fortunate to be the gain positions that will enable us to better support the community in disaster recovery, rural counselling, a suicide prevention outreach team, and a mental health ambulance police project, to name a few. We've also, over the last number of years, been planning for the development of the Shoalhaven Precinct to provide new and extended services in the next four years. It will see more emergency and elective surgery at Shoalhaven, a cardiology rural intervention service, an MRI, a new paediatric assessment centre, theatres, philosophy, um, will a significant increase, and we will have a dedicated palliative care ward with increased numbers, so that we are now more able to actually care for more people in our local district. We also, at the same time, are planning for significant developments at Shell Harbour. In November 2020, we had the privilege of opening Aladala Health Fund, which provides many community services, including dental, drug and alcohol, community mental health, community nursing, and child and family to the Milton Aladala community. The aim is to reduce the burden of chronic disease and to ensure we provide as many services as close to home as we can. With these expansions to services come to be challenges of attracting and maintaining a workforce, particularly in a rural setting. At times, these challenges can shape the services the district provides. We've been working on sustainable strategies that mitigate risk and provide certainty. We've been able to actually increase the orthopaedic surgeons from two to four at Shoalhaven, allowing a 24 7 on call service. We've been able to increase the presence of medical oncology at our Shoalhaven Cancer Centre. And we've worked closely with our PHN to deliver a collaborative model for the management of COVID patients by referring pathways from the ED to GP respiratory clinics. We've also evolved to provide many solutions for patient care virtually, like our telestroke service at Shoalhaven. An innovative service that provides 24 access to life-saving stroke diagnosis and treatment and thrombolysis, connecting patients and local doctors and specialist health physicians via video. And our telestroke service now has the fastest store to leave time of the telestroke service in New South Wales. Finally, I would like to recognise the many brilliant people we get to work with every day. Our dedicated volunteers, our carers, our health partners, our community and business partners that have enabled us by working together to deliver far more effective services. We cannot achieve excellence without partnering with those that experience this journey with us. And my thanks and incredible heartfelt gratitude to all of our staff who are the backbone of our organisation. Their dedication and their tenacity makes me incredibly proud to be a part of the team. As Chief Executive, I welcome this inquiry and the opportunity it represents to us to reflect on others' views experiences, to learn and to share information. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms Baines, for that uh, detailed opening statement. Uh, Ms Larkin. Uh, thank you, Chair. 
Um, if I could just make uh, a brief opening statement uh, from uh, from my perspective. Uh, Southwestern Sydney is a, a large and a complex mix of both metropolitan but also uh, rural health services. We service a population of approximately 1.1 million people uh, and we, are, we extend from Liverpool, Bankstown, Fairfield uh, in the north to uh, Barrel, really down to Maroola, to the trucking station um, on the Hume Highway. Um, and then out to uh, close to Warragamba Dam, and then out to uh, the Warra uh, in the uh, in the east. Um, as part of uh, that, uh, as part of the district, there are six uh, hospitals. Liverpool is the tertiary hospital for the district, um, and Barrow Hospital, which is in that rural area, yeah. is part of uh, the network of services that we provide in the southwest. Um, there are over 14,000 staff who service uh, that, um, uh, that uh, the community, um, and the structure of the services is set up uh, with uh, general managers and operational uh, services um, at each of the sites, uh, together with clinical uh, directorates that cover the whole district and look at quality and safety and clinical practice uh, across the whole district. Um, and that network arrangement is essential in providing safe, high-quality care across the district, um, and places such as Barrel are inherently involved in those structures and service provision like the larger facilities. Uh, we have a comprehensive strategic and clinical services plan that clearly outlines and articulates service development um, over, the, um, over the next five years, and we're currently in the process of revising that strategic plan to take the organisation uh, into uh, the mid-2020s. I think the other important thing to understand is that the South Western Sydney has a very large uh, capital uh, investment program, um, over $3 billion, that includes significant redevelopment at Campbelltown, Barrel, um, Bankstown and Liverpool. And the investment in Barrel um, over the last couple of years has been um, significant. Uh, stage one is completed uh, with the new clinical services building, which saw um, a significant upgrade in the services, when I say services, the environment uh, that's available in Barrel, and there is a stage two program uh, that's in place to take uh, that uh, service forward. So we have seen significant investment in services and Barrel's ability to operate in its, current, um, in its current structure is very much linked to higher level services, both at Campbelltown um, and at Liverpool. So patients access that work for higher level services and then return uh, once um, they're in a, uh, in a safe condition. Over the uh, last uh, five years, there's been a significant investment in services um, across the district, uh, from, um, from dialysis to cancer, to a range of services, of which our, um, our rural um, our partners in Barrel um, have access to. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Now, before we uh, proceed to questions, can I just uh, invite everyone, when um, asking the question or responding to the question, providing the answer, just to identify who, who you are, mainly because we have uh, Hansard remotely taking down uh, what's being said but may not be actually seeing who you are. So to get our, our record uh, as accurate as possible, if you identify yourself when you ask the question and when you provide the answer, that'll make the best possible uh, record we can have of, uh, of the exchange. So if you could do that, that would be helpful. Uh, now we'll uh, do our questioning uh, and roll it through in 15 minute blocks, um, sharing it between uh, 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 opposition crossbench government. And we'll do that until we exhaust that uh, at the time of 3.35, which is the scheduled finish time. So. With that uh, brief uh, overview, I'll ask the Honourable Sick or to commence. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, my very first question is to the Chief Executive of the Illawarra Shellhaven Local Health District, Ms. Maines. Now, there was quite, quite a bit of excitement this morning um, with the announcement that elective surgery in some form was going to begin in New South Wales today. But it was probably frustrating and infuriating 
to read a statement from the Illawarra Shellhaven Local Health District welcoming the announcement but saying, and I quote, our hospital teams are now working through the development of a re-implementation plan taking into account local circumstances including the availability of staff, end quote. So, has elective surgery started in the Illawarra, and if it has, what's the capacity and what's occurring? If you could answer that, Ms. Main. Thank you for your question. So, currently, at this point in time, we are providing urgent and emergency, urgent elective surgery and emergency surgery, and we are providing day surgery. Um, as the statement I've put out and provided today is that we have been asked to look at recommencing, yep. depending on our individual circumstances and where we're at, surgery up to 75% um, as of the 7th of February. Um, the reality is that the team, in the light of that um, decision, uh, which we do welcome, as you said, are uh, actually currently also looking at our ability to do that based on demand and also our capability and staff availability. Uh, at the present time, we can have up to 150 staff furloughed each day due to COVID, having COVID or being in close contact. And we need to weigh up every day what services we can actually provide. Yeah. Um, today, for example, we get 100 staff. At the same time, um, every LHD is experiencing different impacts of COVID, yep. and it's most generally regional and rural areas um, are slow to see the impact in metro areas. So, for example, at the moment, we have increasing presentations of people with COVID. We are also having increasing presentations of patients who are having the impacts of COVID, past the positive, but we're also having increasing presentations of people with injury and other illness. So what the team are currently doing in response to the announcement today are looking at when it's feasible for us at all three sites to actually re-establish surgery, and we hope to be able to make a, a further announcement in the near future, but they'll need to take into effect all of those things. So, so Ms. Main, I, I want to dig into your answer a bit. So, did so elective surgery did not begin today in the Illawar? No, the elective surgery is to commence the announcement is that we will be looking to commence this from the 7th of February. And we would each um, make our own do that what was actually possible and moving forward. Okay, so so it didn't begin today, but you hope that you'll have you'll be back up to 75% on February the 7th. Now, no, no, I can't, I cannot, I say that, um, because we've got a lot of pressures and we'll be doing um, our best, but we actually need to look at what staff we've got available and also what the capacity of our hospitals at the present time are not of our wards are taking over as COVID wards and also our staff have been redirected to support the COVID wards in the ICU. So we need to look at what the capacity we've actually got to enable us to do that um, as of next Monday. And I'm not in a position yet to be able to answer that question. So, so Ms. Main, the Premier said that elective surgery would begin today. So that's a misleading of the community. Elective surgery in the Illawarra is not beginning today. He was on radio this morning saying that it would begin today, and he was in the print media saying that elective surgery would begin today. So in fact, that's not your experience on the ground. So basically, there's been a statement that um, private hospitals are currently looking at. We're looking to work with private hospitals to provide some of our elective surgery. Mm -hmm. um, and they're looking to move now at doing that. Um, I would need to go back and further clarify my statement. Okay, but I do have your I do have your statement, and you say it depends on quote the availability of staff. So you're very clear. You're being honest with the community. You're telling community that elective surgery cannot begin until we have the availability of staff. But the premier this morning was telling everyone that elective surgery was beginning today. So it, is that what the premier said? Because uh, my is understanding the, is it was from Monday the seventh of February. The order. That is what she said. Now, may I ask a question to Ms. Larkin? Ms. Larkin, to a similar inquiry into health services in Southwest Sydney, 
Southwest Sydney, I think it was in 2020, and was shared by the, my colleague, the Honourable Greg Donnelly, a very good committee, and there was evidence from your, uh, your local health district, Southwest Sydney, and it was reported in May 2020 that healthcare expenditure in southwestern Sydney is $800 per person less than other regions in New South Wales. Has that disparity been addressed since that report? Uh, thank you uh, for your question. Uh, so in relation to the funding for southwestern Sydney, uh, we are uh, received in the last um, budget cycle the highest growth rate for the state in relation to funding uh, for, uh, for the district and delivery of services. Um, and that has been a trend for uh, the district over at least the last five years. Um, and the distribution of that growth in expenditure is to ensure provision of services um, and increasing services across the district. Um, and that will continue in this current financial Okay. Now, you mentioned earlier in your opening statement about Bowral being linked to Cam Campbelltown, Liverpool. How does that actually work? Because this inquiry is an inquiry that emphasizes rural and regional outcomes. And I think the inquiry, I think my colleague Wes Fang would even agree that Bowral is a regional center. So how, how does the linking work with, <laughs> with um, Campbelltown and Liverpool? So uh, the district has a clinical services plan that looks at the relationship of all services across the district. Um, so Barrel is a, a district level three hospital. Um, so it provides for the for the um, for the Windsor Caribbean Shire yep. um, a broad range of district level services for that community: medical, surgical, uh, paediatric, maternity, um, and uh, and ICU. Um, and then as part of that plan, there is a very clear network arrangement. So uh, if patients require um, higher level services, uh, they are linked to either Campbelltown um, or uh, to, to, um, to Liverpool in terms of people transported to those services for the higher level or tertiary services that they may require uh, and then are transferred back. So depending on the condition of the patient, um, etc. They may step down from Liverpool back to Campbelltown, back to Barrel, but there is a good network of uh, arrangements, uh, very strong relationships between clinicians um, where they can get support and guidance if required, uh, but can transfer patients uh, to those high level services if required. Mm. Now, we We've taken evidence for an, uh, involving a number of smaller district hospitals, MPSs, in country areas, particularly rural and remote areas. Now, there are two hospitals that are of particular interest in your LHD, Bowral and Camden Hospital. Those two hospitals Sorry? in 2020 and 2021, did those two hospitals have a doctor on duty during their operation of that year at all times? Yes. Yes, they did. Okay, um, that would be a doctor. When you say on, when I say on duty, I mean a doctor, not on the telephone, not on the camera, but physically in the in the hospital. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, now I'd like to go back to um, Ms. Maines. Ms. Maines, um, Shellhaven Hospital has. Um, Depending on, on, on who's addressing the question, some people would say the worst performing emergency department in your LHD, and consistently it is on the one of the one, two, or three over the last 10 years emergency department under the most pressure outside of Sydney. Um, has What steps are you taking to improve waiting times at Shellhaven? Um, so there's a number of things that we um, are planning, uh, planning, are doing now to actually do that, and that is we've got to um, significantly increase our staff, for example, the number of patients and senior doctors that we employ. Um, we've just employed an, um, some uh, access and flow nurse managers to enable us to enhance access and flow from either the ED back to the community or the emergency department into places within the hospital. Um, so we've been looking at doing that. We also set up an ESA, 
um, which is a short stay unit to enable us to actually manage people there and then be able to discharge them um, back into the community after a short stay. Um, we're also, of course, doing a lot of planning together to enable us to grow the emergency department with the new Shoal Haven um, hospital that we are developing that will significantly increase the space um, and the capacity of the emergency department. May I ask a quick, a quick question about short stay units? Now it's been put by various committees and that and by the medical profession that short stay units are actually a way of gaming the system. You pull someone out of the emergency department and put them in a short stay unit and you take them off the books. The clock stops running, but in fact, they're not in a hospital. I mean, sorry, they're not in a hospital room with a bed. They're actually just outside the emergency department. So are you predicating that you're gonna cut emergency wait times by setting up short stay units to game the system? Uh, that is what we're teaching the short-stay unit. The short-stay unit here is to provide flow and to get the patients to the right place, um, to get the care they needed, and they have been shown to be very successful in patient management, and I'll just get my tickets to you and we'll see you. So that's smart advice, I'm responding to that question. Thank you. So this has been a comment on for what we do track is the number of patients that are admitted to the emergency short-stay unit that are being discharged home rather than individual hospital bed. I think in the past, short-stay units have been used as a holding place. Yep. Um, that is not um, the model that we've implemented um, at our hospitals, and we do track that. Thank you. Um, Ms. Maines, I'd like to ask a couple of questions about the smaller hospitals within your purview. David Berry, Milton Oladella, um, maybe Coaldale Hospital. Now, a similar question to what I asked Ms. L Ms. Larkin, being smaller hospitals in 2020 and 2021, did those hospitals have a doctor physically on duty throughout the year? So our hospitals, um, yes, at Lord North, Shalhaba, Shalhaba, Milton, Aladala, um, do have doctors um, at other hospitals that are in the same hospital that are not in the hospital. Although we do have some challenges with our staff in the PD at Milton. Um, at the current time, we don't have doctors, um, that we don't have doctors 24 7 that are on calls in our sub acute units at Coldale um, and at Fort Kenda, we have a doctor available on another site. When you, when you say um, challenges at Milton or Ladella, do you mean? that there are times, there were times in 2020 and 21 where there was not a doctor physically in the hospital, you, and I'm using your word, challenges. Oh, no, look, I think we've always worked to make sure we get a doctor in our hospital. Our particular challenge um, is that we don't have a doctor that relies for our emergency department on GP VLOs. Um, and of course, we are looking and working with the GP VLOs to actually find a sustainable model working with them to enable us to always have staff um, that are always available um, so that we're not looking to local agencies at short notice at the last point in time. Now what is happening? Oh, sorry, sorry ma'am. Sorry, I interrupted you. We have been able to staff um, at the present time, but the current utilisation at our emergency department um, at Milton Hospital is 60 percent of locals. Um, and working with GP VMOs. So we have got a series of groups meeting together with GP VMOs to actually find what the right option is to get a more sustainable workforce going forward. For example, we would also meet out and advertise for career medical offices. Um, and um, we're, we're, we're looking at a range of workforce initiatives. Okay, can I ask a question? Have you actually done a deep dive on why the Shell Haven Hospital appear repeatedly over the last 10 years since I've been watching health as I'm in the one, two, or three of the longest waits for in its emergency department. What is so unusual about that hospital that it consistently has one of the longest waits in emergency departments? And I'll add one last question. Why is it also consistently have some of the longest waits for elective surgery too? Um, so in terms, um, I think that what Shawhaven has been facing, as I've said before, is an increasing hospitalisations. I mean, I'm sorry, an increasing population growth. And of course, we have over 6.8 million tourists, I understand, that actually travel to the beautiful south 
um, each year um, because of people not to come and stay there. Um, that does present us with particular challenges, and we, have, and we do have action plans around that. But the number of presentations at Shulkaven ED is increasing year on year um, in terms of what is actually happening. So we are, what we're trying to do is to work over that period of time. We're working more crisis, more SMROs. We've appointed more nurse unit managers to actually manage access and flow. Um, as I said previously, put in a visa um, in order to look. We also do have, um, sometimes we face a number of patients that are waiting in our ED to access beds. Um, and we're working on that because there is... Um, the new Shoalhaven Hospital will have significantly more beds in it to actually enable us to better meet the needs of that population. Thank you. We're also looking at what we can do to actually manage people in the community in terms of the longer waits for elective surgery. I'll ask Martha Martin to respond. So we have had some shortages of um, experienced nursing staff and anaesthetists uh, for our operating theatres, and that's impacted our ability to run at 100 percent. We've successfully recruited into those positions um, and they will come on board by the end of February. So that's had an overall impact. The other area that's impacted Shoalhaven, like many other um, hospitals, has been the impact of COVID and the cancellations and the high number of um, category C patients that have ended up waiting. Um, we are working with our private hospital and now private to provide some of those services to complement what we can do at Shoalhaven. Thank you very much. Um, we now move our questioning to the crossbench, uh, commencing with the Deputy Chair, Honorary Emma Hurst. Emma. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll just uh, stick with uh, Ms Maines. Um, just in regards to women living in, in Melton and other Dulla regions and further south, um, we've had one of the submissions to this inquiry note that, um, that those women have no choice but to travel an hour or an hour and a half to have their baby delivered in the hospital, um, which obviously poses a higher risk um, of morbidity and mortality for both mother and child. Um, since the redevelopment of Shoalhaven, the hospital's obviously not going to resolve the travel time. Are there any other efforts being made to provide maternity services closer to these efforts, or at least to provide uh, these women access to a local midwife? Um, so thank you for your question. So um, basically, in relation to women travelling, we travel to Shoalhaven for Bourbon. Um, in relation to that, we did set up a new midwifery antenatal and postnatal bundle of care, which is called MATS. Um, we introduced that in April 2020. Um, and that's a dedicated service established at Northern Hospital that's made up of six midwives and two teams of three. And they focus on the possibility of care during pregnancy, antenatal care and postnatal care. Um, and we are in the future, though, we're also going to take this step further to develop the Shoalhaven Midwifery Group Practice, which will extend to Milton. And this is something we're focusing on for the future that will enable further continuity of services with hopefully the same group of midwives being able to follow the woman through Shelhaven and Thank you. Um, and my next question, I think, is for um, Ms. Langston, but please um, correct me if, if I'm wrong. But um, another fellow submissions expressed concerns that there's no inpatient detox centre in Shoalhaven. Um, are there any plans uh, for a detox centre in the future, either in the hospital um, or, or in the redevelopment or in other plans within the ALHD? Um, thank you, Christian. Um, yeah, the little um, program is possible to within the hospital. Currently, there's not a specific dedicated program, but our medical team are very skilled and experienced that, so there's quite a number of withdrawals that happen within the Shoalhaven Hospital. Um, there's also access and we support and fund um, Google House for our withdrawal, for our alcohol withdrawal services, plus there's home-based um, alcohol withdrawal services that are provided by the um, mental health team supported by the community um, medicine teams. There are plans um, within the Sh new Shell Harbour Hospital to establish a um, school service model on a very similar model that is being conducted at the Sydney. So we are planning for that in the new Shell Harbour Hospital. 
if somebody was going to go to an inpatient detox right now, how, how far would they have to go? And where would they go if they were living in the Shoalhaven area? That's a good question. So, could you please just repeat that question? Like, if someone was in the Shoalhaven area right now and they wanted to go to an inpatient detox centre, where, where would they go? How far would they have to travel to get into one? Uh, well, there's the London they can do an inpatient detox centre. We can um, provide a detox at the Shoalhaven Hospital. Um, in Orbas is an option. Um, but beyond that, it can be easy. So, sorry, so how far would they have to travel to get to an inpatient detox? So, they can, um, we can detox people quite successfully and do a lot of that at the Shoalhaven Hospital. So that's an option. The long house is in the um, Nara area. Um, if they're eligible for that program, um, community services, we can do a home, but inpatient program beyond the long house and Shoal and Hospital, you would have to travel to Sydney. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Larkin, I last year, um, there were further reports about the serious staffing problems at the Pool Hospital. Um, there was a story of an eight-year-old man who was, who was numb on one side and couldn't get an MRI for several days because there was no staff actually rostered to operate the machine. Um, has there been more staff hired at Liverpool Hospital in the last 12 months to actually address this issue? Uh, yes. Could I just take on notice, though, for the committee that percentage increase. I don't have that in front of me just because of the focus of this particular inquiry. But if you're comfortable, I will I will Fine. Yeah, thank you. If you could take that on notice, um, that'd be great. Um, in, in our inquiry into health services in South Western Sydney in, in 2020, staffing and recruitment and retention of staff, including junior doctors, uh, was raised as, as a general sort of ongoing issue. Um, uh, have there been any strategies put in place to actually recruit and, and retain staff uh, within the LHD? Uh, look, over the last year, could I say, uh, South Western Sydney, and I'm sure you're as aware as everyone, has been significantly uh, focused on managing COVID outbreak. We have been very much at the centre of that. Um, so in terms of the focus of our work overall, we've been managing you know, that issue and ensuring the safety and provision of services for our community over that time. We haven't, uh, we've worked with and talked with our JMOs and our junior staff around issues of, um, of recruitment, retention, et cetera. Uh, but I need to take on notice if we've put any of those strategies further in place over the last year, only because of the focus that we've had uh, on. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's fine, thank you. Um, how would you say that the hospitals in the LHD are coping at the moment with the current COVID-19 outbreak um, and the additional strain on the resources? I mean, it, it almost sounds like some of the other important issues of recruitment and retaining have had to take a back seat because of the COVID outbreak. Um, so, so, how, um, so how are the hospitals coping at the moment in the LHD? So um, if I can comment on it from the current wave and in the previous wave in, the, in 2021, I think um, the ability for the district in collaboration with our other colleagues, including very much Illawarra, our ability to service the community has been pretty phenomenal. Uh, we've, um, we've continued to provide services. We've redirected resources, redeployed staff, um, and reorganised um, our uh, very much our inpatient services to manage the needs, and I think they have done remarkably over that period of time. In this current phase, it's been a different challenge. ICU has been challenged, but our ward have very much been challenged in terms of the number of patients that we've had, um, and in terms of furloughed staff. If I could just share with you, uh, we've had over a thousand furloughed staff uh, in the last couple of weeks. So we have literally redeployed staff and focused on two main things, obviously maintaining care for our COVID patients, but also the critical service delivery um, in terms of you know, emergency care, all of that has been incredibly maintained because of uh, the statewide network, including the 
as I explained, but also how the district has worked in, it, in, its, in its networked model to ensure that services were moved, changed, uh, to maintain service delivery for the community. Has it been stretched without question, uh, but um, provision of services has absolutely been maintained in a framework of safety and quality uh, to the very best of our ability. Thank you, Ms. Larkin. Uh, oh, sorry, we'll need to. Sorry, Deputy Chair, but we'll be coming around again. So, uh, Kate Fairman. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to go, just follow that line of questioning, Ms. Larkin. Um, you said that, that services have been stretched. But are you? Are there enough nurses to maintain safe nursing staff levels within the southwestern Sydney LHD? You've just said several, a couple of thousand. I think you um, still of the healthcare work of nurses are, are furloughed. So are there safe staffing levels, safe nurse to patient, uh, you know, levels within the LHD at the moment? So what does stretch If I can just qualify, I've been, I'm so sorry. I thought you were no, talking. that's, that's, sorry. Continue. Yeah. Um, so the thousand furloughed staff are not only nurses. So if we could just be really clear that it is across the board. Um, so there has been a whole range of staff that have been impacted by COVID. I think that's the most important thing. Uh, the second thing, though, that in, when we're looking at our staffing levels, the ensuring the safety for staff and patients is obviously critical. And then in the last couple of weeks, as we've seen those numbers increase, we've actually redeployed staff into a whole range of different roles to support the nurses so that they could, in the, in the impacting areas, so that they could focus on uh, patient care delivery, uh, so runners, all of those kinds of things to minimise other things that the nurses need to do. We've put all of those things in place. So, um, and we've watched it carefully in terms of both at a site level and at a district level um, and talked regularly around the, those nursing levels um, and ensuring safety across the district. Yes. Thank you. Have, um, have changes been made? I'll ask you first, Ms Larkin, and then I'll um, go to the Elabora LHD on this as well. But have changes been made to the way like to discharge protocols to to um, free up beds sooner during this latest outbreak? Just in relation to the nature of your question, so in, are you asking if I could just qualify through your chair? Um, yes, please. That, um, have we changed the way that we discharge? I'm not quite sure of the, of, of the nature of your question. Just yeah, thank you. there's two elements. So have, first thing, have, have staff been asked to, to discharge patients sooner, I suppose, and therefore has there, there been any, um, any instruction to kind of, to discharge patients sooner? I'll, I'll start with that then. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. I just wanted to be sure of the nature of your question. Uh, absolutely not. Patients are discharged when they are safe and appropriate for discharge. What we are seeing, though, in the current phase of COVID is that people are coming in for uh, other, other health issues and then COVID's been identified. Um, and so what we've got to be careful is that we manage people uh, for, both, for both of those elements. Uh, and then when we discharge, that they've got supports in place, not only for the COVID component, but also for the broader health component. Uh, so, uh, no, there hasn't been changes. I, I think the focus on ensuring people are discharged when they're safe and appropriate is the most critical thing. OK, so I'm going to... Yes, yeah, Ms May. Uh, so, this is my name, Steve So, the biggest is that we've been to discharge patients. Patients need to be discharged appropriately to the condition. We have, however, transferred patients from the public hospital into private hospitals um, in order to enable us to manage the increased presentations that we've seen. And also because of our virtual enhanced community centre, where we actually can virtually monitor people um, in their own homes, we've been able to also manage um, high numbers like South West Sydney has, high numbers of patients in their own homes. Um, with tablets, monitoring equipment, follow-up, education and action plans. Um, we also have been working to ensure that we 
get assistance in nursing that and we've worked with nursing graduates to actually come back to work to start earlier. We've worked with training interns who became assistants in medicine um, to help us throughout this time. We also a number, quite a considerable number of allied health staff um, really working to actually support in the areas where we had um, staffing challenges and I'm very thankful there. And then also we put out, like South West we put out an EOI for administration staff to go and work in places that would support frontline staff to focus on service delivery and for us to give them the support that's required at the back end. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I might just stick with you, uh, Ms. Maines. Um, just in relation to, there was a, a story that the ABC covered a couple of weeks ago that said that, um, and this is in relation to Wollongong Hospital in particular, that it had reached capacity with its two dedicated coronavirus wards and had opened to additional wards. Where is the hospital at, at the moment with, with capacity? So I'll just ask Margaret Martin to give an update on that. So thank you for that question. Um, we currently are consolidating our uh, COVID wards because we've been fortunate to be in a position where we've had a number of patients cleared of COVID, even though they're still admitted. So at the moment, we have two dedicated uh, COVID wards at Wollongong. We opened a specific ward at Bulli, um for aged care patients who were confused and wandering and that is still functional at the moment. And we have the capacity to overflow, though we are consolidating our third COVID board at Wollongong. We also have COVID capacity at Shell Harbour Hospital and Shell Haven Hospital in, in dedicated boards at the moment. So by consolidating, what's, what, what do so you we had, Yeah, so we have three boards uh, open at Wollongong Hospital. So because we have a number of patients that are COVID cleared now, we are now creating some more non-COVID capacity because that's been um, a high pressure point for us at Wollongong. So by consolidating, we will have two dedicated COVID wards at Wollongong that we will have capacity to admit into. And because we can move those cleared patients into a normal ward, that gives us more capacity within those two wards to accept COVID positive patients. Okay, and how many patients are being treated under the hospital in the home program within the Illawarra LHD? Do you have those figures to hand? We do. The last Caroline needs some treatment. We have had some just Media call. Cool. We've got up to 1,000 people that we've been working with and we've worked with. Um, sort of trying to help manage them, but today, uh, yeah, that's uh, Caroline needs to check in. Um, if we're talking COVID patients, we look after those in the community program. So at the moment we have uh, today 1,650 odd, people, not, not people odd, but 1,650 um, legitimate uh, clients, most of whom are in the self-management stream. And we have approximately 150, 160 people who are high risk and managing more intensively. That alters on a daily basis depending on people coming in and out. So, hey. sorry, Chair, this is just what clarification yep. because I didn't quite hear that at the end. 150 people are what? Sorry, I didn't. Uh, sorry, high risk. So, get the high intensive management, the remainder, and it's almost 90% of the people in the program are on the self managed pathway. So they're able to look after themselves and call us if they need support. The intensive work is for those people with complex conditions, might be immunocompromised, um, chronic conditions that need um, certainly those under 75, those that haven't had booster shots, we are particularly concerned about and we monitor those more um, intensively. Thank you. Uh, we will be coming back again, Kate, uh, but we'll move on now to uh, the Honourable West Fagan. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thank you all for appearing this afternoon and sharing your valuable insights with the committee. On those valuable insights, um, Ms Main, um, I know the questioning from the Honourable Walt Sickord a little bit earlier about um, elective surgery and its return, and um, he was, I'll say, 
adamant uh, that the, the, the Premier had said that it would be returning today. Now, um, I've been fortunate enough to um, have access to the press release and the, the, um, the information. Um, are you able just to um, share with us uh, what uh, date the uh, elective surgery will be returning? This um, next Monday, the 75%. Oh, okay. She said 75%. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've got the questioning, uh, Mr. Scord, but I'm sure you'll, you'll have the opportunity to ask some, some more questions okay. some later. Um, uh, now, uh, Ms. Maines, um, while the, um, the elective surgery will be returning next Monday, um, there's still been surgery occurring, is that, is that correct? Um, can you provide the, the committee some insights as to what sorts of surgery um, have still been occurring within the New South Wales Health, um, uh, I'll say, uh, uh, areas um, across the state? Urgency. So, just with an item comment, thank you, and I'll also get to make some further comments. We talk about certainly we are providing all emergency surgery across all of us um, operating sites at Shelhaven and Willowbond. We are providing urgent elective surgery across Shelhaven and Willowbond, and we are also providing all day surgery as well, and particularly our focus at Shelhaven. Um, so, if you want to understand what's involved with that, um, just some examples on last night. Thank you. And I can respond to it. We have uh, been continuing, as uh, Margaret said, the urgent surgery. So, that's cancer surgery. Surgery that is classified that needs to be um, undertaken within 30 days. So, that work is still being occurring. And uh, many of our, um, what we classify as semi-urgent, um, category B, that needs to have surgery within 90 days. So the more urgent of those patients we still be operating on. And we have been working with our private hospitals to provide um, some of our um, other surgery as well. And day surgery of all classifications um, has been continuing during this um, period of time. Thank you very much for that. Um, Ms Larkin, is it a similar situation uh, in your local health district? Correct. Thank you. So, in reality, it, it's only been the elective uh, surgery with overnight stays that has been uh, postponed and is returning from next Monday. So, uh, Susan, that's what we're talking about, because I said we are looking at what we can actually start delivering as of this Sunday, depending on our demand and the that we've got Thank you very much for that clarification. I think it's important to put uh, those those issues into context as opposed to um, uh, a soundbite or a grab. But um, no, I was I was um, going to move on to some other um, other topics if that's okay. And um, <laughs> I've been looking to ask a lot of the um, local health districts um, about some of the lessons uh, that they've had um, with uh, combating the difficulties around the, the COVID pandemic and um, maybe some innovative uh, learnings that, that they've um, been able to uh, uh, garner from the solutions that they've uh, employed around um, the, the challenges that, that have been, uh, I guess, thrown up by the pandemic. Uh, and if there's an opportunity to um, maybe share some of those um, learnings with the committee uh, and things that you think are working well that may be able to be carried into uh, the future uh, of health provision in the state. And I'll start with um, Ms Maines, if that's possible, and then I'll go to uh, Ms Larkin. Uh, thank you for that question. And certainly, um, COVID is a time of, of reflection, and I think um, it's a pride that I've seen many of the developments that have actually occurred and the differences and the different ways of thinking of how we've actually provided services. And I think what it's also taught us, firstly, is the ability of people to pull together and to step up and provide many services. At a very short notice, if I talk about establishing mass vaccination clinics, 
by broadcasting our food in testing, booty testing clinics. We set up a virtual enhanced community care centre that enabled us to manage at least a thousand people per day in partnership. Uh, we, we upscaled our public health unit, who undertook considerable extensive of contact tracing and education and outbreak management. We set up COVID wards and now across three of our hospitals, four at one point at Wollongong. We actually set up the ability to upscale to four intensive care units. Um, we actually built up our emergency departments and set up particular zones. So you saw a number of significant building up of service delivery and changes in service delivery in an incredibly short period of time under post. We also set up, um, through this time, we built on the relationships that we had when we worked together, and I'll refer to South West Sydney, where we worked in partnership to actually support each other at times of considerable stress and patient flow. We set up and built upon a fantastic relationships with residential aged care facilities and disability support providers that has enabled us to be more effective in how we manage the challenges together. We worked with our Aboriginal <coughs> partners in terms of the nature of vaccination outpost clinics, in terms of outpost testing for COVID testing. We set up, as I said, also we brought in alternative staffing models. We had people respond to us from schools of medicine to bring in training in terms earlier. We worked with our nursing schools to bring in our nursing graduates earlier. We worked with our, our support and corporate staff for them to actually work and, and work together supporting our frontline staff. What it has really taught me is about the ability of a sector to respond and believe in these been huge challenges. And but it's been the passion of the people that work in this sector and other sectors every day and their tenacity and their commitment to actually respond so incredibly positively to the community demand. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Ms. Maines, and I love that word tenacity. I think it uh, goes to the heart of what uh, the uh, New South Wales Health staff have been doing. Uh, Ms. Larkin, uh, can you perhaps share some insights about the uh, agility that uh, your local health district has um, employed uh, to tackle the COVID pandemic? Look, thank you. So I think I said earlier in, in a statement that the impact of the COVID pandemic in the southwest. Um, has been significant and the workload uh, and demand that we needed to carry over this period um, has been more than significant. That's a really underselling of what we've been able to do. So I think um, in answer to the question, has the health services pivoted, changed, uh, become flexible both in its operational work, how it provides services, the staffing models that it's been applied, its relationships with the primary care environment, with the broader community, um, I think have changed fundamentally. And there will be a number of elements, because your question is what will go forward. Um, we've been able, I think, as a system and as a state to be able to demonstrate that we have responded to the pandemic and cared for the community through some of the most challenging times. And I think um, we need to really recognise the resilience of the system and its capacity to work together in order to provide uh, care to the community between rural, regional, metros, there would be to staff and service delivery. Uh, and we've done that um, at every point that we've been asked in terms of stepping up in that regard. There are a couple of things, though, many things have changed, but one of, I think, a couple of the things that we would take forward, other than the things that are very much talked about broadly, such as um, uh, virtual care arrangements, those things, which we've put in place. But I think one of the key ones that's been really critical for us is that we've had a good working relationship with our aged care facilities. Uh, but over the, over the pandemic period, the need to work shoulder to shoulder to ensure that, most importantly, that those patients, or rather, residents of those homes have been, um, have been supported and staff in those uh, residential facilities has been supported, I think has been pretty incredible. Uh, we are meeting daily with our residential aged care services on their pandemic management plans, et cetera. So that relationship and what we've been able to do there 
has also been really supported by our geriatric outreach service, which I know runs in other LHDs, but we established that in the first wave of the pandemic. We've maintained that going forward, and it's grown from strength to strength in order to provide not only support to uh, the nursing homes, but broadly aged care in the community, as they were very much at the front line of the pandemic. So I think taking those relationships that we've developed with the aged care facilities forward, uh, them understanding you know, the support that we've been able to provide through public health units, et cetera, and then that in-reach uh, so that they keep people in situ, because it is their homes, and supporting them to do that has been great for the residents, but obviously then we've not seen that influx into, into the hospitals and allowed uh, the acute care services to continue to focus on care delivery, but also uh, focus on the, the sicker level of, of, um, of COVID patients. So I think that has been uh, something that you know has really grown and matured extensively over this period and will go forward into the future. And I think that whole relationship with our aged care facilities uh, can only but grow and grow better. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> I, I'd, I'd love it, and I was actually just about to come back to you, um, Ms Maines, because um, I was just going to say that um, th that was a very comprehensive answer from Ms Larkin, but it also, um, uh, interestingly enough, mirrored um, uh, some other comments that we've had from other um, LHDs today about um, aged care facilities um, and that integration between uh, the, the local health districts and, and the um, aged care providers. Uh, and I was going to ask you, Ms Maines, um, are you able to provide some insights about um, your LHD with that and also what other um, uh, uh, learnings you might be able to provide to us? Uh, certainly, thank you. So we have a very close relationship with residential aged care facilities and um, we've been meeting over the last few months, uh, 18 months, sorry, um, uh, at least twice a week um, and just working through issues together about how we can support each other and chairing outbreak management committees um, how we can support the staffing or PPE or equipment um, and also using expert advice on ventilation. Um, so, for example, one of the key learnings also, the three other learnings we've had through this is about the ventilation and negative pressure in hospitals. Um, and we were fortunate to have a very passionate doctor who led the charge in making sure that we had appropriate negative ventilation in our wards, in our staff rooms, uh, making sure we had adequate setups outside the staff so that they could have a break out of their PPE and get fresh air because tea rooms were vulnerable in areas for outbreaks. Um, and we were able to also put HEPA filters in a number of areas. The second thing was the power of clinical leadership. And we had a task force that oversaw clinical leadership at Wollongong and Shalhaba and Shalhaven participated. Uh, they provided the leadership for the necessary clinical decisions. And we've got a clinical reference group that's made up of infectious diseases, infectious management and control, um, who gave us tremendous advice for safety of patients and staff and what we needed to do every day, which enabled me to communicate with staff every day about what was most appropriate, whether it was from PPE or isolation or current practices. Um, and that all working together, um, I think, set us up in a very strong position from a quality and safety perspective. Thank you so much for those insights. I think um, we can see uh, very much the the work that's gone into uh, not only uh, the, uh, I guess, development of the plan, but also the implementation that's um, led to the success um, of the examples that you've provided today. Um, I'm just going to ask how much... I've got about four. Well, what I might do, I might actually pass my time over, but I'll add 45 seconds on at the end because that might make okay. it a little bit easier. Oh, so, yeah, 25. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> well, what I'll, okay, well, Chair, um, just uh, noting that there's only about 25 seconds left, I won't um, seek to use that time. What I'll do is I'll actually just um, allow the questioning to pass over to the next person. And then on that, Chair, I'll pass the, uh, the the call back to you and you might allow somebody else to ask thank, another question. Thank you, Chair. Well, like an honourable man that you are. Thank you. Um, as a Chair. I'm good like that. I'm, you know. As a Chair. So we're now back to our uh, start to, to go through, uh, and it's around eight to nine minutes approximately yep. okay. thereabouts. So, Baron Walsicle. Okay, uh, firstly, I actually will 
agree with Wes, or with the Honorable Wes Feng. I did check, and the report that was given to me was slightly inaccurate. So yes, the Premier said that the elective surgery would return on February the 7th. So Ms. Main, uh, Ms. Maines, yes, uh, I understand that, and I acknowledge that, and I correct the record. But I do note that you said that it would be at a 75% rate. Um, uh, how long do you expect that it'll take before it'll be back to, how do we say, normal, inverted commas, activity? Um, could I please take that on notice? Because I think what's really important is we need to look at our re implementation plan and I prefer to provide the facts of when that's going to be done. Okay. Um, Ms. Main, er earlier in the proceedings, you talked about, um, now I want to make sure that it is you, or it was Ms. Larkin, but I think from memory that was you, that you said 1,000 staff were on furlough. Is that correct? Um, it was Ms. Larkin. Oh, it was Ms. Larkin, yes. Sorry, thank you. Ms. Larkin, so when you say furlough, what do you mean by that? Uh, they were not in the workplace uh, due to uh, either being close contacts or positive COVID patients or positive COVID cases. So 1,000 staff out of an overall workforce of how large? 14, 14 15,000. Oh, a significant, um, a significant number. How did that impact on how did that impact on the workload, and did, did it result and what did it did it result in overtime, or did it result in a curtailing of services? Um, so over the over the period of well, a couple of things in yeah. answer to your question. Uh, so uh, in relation to um, how to maintain service delivery. Um, I think important things to consider. Firstly, yes, overtime was applied. Uh, staff were redeployed across the district. So where it was considered um, we could uh, change services or reduce services uh, in an appropriate manner from the community's point of view, we did that. Mm. That included not only clinical staff, uh, but um, when I say clinical, um, nursing and, and, uh, and allied health staff, but also admin staff. So people were completely, you know, wherever possible, we redeployed staff to provide support in the critical, uh, in the critical areas. Also, over that time, uh, surgery had been, uh, had been uh, reduced. So in those areas, uh, where um, we could redeploy, uh, say, people who would normally work in areas like theatre, we did that. So all opportunities to redeploy staff, uh, maintain service delivery in critical areas um, was put in place in order to support that. Okay. Uh, just today, though, just be aware, though, uh, yeah. we're down, uh, that our position has significantly uh, improved and we're down to about 250, 260 furloughed staff. So uh, hmm. our position is significant. No, is is that because the 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 time away has been reduced, or because fewer people are actually have, have contracted COVID? Fewer, there are fewer people. Uh, people all over that period, people were going, were being furloughed, but also coming back based on you know the time that they needed to remain in isolation. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's been you know that number has fluctuated on a day to day basis, mm -hmm. uh, but um, a fewer people, and now and, and now people are coming back into the world. Thank you, Ms. Larkin. Um, Ms. Maines, I'd like to return to, um, I understand now the Bulleye Urgent Care Centre was temporarily closed on December 23, so that staff could be re redeployed to emergency teams and other activities. When will the um, Bulleye Urgent Care Centre be returned to normal activities? So we will be reviewing the situation as we commit to in the February, and then a decision will be made to Okay. Can I ask you a couple of questions? And I think that if you take them on notice, I won't be offended. How many people are on elective surgery waiting lists in the Illawarra Shell Haven Local Health District as of today? Thank you. Thank you. We have 7,700. Uh, patients on um, a wait list across the whole district. And what will as of, as of today? As of today. As of seven thousand seven hundred. And you know, I would I would assume that the longest list would be at um, Wollongong Hospital. Is that correct? Do you have a breakdown? That's uh, the largest wait list is at Wollongong Hospital, which is just over three thousand three hundred. 
uh, patients. How many people are at Shellhaven? Shellhaven have uh, just over or close to 100 um, patients on their waiting list. In Shell Harbour? And Shell Harbour Hospital has 22, just over 2,200. 2,200. Oh, and that's a round thing. Oh, yeah, I, I, I realized you did some rounding there. Now, now on that, now, now do you also have the BHI, Bureau of Health Information, also indicates the, the longest percentile, I think it's 10% of people who are waiting longer than, I think it's more than a year, usually about 360 days. How many of those people of the 7,700 have been waiting for more than a year? So, um, looking at the two categories of patients, so yep. our category B patients, yep. uh, we have 11 patients at the moment across the district who have been waiting longer um, than a year. Yep. And of our category C patients, um, I'll just have to give it to you by hospital if that's okay. Yep, that would be um, wonderful. I might get as quickly as I'd like to. Yep. So, um, at Shoalhaven, we have 85 patients who who are Category C, non-urgent, waiting yep. over a year, yep. taking into account that the appropriate wait time for those patients is 365 days. <laughs> uh, at Shell Harbour, we have 42 patients who are Category C, waiting over a year. And at Wollongong Hospital, we have 326 patients that are waiting over a one year, the majority of those are orthopedic patients. Orthopedic. Thank you, thank you. And um, Ms. Main, if you, if you could also give me a bit of a, um, how has COVID impacted on the treatment of um, kidney dia a provision of kidney dialysis in the Illawarra? How has that impacted on patients? Oh, don't you? Well, look, can we take the question on because I don't have the exact Okay, thank you. Ms. Larkin, could I, could I put a similar question to you on the impact of kidney dialysis and COVID on patients in your local health district? What has been, in, and what responses and what strategies have you taken to, can, to ensure that they continue to receive kidney dialysis? Um, yes, happy to, happy to, to give uh, some response to that. So, thank you, um, thank you, ma'am. Dialysis services have been maintained, although we've had a number of outbreaks of COVID in our dialysis centre, so there's had to be some move of patients and some consolidation of patients uh, to ensure that um, patients have been kept as safe as possible. Uh, there has been quite a lot of pressure on dialysis services, uh, so there has been uh, some purchase of some chairs in the private, um, but there is considerable, um, uh, well, there will be uh, growth in services. We're about to open additional six chairs at Barrel. Um, sorry, it's got a chair at the moment, so we're opening an additional five to oh. take it to six chairs. Yep. Um, so it's been quite a lot of intensive work to ensure people have been able to main, uh, maintain their certain maintain services um, and also to ensure that they're safe when there have been uh, COVID clusters. Thank you, Ms. Larkin. And my time is up. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Chair Mahurst. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll start with uh, Ms. Larkin. Um, one of the key concerns raised in our previous inquiry was around um, the kidney dialysis, particularly in Fairfield Hospital. Um, have any changes been made in the last 12 months to increase the access to this service within, within Fairfield Hospital? Uh, no, but uh, can we can I clarify that in terms of dialysis services, they are operated on a network basis. So patients are moved in terms of um, where chairs, etc., are available. Obviously, we do it as close to home as possible because the patients are unwell. Uh, but we maximise utilisation of the chairs, um, and so Fairfield is part of that um, part of that whole network arrangement for the district. So, sorry, just to explain that to me further. Um, so, if somebody was going to federal hospital and they needed a kidney dialysis, they would be transferred to another hospital. Is that what you're saying? Or no, the chair was available at, at Fairfield Hospital, uh, based on you know, based on their um, their location, etc. Absolutely, we would provide it there. Uh, but uh, we do need patients to be required based on the number of chairs that we've got. But the aim is to keep them all as close to home as possible. Um, but there hasn't been any change in the last 12 months um, 
for, for kidney dialysis. Not, not specifically at Fairfield, which was the focus of your question. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and I also wanted to get um, an update on the new Princeton Lidcombe Hospital and, and whether there's been any delays in the construction um, by, by the whole COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, we're, we're, we're awaiting uh, the resolution in terms of the, uh, the location of the new hospital at this point, um, and it's going through a process uh, with government. Okay. So you, you don't sort of have, a, have any kind of timeline on that? Not at this point. Thank you. Um, and I just want to uh, ask a similar question um, to Ms Maines as well. Um, if you're able to give any kind of an update on the planned redevelopment of Shoalhaven Hospital um, and whether we have any kind of expected date where that will be operational and if it's been affected, that timeline's been affected by COVID. Um, no, we are um, showing the possible as proceeding to plan and we're currently in the concept design and in the schematic design phases. Um, and construction on the um, new Shelbyland Community Bristol we're expecting will start um, later this year. Um, and by the end of the year, it's expected that we'll be putting tenders out for construction of the acute care building with an anticipated date um, of 2006 and hopefully earlier, but certainly um, 2000, sorry, 2006, um, not 2006. My apologies. No, that's okay. Um, and will the hospital be operational in, in, by that day? Or? We would certainly be aiming to operationalise the hospital in 2026. Thank you, thank you. Um, if you were a significant community support and petitions for moving the new hospital to a Greensfield site near Falls Creek, um, what has been the LHD's response to these views from the community? Um, so, the very community have outlined that the plans for this actually started in 2011 when the Shoalhaven City Council actually reaffirmed the support for the establishment of a master plan medical precinct on the existing site. Further confirmed by the health recently announced by the Minister, um, Health Minister Gillian Skinner in 2012. Um, that was also reconfirmed by the Shoalhaven Council in 2020 for providing uh, support for the acquisition of Narrow Park. What we've been stating very clearly to the community is we've been working on the basis that there has been a commitment for the last decade to build on the site. And the fact that there have been $65 million of development of new facilities on the site, including the Shoalhaven Cancer Centre at $31 million, um, the Subacute Mental Health Unit at $10 million, um, the car park at about $12 million, the GP Plus at about $7 million, um, and also upgrades to the emergency department and the endoscopy suites. At the same time, also using the same site has given us the ability to provide more services as we are able to refurbish existing buildings and use them for services, as well as develop services within the acute services building. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Kay Fairman. Thank you, Chair. Um, I will just go back to the questions that I was asking Ms Langston in relation to a hospital in the home, and thank you, you had just uh, provided us with data on that before my time expired. Can you go back to, you were talking about 150 um, patients currently under hospital in the home or LHD who were, I think your goods were high risk. What are some of the reasons why those patients are at high risk? So, uh, the question on we're talking COVID patients, we're talking um, virtual enhanced community care services, which is not possible. This is, this is COVID. Yeah. Okay. So what we are concerned about, in particular around high risk, there is a risk gratification that we um, put over all um, the um, patients coming to the service. The particular high risks we are most worried about are those people over 75 years of old age, Ones with comorbidities, so have heart disease, diabetes, other complex chronic conditions, may be immunocompromised, may be getting cancer treatments. Um, those um, that have, and also those um, that have had more than four months since, I would say about more than four months since their booster dose. So um, that's the particular high risk group. There are others that come into that high risk group. Um, 
um, the virtual enhanced community care also manage all our Aboriginal clients. Um, they're not always going to high risk, but they also manage all those and manage all our children as well, and children or pregnant women that we have. So it's um, it's, it's a risk stratification as we put those patients to see what their personal circumstances are and what level of care we need to provide. Thank you. And how many do, do you have the data on how many people within the LHD have died from COVID outside of a hospital environment? No, we need to take their own notice, thank you. Okay, thank you. I might just ask the, um, you, Ms Larkin, Larkin, sorry, the same question in relation to how many people, the public, how many, positive patients the LHD is treating under a hospital in the home? So in the, um, in, in the revised model for, for uh, care in the home, uh, we got up to, just so you understand, up to you know, a couple of thousand patients or more than that. Um, and so in the revised model, the self-management as um, Margot and her team have outlined is the same principle that's been applied in the South Wales. Well, our high risk numbers at the moment are only at 45. Uh, 45 people who were in that high risk category were carefully monitoring and managing. Uh, we've also got a group of Aboriginal patients uh, that, uh, that we also um, form and monitor on an ongoing basis, but the number has dropped considerably for us. Um, we are available, obviously, um, for support if people are concerned about their own self-management, etc. Um, and we receive a number of calls into the public health unit and into a, um, a central contact point called Triple I on a daily basis about concerns, etc. But but the model now has moved considerably to self. When you, when you say the model has moved considerably into kind of self-management within the home, this is. What, this model is obviously to, 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 to try and free up hospital beds as, uh, as well, to try and make sure that those hospital beds are available to those in them as much as possible. So when th this model, when was that changed? When did it come into, to, not when it was changed, when did this come into um, practice? Yeah, in the last three weeks, we've seen a change in the model. Um, What's the model so called um, specifically, Ms Larkin? Uh, oh, th this is this is what I call. Uh, probably each of the districts um, have a slightly different name, but this is for COVID patients. This is community care, so care at home. So we were providing contact tracing, follow up, etc. Now it's the self management model. Um, high risk patients are referred to us, and we provide ongoing contact care on a daily basis for that high risk group. So changed about three weeks ago. Has it changed in terms of? allowing more people to be treated at home than in hospitals? Has it seen a difference in um, the hospital admissions? So the, so the group of patients that we would have managed and cared for at home, the whole aim of the program was that those patients didn't come into hospital. Yep. Um, so you wouldn't see a significant impact there. Um, but, um, so the model really allows self-management. So the number that we were calling every day that we were following up uh, was just significantly increasing. And so as immunisation has, um, uh, has improved, people are getting their boosters, all of that self-management that people are able to do at home, that's where the model has shifted to and the focus, therefore, of what we call care in the community has shifted to that high-risk group. Those people who may have chronic conditions, there's a good risk assessment model that the state put together around that. So they're the focus now of the care in the community. Okay, thank you. Oh, um, if I could go... Sorry. Sorry, Kate, we <laughs> yeah. need to move. I apologise, but we need to move to where's now? Where's that? Yeah. Oh, thank you, Chair. And uh, look, I, I don't uh, intend to use all my time if uh, if it's with the uh, consent of the other uh, members of the committee, because I, I think the witnesses have been uh, very generous in their time and they've been here for pretty much an hour and a half. So um, I, I was just going to ask very briefly um, about uh, the success of the, I guess, vaccination programs in each of your um, LHDs and 
if you had any thoughts as uh, to how uh, the success or otherwise of that vaccination program and then with the rollout of the boosters, if you've been able to um, uh, employ any of that learning <coughs> from the vaccination program into the booster program. But um, Ms Larkin, have you got any insights on that or, or Ms Maines? So I'm happy to, to commence from South Western's point of view. Uh, so the investment by government for vaccinations in the South West, I'm sure you're aware, was significant. Um, and it was such a critical part of the overall program uh, that was put in place for COVID. Uh, so I was only looking at figures the other day. So we would have vaccinated well over 600,000 people just in, in the southwest through, uh, through our, um, our centres. Uh, and that then, remember, is in combination with GPs and now which is pharmacy. So I think it has been incredibly successful. We also uh, changed the model so that it wasn't uh, that, you know, um, that it wasn't only centre-based. So for groups that we knew were at risk, such as our, uh, such as our, um, our, our at-risk communities, some of our Aboriginal communities, we did a lot of outreach and we did some home-based work to actually support them. And we supported um, uh, our, um, our Aboriginal medical services to provide um, immunisation you know, in situ for people where people felt comfortable to come in. So this has been, I think, a great uh, a collaboration. We worked um, very closely with the PHNs uh, and the GPs. And so for the South West, I think it's been incredibly, um, incredibly successful. And then we're utilising that going forward. So uh, more work to do around our boosters and encouraging, you know, our young younger group, our families with the younger group to come in. So we're just working on a lot of um, stronger messaging and campaigns about that going forward. So uh, for the South West, I think it's been a cornerstone uh, for, for our work over the last, well, nearly eight months. Um, that's something we're going to see here, much the same as what Amanda has spoken about. The outreach products that are so be crucial for getting to our vulnerable communities and working in partnership with our ANSs um, and our Aboriginal communities and also um, um, targeting our vulnerable communities has been really important. And also working with our other partners, GPs, through the PHN and working with residential aged care facilities. Um, has actually helped with residents and staff um, and also with local pharmacy. So it's been a partnered approach to actually maximising it. Certainly, we found the outreach clinics played a very important role um, within two other vulnerable communities. Uh, thank you both very much for that uh, valuable um, information and um, I, I think that there's no doubt that New South Wales has led the way in uh, vaccinations and uh, I'd say it's down to work of uh, people like yourselves and, and the staff with which uh, are working within the local health districts. So thank you and um, I think, Chair, with that, I'm happy to grant an early mark to uh, our witnesses if, you're, if you consent. Well, actually, it's the Chair that grants the early mark. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. Uh, listen, that does bring us to the conclusion uh, of this session. Um, uh, can I thank you all uh, very much for making the time available? We, we know uh, that you're busy all the time, but even busier in